Welcome to another multi-week study I am calling a Bible Prophecy Timeline. It's available as a video presentation as well as an audio podcast on the Bible Prophecy Talk podcast feed. You can find links to both at the website BibleProphecyTalk.com. I've made a graphic here with 15 Bible prophecy related events that will occur either just before or during the 70th week of Daniel, i.e. the seven year period in the end times. It is by no means every event that is said to happen in the end times. It's my intention to take each section of this timeline and defend with scripture the placement of each event. I believe that the simple act of defending the order of events is going to help people see things about Bible prophecy that they would not have been able to see any other way. And I think that if you stick around for the first part today about world government, you will see what I mean by that statement. A couple notes before we get started. I've decided not to dumb this study down at all. This study is going to assume that you have a fairly advanced understanding of Bible prophecy. I've also decided not to worry about explaining difficult subjects that I've already explained in other places. For example, I know a lot of you will see that in this timeline I have placed the rapture after the midpoint but before the day of the Lord. This is because I hold to something called the pre-wrath rapture. Usually if I hold to a view like that I've explained it in detail in some other place. In this case I wrote and directed a feature-length film called Seven Pre-Trib Problems and the Pre-Wrath Rapture that you can see at the website sevenpretribproblems.com. So I won't be spending time in this study defending that view, but if I do come to something that's a little bit out of the ordinary, I will try to provide additional scripture and other argumentation as much as I can as we progress. Today I'm just going to cover one event on this timeline, which is world government. And while I will be discussing certain arguments for the existence of a world government in the end times, as well as certain characteristics it is said to have, one of my main goals today is to justify where I've placed the world government on the Bible prophecy timeline. You may have noticed that the next event I have on the timeline is the Antichrist Covenant, which most Bible prophecy students will know is the very first event in the 70th week of Daniel. I'm going to argue that a world government specifically the seventh head of the seven-headed, ten-horned beast of Daniel 7, Revelation 13 and 17, will exist before the seven-year period begins. I will argue that we are not told how long this seventh head will have been in existence before the Antichrist is on the scene. It could be one year or a hundred years or more. I will further argue that the Antichrist will not be associated with the final empire's creation. In fact, he seems to be in opposition to it when he comes on the scene. He eventually, as we will see in part four, actually takes this world system over and makes it about him and his worship after the abomination of desolation at the midpoint of the seven year period. If these two premises that I hope to demonstrate here are true, namely that the Antichrist comes on the scene significantly after this oppressive world government is established, say 30 years after for the sake of argument, and that he will initially be in opposition to that Ten King Coalition. Then, Christians who experience these events will be in danger of seeing the one that defeats this oppressive and evil empire, that is the Antichrist, as a kind of savior. This would all be amplified by the fact that this last empire would be a global government. For example, in the past, belief that a given government or system was the Antichrist system was limited to a smaller area, usually the area being oppressed by that system. For example, Christians in Europe who were being persecuted by the Catholic Church were the ones promoting that the Catholic Church was the Antichrist system. It wasn't a belief that the whole world had at that time. Same thing with Nero, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, all of whom have been proposed as Antichrist candidates by the populations that they ruled. Though I don't know for sure, I would strongly suspect that Christians in the underground church in China right now have teachings about how the Communist Party of China is the Antichrist system. And again, you can't blame them. The difference here is that if the world goes into a global government soon, and that government is oppressive towards Christians, for the first time, the entire Christian population of the globe will have the same enemy, that is, this oppressive global system. And thus, all the Christians in the world will likely be very excited to hear about the man who will defeat this hated enemy. 
But this global government will probably have various elements that the underground church who is being oppressed by it will teach each other are aspects of the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast. After all, I'm quite sure such a global government would require things like a digital passport and other things that will prevent buying and selling. But a digital passport just by itself is not necessarily the mark of the beast. It may prevent you from buying and selling, and I'm certainly not going to get one. But the point is, it's not necessarily the mark of the beast. There is a lot of information. It needs to be on your right hand or forehead. It needs to have the number 666 either on it or in it somehow. That number is associated with a man's name. It has to be given by the false prophet after the midpoint, most likely, which is after a man is sit in the temple and declared himself to be God. It's given by a false prophet who does things like call fire down from heaven in the full view of men, something that I don't think people would miss. It's given so that you will worship the Antichrist. And this is not a, a, a minor part of this. This is the reason for the Mark of the Beast. It is a, a declaration that you will worship the Antichrist. Yes, you get to buy or sell as well, but it's primarily that he causes this image of the beast. He gives it life. You now have to worship it or be killed by it. That's the context of the Mark of the Beast. The point is there will be a lot of aspects of this seventh head before the Antichrist that will seem like the end times. I think that Satan will go out of his way to make sure Christians believe it is the end times. Add to this that it really will have ten kings or kingdoms as its main bureaucratic apparatus because it really will be the seventh head of the beast. So Christians are going to have a lot of ammunition when they're teaching their congregations in these underground churches that this current system is the Antichrist system. But what I hope to prove to you later in this presentation is that during the first phase of this world government, the final seventh head world government, none of the actual things that the Bible warns us about the Antichrist will have happened yet. The more that Christians at the time believe that the system itself is the Antichrist, or some person within that system that's not the Antichrist is the Antichrist, even though the Antichrist has not actually shown up yet, the more they will be prey for the actual Antichrist's savior deception when he does arrive. For those of you thinking that the Antichrist won't come on the scene as a savior, remember that the first thing he does, according to Daniel 9.27, is make a covenant with many, which apparently allows for the thing that the Jews have been praying for for almost 3,000 years to happen, that is, starting the daily sacrifices in Jerusalem, which will continue for three and a half years after that point. That is a very pro-Israel act, and the Ten Kings are apparently not very happy with it as they go to war with him after that point. They seem to attack him, which is an interesting thing. He defeats three of those Ten Kings in battle, forcing the others to apparently submit to him. They give their royal authority to him after that. He reshapes that entire world government into a completely different system that's based on his literal worship. This happens after his apparent resurrection, which I would argue happens just before the midpoint, something that I will discuss in another episode. In my various books like False Christ or Mystery Babylon, which are completely free online at BibleProphecyText.com, I argue that every single thing that the Antichrist is said to do, including his sitting in the temple declaring himself to be God at the midpoint and demanding worship, is an attempt to be seen as the real Messiah. I believe that the Bible is showing us a man who is very concerned with looking like he is fulfilling all the prophecies that the people in the first century wanted Jesus to fulfill like defeat specific enemies and set up a world government with Jerusalem as its capital. I would submit that if you chart all this out, which we will do in this study, it paints a picture of the Antichrist trying to be seen as a liberator from world government, or at least one form of world government, which is why I think that the seventh head is also spoken of as an eighth, but still part of the seven in Revelation 17. That is, the geography and bureaucracy didn't change much. It was ten kings at the start, and it's ten kings all the way at the end during Armageddon, as we'll see in a minute. But at the midpoint, it's changed to a theocracy, and the ten kings give their ruling authority completely to the Antichrist, thus making it an eighth, but still part of the seven. Don't worry, I will explain a lot of this as we progress, but the point is that if Christians think that a world government that hates and kills Christians is all that you need to be in the end times, they need to understand that such a system could be a massive setup to love the man who liberates them from it and maybe even worship him as Messiah. Beginning with the basics, 
First, I need to do a quick refresher on the seven-headed, ten-horned beast and the final empire in scripture. And I should say that I've recently changed my view on this issue back to a more traditional understanding of it. I discussed the reasoning behind this change in a multi-weeks audio study on the seven-headed, ten-horned beast on my podcast, which I will link in the description. Basically, I used to think that the beasts in Daniel 7 were contemporaneous, meaning that they exist at the same time in the end times, which sort of threw off my view of the seven-headed, ten-horned beast in Revelation. But I now see this whole issue of the seven-headed, ten-horned beast much like your average premillennial Bible prophecy teacher would, which is that Satan is described in the book of Revelation and to some degree in Daniel as a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. The heads of this beast are sometimes called kingdoms and sometimes kings, but I think it's clear that we are to understand this as interchangeable since they are used both ways. This symbolism of the seven heads, I think, can easily be demonstrated to mean that Satan has tried to control the world, especially Israel, through massive empires on six previous occasions by John's day in the book of Revelation. John says of these heads, five have fallen, one, which we presume to be Rome, is, and one is yet to come. I, like many prophecy teachers, understand these heads to be Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and a revived Roman Empire. I don't really like the term revived Roman Empire to refer to this final empire, but it is appropriate in at least one sense. I think you can see a geographical progression from the earliest attempts of Satan to rule the world with Egypt and follow it up through the sixth head, that is Rome, and see that with each empire he controls a little bit more of the Mediterranean Sea, until finally with Rome he controlled the whole sea, something that has never been duplicated since then. I think the Bible gives credence to this theory to some extent. For example, in Daniel 7, when speaking of these world empires, it says that they all come up from the Great Sea, which is a term which always is used to describe the Mediterranean Sea in Scripture. I also think there's more evidence for this little pet theory of mine, which I talk about in that podcast, but I won't belabor the point here. One point that I think is important but very often overlooked is that it seems like a kind of prerequisite of being one of these beast nation heads is that it must control Israel. That's not stated directly, but it certainly was true of the previous six heads, and it would make sense given the events that we are told that follow. Another important aspect of this seven-headed, ten-horned beast is that its last head, the one that will be on earth during the end times, will have ten horns with ten crowns on it. This symbolic imagery is explained as being a reference to ten kings. This reference to ten kings is why many Bible prophecy teachers, including myself, understand that the final empire of the beast will be ruled by a group of ten somethings. This could be kings or kingdoms or maybe even nations, in my opinion, but ten somethings will rule at least Israel, but probably much of the Mediterranean coastline as well, if past is prologue. We'll be looking very closely at these ten kings in this study, since by following their career, it can tell you quite a lot about the end times timeline. All right, so let me move on to proving the premises of this study. The first thing is that the final head of this beast will arrive before the Antichrist. So the ten kings will come before the Antichrist is even on the scene. Let's first look at Daniel chapter 7, starting in verse 8. This is when Daniel has a vision about this uh, the head, and it's got horns. It says this, I considered the horns, these ten horns, and behold, there came up from among them another horn. So we now get eleven horns. A little horn, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So this is widely understood, this little horn, to be a picture of the Antichrist. Later on, in verse 24 or so, the angel begins to interpret this vision that Daniel had about the beast and the horns and all this other stuff. And it says, as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, he's speaking of that final head, which is, the angels already told him is a kingdom, out of that head, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different than the former ones, and shall put down three kings. So this little horn, who is widely understood to be a reference to the Antichrist, 
is said here to come after the ten kings are established. It says quite clearly, he shall arise after them. It then seems to reiterate that by using the word former ones, the Aramaic word for former or first, and then it says he shall put down three kings. Even the idea that he's putting down three kings is an argument that he comes after them. They've already been established to some extent, right, if he's now putting them down. The three of the ten kings that the Antichrist, quote, puts down are not destroyed during this conflict. The word used by the interpreting angel for what the Antichrist does to these three kings means to subdue or humiliate them. And that is the word that a lot of Bible translations use. I think you can actually see a picture of this uh, war and then subservience in Daniel 11, but that's a story for another episode. I think that we can know that these ten kings who necessarily exist before the Antichrist arises, so before the 70th week of Daniel, or at the very least right at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, they exist as ten units all the way up until the very end of the 70th week of Daniel. So for that entire seven-year period, we can determine where these ten kings are. For example, in Revelation 17, 12 through 14, it starts to give us clues about this. It says, And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast, and they will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. So now we have the angel's interpretation of that vision, which says, and the ten horns that you saw, and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is that great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Because the destruction of Mystery Babylon, which is talking about there, is one of the very last events in the book of Revelation chronologically, we can be sure that these ten kings exist right up to the end of the 70th week of Daniel. Though it just calls them kings in this verse because of the reference to them going to war against the Lamb, I think it's a pretty sure bet that these are the same ten kings that are part of the group gathered to go to war with the Lamb in Revelation 19 at the Battle of Armageddon. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. So if we take for granted that the ten kings in Daniel 7 are the same ones in Revelation 17, which I think most would agree is quite clear, then what follows from that premise is, number one, the ten king government exists before the Antichrist comes on the scene. Number two, this government is conquered by the Antichrist, but they will not be destroyed by him. And number three, after this conquest, all ten kings will give their ruling authority to the Antichrist, but they will apparently still control this system to some extent. The hour that the ten kings are said to rule with the beast is symbolically speaking of the time after his conquest, which I hope to prove to you during this series is referring to the three and a half year period after the midpoint when the Antichrist declares himself to be God, turning their world government into a theocracy. This is why the book of Revelation seems to suggest there are actually two phases to the seventh and final head empire. Quote, They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. The last empire of Satan will exist in two distinct phases, distinct enough that they really need to be called a seventh and an eighth, but in another sense are exactly the same kingdom, geographically, ruled by the same ten-nation bureaucracy throughout its entire life. The first phase is whenever such a ten-nation system develops. It could be soon or not. It could last a long time or not. As far as I can tell, the Bible is silent on that issue, but it will exist before the 70th week starts and before the Antichrist comes on the scene. When the Antichrist does show up, we of course know he is a man of war. Revelation 13 says, who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? They worship him in some sense because of his war-making capability. In any case, he does uh, have military conflict with three of these 
uh, ten nations of this world government. He is entirely successful in that conquest. Just after his successful conquest, he will be killed by someone or something just outside Jerusalem. He will then appear to resurrect from the dead, after which he will declare his deity in the temple that was rebuilt three and a half years before that event and demand the worship of the world. This then begins the theocratic part of his rule, in which he is given authority over the saints to kill them. This is when Jerusalem becomes the capital city of the world, and everyone will need to travel to Jerusalem to worship the image of the beast erected by the false prophet or be killed by it. Again, it's the same empire with the same ten-king bureaucracy that he just conquered, but he converts it into a theocracy at the midpoint. I know that's a lot of information, and I would expect you to be very skeptical about those claims at this point, but I will be fleshing that and many more things out with Scripture as we progress. So that's the main point of this first episode, which is that I believe Scripture tells us that the world government comes before the Antichrist and before the seven-year period even begins. But as you can tell, the main burden I have here is just to say this could be a big deception from the Antichrist, this sort of false flag problem reaction solution empire with two phases. The first phase to get Christians to hate it, to be the epitome of what Christians you know, expect in their sort of newspaper eisegesis kind of situation where they, you know, see a woke, communist, totalitarian, Christian-hating, Christian-censoring empire that's decadent and awful and all these things, and it's just so brutal to Christians. And, you know, there's going to be no shortages of things that we can make be the Antichrist in a system like that. We can make be the mark of the beast in a system like that or a false prophet. It's going to be a totalitarian police state. Of course, we're going to find, we've found things, every democratic president has been accused as being the Antichrist. So in an actual totalitarian police state, yeah, we're going to find a way to make it the Antichrist, even though it won't be yet. And that is just so dangerous because of the standard false flag psychological operation that comes with somebody freeing you from the thing that you were the most scared of. And just simply connect that with what you know about the beginning of the Antichrist empire. He comes as a person who makes a covenant with many, which we understand to be Israel. We know that probably has something to do with either starting the building of the temple, but certainly starting the daily sacrifices. If you think the man that does that for Israel, something that they literally pray every day for and have been doing so for almost 3,000 years, will not be seen as a candidate for the Messiah, then you haven't been paying attention. But even more to the point, I think you can also see with what we've been looking at today, that if, certainly if past his prologue with the heads of the previous empires, Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, Egypt, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, they all controlled Israel. It was Israel was not the master of its own fate during those times. In fact, that may be the single thing that ties all those empires together. If you're looking for a cohesive argument of what it takes to be a satanic head empire, it may be that you must control Israel's fate. Off the top of my head, I can't think of another time in which Israel was controlled by anyone except for those previous six empires. But what that means is that currently Israel is sovereign. Israel does co uh, control its fate. But if it is controlled by this ten-headed, the final seventh head of this empire, if it's like the others, it will be like Rome or uh, Babylon. It will control Israel. It will be a, uh, And that is something that people aren't really expecting to happen at all. But plug that into the idea that the Antichrist is making a covenant with Israel. And instead of it being just one many of many controlled places that the Ten Nation thing controls, the Antichrist switches that and makes it the jewel of the whole system. He makes it the capital of the Ten Nation system. He, he rules from it in a theocracy after that. I think that's when you get the Mystery Babylon system. Mystery Babylon sees this moment in history of her uh, sort of validation. She thinks that she's found her king and her husband. She's pictured as a harlot, high priestess that is promoting the worship of the Antichrist to the world, and the world is made drunk by the fierceness of her fornication. She worships him so fervently that the world is drawn into it. Welcome back to my multi-week study called A Bible Prophecy Timeline. This episode is part two, The Covenant and the Sacrifices. As we discussed in the previous episode, the world government, which I have listed here as first, comes before the start of the 70th week of Daniel. That is the seven-year period in which most of the events in the last days play out. 
The Antichrist Covenant, however, is widely understood to be the first event of the seven-year period. The clock seems to start with this covenant. This is understood to be the case because of the wording of Daniel 9.27a, which says, Then he, that is the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Since the idea that this covenant occurs at the very beginning of the seven-year period is widely agreed upon, I won't attempt to explain why that is here. Instead, I'm going to devote the first part of this study to explaining what I think the Antichrist is doing with this covenant, since it has a lot of implications for the overall timeline. Since I've already written extensively about this subject and even made a video about it in 2014, I'm just going to play that video here and pick back up on the other side. The Seven-Year Covenant Daniel 9, 27a says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Here in the last verse of Daniel chapter 9, we have a reference to the Antichrist making some kind of covenant with many people. This verse gives weight to the thesis that the Antichrist will claim to be the Jewish Messiah. Even until very recently, I've assumed that this verse was referring to a seven-year peace agreement, it has become so common for people to refer to this verse as a peace treaty of some sort that I confess I sort of took it for granted. However, there is no reason to think that this covenant is speaking of a peace treaty. In all the Bible versions I have available to me through Bible software and the internet, a considerable number, the word peace is not mentioned or even implied. In addition, I suggest that whatever this covenant is that the Antichrist makes must be a covenant that was already in place based on the underlying Hebrew text. I believe this verse is referring to the Antichrist trying to fulfill the modern Jewish expectations of a new covenant that the Messiah will make in the last days. This concept is detailed in many places in the Old Testament, but a notable one is in Jeremiah 31, 31, which states, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Both Christians and Jews believe this verse is messianic. But their two views of this new covenant are vastly different. The Jews believe this means that when the Messiah comes, he will reconfirm the covenant they already had. That is, the Messiah will make it possible for them to once again abide by the laws given by Moses, especially regarding the daily sacrifices in the temple. The Jewish view of the phrase new covenant is no more than a renewed national commitment to abide by God's laws. Yuri Yosef, Ph.D., a Jewish scholar, concludes his paper called Will the real new covenant please stand up this way? Quote, it is evident that Jeremiah's use of the term new covenant does not involve the replacement of the eternal Torah by the New Testament. Rather, it signals a renewal of the original Sinai covenant. Jewsforjudaism.org states, quote, Jeremiah's new covenant is not a replacement of the existing covenant, but merely a figure of speech expressing the reinvigoration and revitalization of the existing covenant. Keep in mind that Yuri Yosef and the writers of the article in JewsForJudaism.org, like many Jewish people, would agree that this renewing of the Mosaic Covenant will happen when the Messiah comes. They believe that one of the ways he will do this, probably the most important way, is by re-establishing the sacrificial system. Interestingly, this is exactly what Daniel 9.27 states with the words, He shall confirm a covenant. This phrase, confirm a covenant, is very interesting and the Hebrew words are apparently difficult to translate into English. Note a sample of how differently this phrase is translated in popular versions of the English Bible. The Net Bible says, He will confirm a covenant. The ESV says, And he shall make a strong covenant. The King James says, And he shall confirm the covenant. And Young's literal translation says, And he hath strengthened a covenant. Notice that it isn't just the words, but their core meaning that vary. In the net translation, he is confirming an already existing covenant. In the ESV, he makes a new, strong covenant. In the King James, he confirms the covenant, suggesting that it is the Mosaic covenant. And in the Young's literal translation, he is strengthening an already existing covenant. Of the 19 versions of the Bible I checked, 11 have the Antichrist confirming or strengthening an already existing covenant as opposed to making a new covenant altogether. The obvious question is, which one is right? I will add a discussion about the details of this linguistic problem in the footnotes, but I believe the original Hebrew expresses a confirming or strengthening of an already existing covenant. 
The idea of the covenant being strengthened comes from the fact that the Hebrew word sometimes translated confirm carries the meaning of making something strong. I would even suggest that this covenant was meant to be understood as the covenant, i.e. the Mosaic covenant. Some translations, like the King James, even render the word a as the, which suggests a reference to a particular pre-existing covenant. Contextually, that must be the Mosaic covenant. There seems to be confirmation that we're on the right track with this idea, because the second part of Daniel 9.27 says, But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering as if to suggest that it is obvious that the covenant being strengthened began by starting the daily sacrifices. This verse is contrasting these two ideas. It's like the verse is saying, he confirms the covenant, which started the daily sacrifices, but then, three and a half years later, he stops the daily sacrifices. The words presuppose that the reader understands that the covenant began with the daily sacrifices restarting. If this verse is speaking of the Antichrist trying to fulfill the Jewish expectations of Jeremiah 31's new covenant, then the singling out of the daily sacrifice here, and in other places where this event is mentioned, is pretty interesting. Because, to put it simply, without the daily sacrifice, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to truly keep the Mosaic covenant. It is the first and most important of all sacrifices to the Jews. It made daily atonement for their collective sin, and it's believed that this sacrifice must start again for God's blessing to rest in its fullness on the Jewish people. In the Jewish mind, the reinstatement of the daily sacrifices at the temple is tangible proof that the Messiah has come and the new covenant of Jeremiah 31.31 has come true. If this scenario is true, the idea that the Antichrist will announce a seven-year covenant as opposed to announcing an eternal covenant is absurd. He would not say, Hey everyone, I'm the Messiah, and now you have a new covenant, but it's really not eternal, it's only going to last seven years. Here again, I think we are victims of modern Bible prophecy teaching. Scripture never says that he will say that he is setting up a seven-year covenant. It only says that the covenant will last seven years. In fact, according to a lengthy study on grammar by the pulpit commentary linked in the footnotes, the underlying Hebrew suggests this too. That study concludes by translating that part of the verse this way. The covenant shall prevail for many during one week. So it seems clear that the seven-year time frame will not be announced to the people who are agreeing to it. The Antichrist will, in all probability, say that it will be an eternal covenant. The mentioning of the seven years is therefore just God telling us how long this false covenant will really last. Note also that Scripture says it will continue to last the entire seven years. It won't go away at the midpoint. Only the daily sacrifices will be taken away a point we will discuss at length later in the section on the abomination of desolation. I believe the covenant the Antichrist makes is an argument in favor of the case that he will claim to be the Jewish Messiah. The Jews are wholeheartedly expecting the Messiah to do the exact thing Daniel 9.27 is saying the Antichrist will do, that is, confirm a covenant and start the daily sacrifices. We can be sure that whoever does this will be looked at as the Messiah by the Jews, as well as by many Christians who may see this as the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. Let's consider some of these events in context. As I said in the previous episode, the Antichrist comes on the scene after the formation of the seventh head world government system, and he is in opposition to that system until he controls it. It could be that this covenant with Israel causes the major war between the Antichrist and the three kings, which ultimately results in the Antichrist ruling the entire ten nations, but we'll look more at that next time. I think it's a reasonable hypothesis that the ten kings are fundamentally in opposition to Israel, or at least three of them are. I will argue in the next episode that at least two of the three kings are historical enemies of Israel, Egypt and Assyria, so that might explain their motivation for attacking the Antichrist with his extremely pro-Israel stance at the beginning of the 70th week. I do think that the logical outgrowth of a man giving such an amazing gift to Israel, that is, their ability to atone for sin, according to their understanding, for the first time since 70 AD, will be that at least Israel will see him as a potential Messiah, and I think many professing Christians in the underground persecuted church at the time will as well. I don't, however, think that he will declare himself to be Messiah at this early date. I think that the first three and a half years is the Antichrist sort of showing that he is fulfilling the critical prophecies of conquest of Israel's specific historical enemies, prophesied in places like Isaiah 11 and other messianic 
prophecies of conquest. I believe, as we will see in later episodes, that it is not until the midpoint that the Antichrist claims to have delivered them according to the scriptures from their enemies and that the Messianic Age has in fact begun. While I believe that the beginning of the covenant in Daniel 9.27 is the start of the daily sacrificial system, it should be said that it's not explicit. It's possible that both the temple and the sacrificial system could have existed before the Antichrist covenant at the beginning of the 70th week, but I don't think it's likely. I think that the covenant is both a restarting of the sacrifices on that day, as well as a kind of ribbon cutting on the new temple, or at least an altar on the temple mount in Jerusalem. I also think that the entire 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel 9 is very temple-centric. The clock begins in Daniel 9 with a temple being rebuilt, and it ends with another one being torn down. And I think it will start up again because another one is rebuilt. I wrote an article and did a podcast about this a long time ago called Daniel 70 Weeks, the story of two temples, two down and two to go, which I will link in the description. All that to say, though it's not explicit, I don't think that the temple or the sacrifices can exist before the start of the seven-year period. I believe that it's yet another clue that the Antichrist is giving the Jews their religion back with the start of the 70th week of Daniel, and this pro-Israel act will anger the world system and force them to war with the Antichrist for the next three and a half years. But it will all be a ruse to look like the epic battle that the scripture foretold so that the Antichrist can appear to be the eschatological victor when his enemies are subdued. Welcome back to the multi-week study I'm doing called A Bible Prophecy Timeline. This is part three, which I'm calling More on the Ten Kings and the Seven-Headed Beast. I decided to take a pause before we move on to the next part in the timeline and take an episode to just answer a few questions that people have sent in, which I feel are important to the discussion so far and should be addressed in detail before we move on. The first one starts out by quoting Revelation 17, 12 through 13. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings, who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. The question then follows, The text above says that the ten kings do not receive royal power until they receive it with the beast for one hour. This text seems to suggest that the ten kings and the Antichrist receive their power at the same time. If that's the case, then how can there be a global government in place beforehand? Let me start off with my long answer to this question, and then I'm going to work my way through the scriptures to explain my answer. I think that the ten kings rule in some lesser sense before the Antichrist takes over. Perhaps some kind of bureaucratic coalition, but not true rule as in authoritarian control. It is only after the three kings have been conquered and the Antichrist's war-making ability has been fully realized that the ten kings submit to him. Their capitulation also coincides with the Antichrist's apparent death and resurrection and his subsequent declaration of deity at the midpoint. The ten kings receive their royal authority at the same time he does. He is crowned king at the midpoint, not a second before, and they are crowned sort of co-kings with him in this new theocratic system at that point. The one hour is a reference to the three and a half year period, which is explicitly the time that the Antichrist is given authority for, which begins at the abomination of desolation at the midpoint. This is alternatively referenced as a short time, a time times and a half a time, 42 months, 1,260 days, etc. in the book of Revelation as the time given for the Antichrist's authority to reign. Let me start off by reviewing why I said that the Ten Kings must come before the Antichrist from the book of Daniel. Daniel 7.24 says, As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. So it seems to explicitly say in Daniel 7.24 that the little horn, the Antichrist, comes, quote, after the ten kings chronologically and seems to reiterate that with the word former. And the fact that he is uprooting or subduing three of those kings upon his arrival is also highly suggestive that the ten kings were in power before this and that he does in fact come on the scene after the ten kings have been established. So do we have a conflict here? Does the Antichrist come before the Ten King Coalition, as Daniel seems to suggest? 
Or do the Antichrist and the Ten Kings all get their power at the same time, as it seems to suggest in Revelation 17? So let's go through this verse, and I will start off by reading it again. It says, And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. Let's first take this phrase, who have not yet received royal power. I think the best way to understand this is that these kings had not yet received royal power in John's day. There is precedent for this interpretation of John referring to his own time as a way to show chronology, as in verse 10 of this chapter. And I think it also happens to be the face value interpretation of this verse. So it's basically just saying, you haven't seen these guys yet from John's perspective, but it doesn't give us any information about when they might be seen, however. The next line says, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Let's start off by figuring out when the Antichrist gets his royal authority, because if they all get this royal authority at the same time, then it will help us get a timestamp for this event. I think one of the clearer passages about this is found in Revelation 13, verse 5, which says, And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. So if the Antichrist is this beast, then we can know that he gets his authority for 42 months, or 3.5 years, which is a reference to the final three and a half year period after the abomination of desolation at the midpoint. Because of verses like this and several like it, it is commonly understood that the Antichrist begins his kingship or ruling authority at the midpoint when he declares himself to be God in the temple. This is an important point. He is not king or at least does not have the type of authority that Revelation 13 considers, quote, authority until after the midpoint. So if the ten kings get their ruling authority at the same time that he does, then they also get it at the midpoint. I think there are lots of ways to show this, but one way is later on in Revelation 13 when it talks about this authority and how it's over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. And worship is something that would only happen after the midpoint, after he has declared himself to be God and forces the mark of the beast and the image of the beast and all that. I think one obvious way to see that the Antichrist does not have complete authority as described in Revelation 13 before the midpoint is the fact that he is warring with three of the ten kings initially until he subdues them. In other words, if he had authority over every tribe and people and language and nation, he would not need to be warring with at least three nations, but probably more than that if we look at Daniel 11. In fact, I think you can see this capitulation in real time, so to speak, in Daniel 11, 40 through 45, where it makes it clear that through his overwhelming power and warfare, he causes these kings to submit to him, obviously suggesting that they weren't in submission before that. So Daniel 11:40 says, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall come into countries, and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab, and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver, and all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet shall come to his end with none to help him. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time, but at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be written in the book, etc., etc. So the idea is that through his show of force, he gains control over them. This is a picture of that. He shall become ruler of their gold and silver as a result of this war with Egypt. He gets to become ruler of their precious things. It says after the battle, they follow at his train. So this is a picture of of the capitulation brought about by his warfare. Though I still would say that the control he is getting in these passages is not the same kind of control he gets a little bit later at the midpoint, but I think that all develops rather quickly at the end of these wars in Daniel 11, which I hope to talk more about in the next uh, uh, episode. 
So we know that the 10 kings get this authority that this verse is talking about with the beast at the midpoint. But what about before that? Did the 10 kings just show up out of nowhere at the midpoint to get their co-authority with the beast? I think the next part of this verse refutes that idea. It says, these are of one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So it further explains that they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They had both power and authority before the midpoint that they hand over to the Antichrist. And yet the first part suggests that they all get the same kind of authority at the midpoint. So what's the deal? The resolution to this problem is in Daniel, as we've seen. The kings exist before the Antichrist arrives. The Antichrist wars with the kings, at least three of them, and subdues them. But as we'll see next time, the Antichrist seems to die and resurrect from the dead just after these battles are won, just outside of Jerusalem. And it is after this death and apparent resurrection, the strong delusion of 2 Thessalonians 2, I think, that everything changes and the world goes into a theocracy with the Antichrist as the God King. And those 10 kings are now kind of, I guess, regional monarchs that carry out his demands. And I'm guessing here is I don't think the exact nature of the government style is fleshed out. I described the final head of the beast in the first episode in this series as being the same empire, but with two stages. The Ten Kings, as we saw in that episode, will exist before the 70th week, and they will continue to exist and rule, albeit with a different structure, until the end of the 70th week at Armageddon, and the destruction of Mystery Babylon, which they actually play a role in. So in conclusion on this question, I think that Daniel 7 and Revelation 17 are not in conflict. The ten kings with their world government do come before the Antichrist, but they all, the ten kings and the Antichrist, get their true second stage theocracy authority at the midpoint. Moving on to the next question that I want to cover this week, it says, at about 19 minutes into your first video, you say that the Bible is silent on whether the 10-part final empire lasts a long time or not. What about Revelation 17.10, which says that the kingdom that has not yet come must remain only a little while? That doesn't give us a specific time period, but it does seem to rule out a long time, probably not multiple generations long, unlike the earlier kingdoms. Your thoughts on how this little while applies to the timeline. So yes, in the first video I mentioned that the final head or ten king world government could last a long time before the Antichrist arrives. I said it could be a year or multiple generations. So is this verse in Revelation 17.10 refuting that idea that that government could be a long period of time? I don't think it is, but it will take some explaining. Let's begin by reading a passage in Revelation 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Here we see the seven-headed, ten-horned beast described in detail. After it is initially described, the text begins to focus only on one of its heads. I think it's important to see that scripture begins to refer to this seventh head as the beast, i.e. the king who we know of as the Antichrist. Pretty much from here on out, the word beast is synonymous with just the seventh head and the person of the Antichrist. One notable line is, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So this is the first time it singles out one of the heads, and the one thing that it says about it is that its deadly wound was healed. Now, I think the plain reading suggests that this is the Antichrist, but I think we get confirmation of this a few verses later when it says, It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Remember that the deadly wound that was healed was a characteristic of the seventh head. And now we see that that characteristic is being used with the term the first beast. 
who just about everyone recognizes as a title of the person of the Antichrist, with the second beast in this verse being a reference to the false prophet. And again in verse 14, we see that the deadly wound idea is applied to the Antichrist, which gives a strong confirmation, along with several other places in Revelation 17, that the seventh head is a reference to the person of the Antichrist when it counts. What I mean by when it counts is that I can make a solid argument that the seven heads must be a reference to kingdoms as well as kings, but scripture seems to make it clear which one, kings or kingdoms, it wants you to have in mind in a given situation. And I think that's what's happening here in Revelation 17.10. It wants you to know that the king aspect is in view. It starts out in verse 10 saying, they are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. So why is it important to make this distinction? Because if we're talking about kings, then the seventh king is the Antichrist, who, as we saw earlier, won't be a king, won't get his kingdom until the midpoint. It is only after that that he builds mystery Babylon and populates it with his worshipers, as we'll see in later studies. The short time, then, is a reference that we've seen all over the Bible and is a reference to the final three and a half years. I believe this is also a continuation of a theme started in Revelation 12, which says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And two times in this chapter, it mentions the three and a half year period, whether it says 1,260 days or the time times in half a time to refer to this short time. So although I think it's clear that the little while here is a reference to the Antichrist's allotted short time to rule the earth in his theocracy, i.e. 3.5 years, I don't think it necessarily applies to that first phase with the ten kings that we have seen must come before the Antichrist. I will say that my early example that it could be one or a thousand years was probably hyperbole, my main point, though, was to drive the point home that the generation that sees this Ten King thing develop might be in for a lot of dystopian madness before the Antichrist arrives. My gut says that this would last over a generation, or at least that the Antichrist would prefer it to last one generation, because you really need one generation of censorship to exist in order to sort of wipe out good doctrine. And I think that he wants to wipe out as much good doctrine as he possibly can before he arrives, specifically about Bible prophecy, in order to soften the landscape, so to speak, for his deception. It really can't be overestimated how much damage was done to the Antichrist when our Lord gave away his whole scheme on the Mount of Olives. And I'm sure the Antichrist would prefer people to forget as much of that as possible before he arrives. The final question I want to address is a quick one. This one goes back to part one, and it has to do with the specific kingdoms involved in the symbolism of the seven-headed beast. So I mentioned like Babylon, Assyria, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and all that stuff. And I had made the comment about how it seemed that a uniting factor with all these empires was that they all controlled Israel. And I said I couldn't think of another empire that did that in history. I think this is all the ones that did that. Uh, many people sent comments in about the Ottoman Empire, which did control the land of Israel. However, I should have been more clear. I don't consider any empire between 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed and Israel as a nation went into the diaspora, until 1948, when the nation of Israel was once again established, to be a candidate. Yes, the Ottoman Empire controlled Israel during this time, and I'm sure there were a few Jews living there, but no one would argue that it was a nation at that time. If we included empires that just controlled the land of Israel, it would mean that we would need to fit the British Empire into these heads as well, as it also controlled the land of Israel, but not the nation of Israel. I think there are a lot of other reasons that the Ottoman Empire is not in view here, which I discuss in my book, The Islamic Antichrist Theory Debunked, which is available for free as a book at my website, BibleProphecyText.com, or even as a free eight-hour audiobook on my podcast feed. So check the links in the description for all of that. Welcome to part four of a multi-week study called A Bible Prophecy Timeline. This episode is called The Wars of the Antichrist.
And for context, it fits on the timeline just after the temple sacrifices start and just before the palatial tents are set up, which we'll look at next time. It's interesting that in Revelation 13, part of the reason people seem to love and worship the Antichrist is because of his war-making capability. It says in Revelation 13, 4b, And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? Some translations say, Who can make war against it? Note that this statement seems to be an apparent reverence. I submit that the reason these earth dwellers feel this way about the Antichrist in the end times is because he is casting himself as a defender, as a liberator. His inability to be defeated in battle, therefore, is a pro. It's a good thing from their perspective. And it's spoken of here in Revelation 13, a lot like other biblical passages speak about the Messiah, when Jesus will return in victorious battle against his enemies in the day of the Lord. We see hints of the Antichrist's wars in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, but it's mostly in Daniel 11 that we get the fine details, and that's where I will be spending most of my time today. So let me explain some things about Daniel chapter 11. This is a huge prophecy from Daniel. It covers the 150 years or so after Alexander the Great's death, in which Alexander's four generals fought many wars for the Greek Empire, sometimes called the Diodaci Wars. It's so accurate of a prophecy and so detailed about the events in those days that many critics of the Bible say it must have been written after the fact, but there's no evidence of this. Starting at verse 21, it begins to talk about the deeds of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a king of the Seleucid Empire. Antiochus is widely considered to be a type of Antichrist because of his blasphemous acts, as I will assume many of you know. Most conservative scholars recognize that from about verse 21 through around verse 30, the events being described are only about Antiochus. There is nothing to do with the Antichrist there. But as is the case in other sections in Daniel and other parts of the Bible, there is a near-far fade-in effect that starts to happen at this point where the historical type, Antiochus in this case, is in view at first, and then it sort of fades into a future prophecy, where only the prophecy of the future is in view. Most of what I'll be talking about today occurs in verses 40 through 45, which is firmly in the section that is understood by virtually every conservative scholar to be exclusively about the Antichrist. Let me read the section first. It says, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall come into countries, and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet shall come to his end with none to help him. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. I'll start off by giving a brief overview of the way that I see this passage, and then I'll spend the remainder of the time trying to prove it from Scripture. I believe that because of the covenant that the Antichrist makes at the beginning of the seven-year period, the king of the north and the king of the south attack him. Remember from the last few episodes, the Antichrist, quote, strengthens the covenant. We also see that he starts the daily sacrificial system on the Temple Mount. These events would be cause for World War III today. It may also be cause for a war in the future. Their motivations may be different, I don't really know, but in any case, these kings attack him first. I believe the Antichrist then proceeds to take control of the entire Middle East, from Egypt to Assyria through warfare. These wars have three goals from the Antichrist's perspective, besides the obvious goal of consolidating power for his upcoming kingdom. Number one, to show his might in war, to put on display, to show everyone how utterly hopeless it is to fight against him and his armies, basically to glorify himself and his, quote, God of fortresses. His second goal, to take control of all the lands that were promised to Israel by God, 
a key prophecy of the Messiah, that is, to establish greater Israel, to make a, quote, highway from Egypt to Assyria. Number three, if the Antichrist wants people to believe that the Messianic age is about to begin, then these wars are intended to serve as a false eschatological battle which precedes the Messianic age in both Judaism and Christianity. To the Jews, this would be a false Gog-Magog war, to the Christians, a false Armageddon. Let me start off by defending the idea that these wars in Daniel 11, 40 through 45 take place after the covenant, but before the midpoint. One of the reasons is because of Daniel 12.1. As most of you know, the chapter breaks in the Bible are not canonical. They were added in the Middle Ages. The chapter break between Daniel 11 and 12 makes some people miss the clear chronological connection, which is made plain by the phrase, at that time, in Daniel 12.1. Quote, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. At what time? Well, it could be general or specific. It could be just at the time of these wars, or it could be at the exact time where it says the Antichrist pitches his royal tents outside Jerusalem, but comes to his end. In the next episode, I will argue that this coming to his end is the apparent death and resurrection of the Antichrist spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, which causes most of the world to worship him as God, which precedes him sitting in the temple, declaring himself to be God at the midpoint. And some strong evidence of that is this phrase that Daniel uses, a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation until that time. Many of you will recognize that phrase as something that was spoken of in the Olivet Discourse by Jesus. It says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in the house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those that are nursing infants in those days, Pray that your flight not be on the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So this time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time, corresponds to, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be, which almost no conservative scholar would dispute is talking about the time just after the midpoint. Therefore, we can expect the wars of the Antichrist described in Daniel 11, 40 through 45 to occur before the midpoint. Another reason I would suggest that these wars in Daniel 11, 40-45 are before the midpoint is that the Antichrist, as we saw last time, is only given the authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation for three and a half years, a clear reference to the time after the midpoint. Therefore, if he is fighting with the king of the south and east and north, Edom and Moab and the Ammonites, he clearly does not have that authority yet. Therefore, these wars must be before the midpoint. Another way to pinpoint the Antichrist's wars on the timeline is found in the Olivet Discourse, where we see the birth pains. We know that these events occur before the midpoint, as Jesus makes it perfectly clear in context. But to those of you that have recognized the connections between the events in the Olivet Discourse and the seals in Revelation 6, you know that the first few birth pains and the first few seals correspond to the beginning of the seven-year period, and both are a picture of the Antichrist conquering and making war, whether that's the rider on the white horse going out conquering and to conquer, or the first birth pains, which is false Christs and wars and rumors of wars. You also know that there is a clear chronological progression from the birth pains to the abomination of desolation at the midpoint, and then to the celestial disturbances and the beginning of the day of the Lord. So to the degree that you understand that the seals and the events of Matthew 24 are linked is the same degree you will have proof that the wars of the Antichrist are after the beginning of the 70th week, but before the midpoint. Let's move on to a critical and often overlooked subject, who is the Antichrist fighting and why? And let's first figure out what we can be sure of with clear passages with regard to who he is fighting, and then work through some of the less clear passages to determine who else he might be fighting. 
Starting off, we know Egypt is the unambiguous king of the south and is the enemy of the Antichrist in these wars initially. It says right here that Egypt attacks him. Also in verse 42, it's as plain as can be that the Antichrist both fights with and soundly defeats Egypt in these wars. This fact alone makes this a difficult passage for the Islamic Antichrist theorists. Why should a Muslim Antichrist attack a Muslim country as his first order of business? I believe it's also clear that the king of the north attacks him as well. It says the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. The king of the north in the earlier parts of this chapter is the Greek Seleucid Empire, which is today a coalition of Islamic nations we might think of in biblical parlance as Assyria. I'll come back to this one later because there are some who don't think it's as clear as I do. Next up is the glorious land. It says, He shall come into the glorious land, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. A lot of people assume that the entering of the glorious land is to kill Jews. And while that's possible, I don't think that's what this passage is telling us. The reason is because of the second part of the verse, which says, But these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. These are all historical, biblical enemies of Israel, which are today Islamic nations. The ESV says they were, quote, delivered from his hands. Other versions say they escaped from his hand. The underlined Hebrew word for being delivered seems to mean here the same thing it means in English, which is to escape from something. Every lexicon I checked translates it this way, that is, in a way that makes it clear that these groups were being pursued by the Antichrist as enemies, but were able to slip away. If this is true, we have two data points to help with our interpretation. Number one, the glorious land which he enters and destroys people in apparently includes vast areas around modern Israel, like the majority of Jordan. So while I'm sure that the glorious land must include Israel, it certainly is not limited to what we would think of as Israel. Number two, the Antichrist is attempting to kill local enemies of Israel explicitly with this offensive. It may be that he also kills Jews here, but we are not told that. All we know for sure is that he is attempting to kill Edomites, Moabites, and Ammonites, but is unsuccessful. I think this military move of the Antichrist in the glorious land is attempting to root out not just the large macro enemies of Israel, which we saw in the previous verse like Egypt and Assyria, but the micro enemies as well, what we would think of as the Palestinians or Philistines on the coastlands, and of course Edom and Moab. I think an important passage to interpret this is found in Isaiah 11, which is one of the only other places in the Bible that these nations are mentioned together. There you will see a prophecy of the Messiah, and it's one of the more clear passages about the millennium. But we also see a picture of the battles of the Messiah, in which he defeats the enemies of Israel, including Egypt, Assyria, Edom, Moab, Ammon, and the Philistines, in battle to prepare the world for the kingdom age, a prophecy which has yet to be fulfilled. To set the stage, I'll start at verse 8. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people, from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathos, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamrath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall swoop down on the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people of the east. And they shall put out their hands against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites shall obey them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongues of the sea of Egypt." and will wave his hand over the river with scorching breath, and strike it into seven channels, and will lead people across the sandals. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people, as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. There are many such prophecies in the Bible about this pre-Messianic age battle. The idea is that rooting out the micro and macro enemies of Israel from the land 
something that was never really done in Joshua's day but was commanded to be done, will finally be accomplished by the Messiah. This will restore the so-called Greater Israel, which is the land that was initially given to Abraham, which is from Assyria to Egypt. And this highway from Assyria to Egypt is a consistent theme to refer to the geography of the Messianic Age. To put it another way, no conservative Torah-believing Jew would believe that the Messiah has come and the Messianic Age has begun unless this entire Middle East basically is under the control of the Messiah. And I believe it's as clear as day that that is exactly what the Antichrist is attempting to fulfill in these wars in Daniel 11. One quick sidebar is that I think one of the reasons that this prophecy may have been given is to provide future peoples with a way to prove that the Antichrist is not the Messiah. In Isaiah 11, the Messiah is supposed to conquer Edom, Moab, and Ammon. It's a critical part of the prophecy. And yet the Antichrist, we are told by Daniel, is not going to be able to do so. They are delivered from his hands, possibly providentially. Some think it has something to do with those who hide in Petra, but in any case, he can't do it. And I think it's going to be one way to prove that he isn't who he says he is. Moving on to Libya and Cush. It says in Daniel 11:43, He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and Cushites shall follow in his train. I think it's less clear about Libya and Cush. These are also African nations geographically. Think of Ethiopia as well as, well, Libya. It simply says of them that they follow in his train. This could mean that they do this as a result of the spectacular conquest of Egypt, as opposed to them having been allies or something before this. I think that every commentary I have on this assumes that this is a picture of their capitulation as a result of his conquest of Egypt, though they could also be a part of the many countries that the Antichrist was said to conquer as well. Next up, we have this news from the north and east, which troubles him. We're not told where this is, and it's kind of difficult to speculate with no other information, but we are told that it results in the annihilation of many people. Here again, I think that at least one reasonable takeaway on this point is that those who he kills here are not Jews. It's hard to imagine how news from the East would be seen as Jewish people. So if I do nothing here today, realize that the Antichrist is busy with killing Gentiles before the midpoint of the seven-year period. Okay, so let's back up and talk about the King of the North debate from the first part, from verse 40. Remember I said that I think it's clear that along with the King of the South, who is Egypt, the king of the north also attacks the Antichrist. The verse reads like this, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. Because the grammar is not quite clear as to who him is referring to here, there has arisen a division on how to interpret this verse. But pretty much all sides recognize that the grammar could go either way, so we need to find other criteria to determine the truth of this. The two main theories are sometimes called the three-king theory and the two-king theory, and there are really good scholars on both sides of the issue. On the one hand, you have the three-king theory, which sees there being three subjects in verse 40, the Antichrist, the King of the North, and the King of the South. So it would read as follows. And at the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, the Antichrist, and the king of the north will storm against him, the Antichrist. And he, the Antichrist, will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. So in this reading, the king of the south attacks the Antichrist, then the king of the north attacks the Antichrist, but the Antichrist defeats them both. The two-king theory has only two subjects in view. This is because they see the king of the north as the Antichrist. So it would read like this. At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, the king of the north slash antichrist, and the king of the north, the antichrist, will storm against him, the king of the south, and he, the king of the north, will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. In this reading, it would be saying that the king of the south attacks the king of the north, who is also the antichrist, but the king of the north, who is also the antichrist, attacks the king of the south as well, and the antichrist will be victorious. So if you are a three-king theorist like me, you think that both Egypt and Assyria attack the Antichrist in Daniel 11.40. If you are a two-king theorist, you think that the Antichrist, who is the king of the north, is attacked by Egypt in Daniel 11.40. Some of the reasons I hold to the three-king theory are that the pronouns he and him would be inconsistent otherwise. And I'm going to quote here from J. Paul Tanner. 
In Daniel 11.40, the pronouns on the prepositions marking the recipient of the verbal action are quite out of keeping with the way the hostilities between the two kings were previously described in the chapter. What I mean to say is that elsewhere in the chapter, whenever an assault by one of the kings against the other was mentioned, the one who was the object is specified by his full title, not merely a pronoun. In light of this characteristic writing style of the author, the him is more likely the same referent in this verse, namely the king of the preceding paragraph, i.e. the Antichrist. This favors the three-king theory. Basically, the three-king theory has the distinction of being the way that you would naturally read the text, in my opinion. The two-king theory, I think, requires a teacher to tell you what is meant. However, I have compiled the arguments as well as my responses to those arguments for the two-king theory as well, just to be thorough. One of the arguments for the two-king theory is that people will say, well, if the three-king theory is true, it would mean that the North and South are allies all of a sudden. Joel Richardson, a proponent of the two-king theory, argues that in the three-king view, the king of the North and the king of the South have become allies, a point that he strongly disagrees with. Quote, the kings of the north and south who are enemies throughout the historical portion of the prophecy are suddenly cast as allies together against the Antichrist. I have two things to say about this. The first is that it's not a necessary conclusion of the three king theory at all. Richardson quotes Tim LaHaye on this, who theorizes that since the king of the north attacks the Antichrist and the king of the south attacks him, that this is a coordinated attack of allies against their common enemy, the Antichrist. That view is assumed by LaHaye, but the text certainly does not say that they are coordinated joint attacks against the Antichrist or that the two kings are allies in any way. In addition, we're not given the chronology of these attacks. How far apart is the attack of the king of the north from the king of the south? We're not told. It could be years between these attacks. It could simply be that the Antichrist is attempting to gain control over the entire region, and these are isolated attempts from these countries at protecting themselves from the Antichrist. But even if these countries are making an alliance here against the Antichrist, it's not damaging to the three king theory at all. In fact, contrary to what Richardson said, such a thing has precedence in the historical portion of Daniel 11. For example, an alliance was formed in verse 6 between the king of the north and the king of the south. There's no biblical reason that these kings would not find it advantageous to form an end times alliance in light of a mutual enemy of the magnitude of the Antichrist. The next thing that two king theorists will say about the three king view is that it makes Antiochus a type of the Antichrist and a type of his enemy. Joel Richardson says, the three king view turns Antiochus into both a type of the Antichrist throughout all of Daniel chapter 8 as well as Daniel 11, 21 through 35, and a type of the Antichrist's greatest enemy. He says this because in the three king view, you have the Antichrist defeating the king of the north, when in the historical portion of this chapter, the king of the north was the Seleucid Empire of which Antiochus was a part. I think this view is reading far too much into the idea of biblical types. Yes, Antiochus is a type of the Antichrist, but so is the king of Tyre, the king of Babylon, the king of Egypt, and more. But you're going to have nothing but contradictions if you start to demand that the fulfillment of the type will act just as their type did. By this point in Daniel, Antiochus is long gone. Everyone knows it. We're talking about just the Antichrist and the prophecies of his actions here. What Antiochus did or didn't do has nothing to do with this. Types are used to be shadows of things to come, but when you have transitioned to the actual description of the fulfillment of the prophecy with no type left, no conservative scholar even attempts to make Daniel 11, 40 through 45 about Antiochus, then the type has served its purpose. I would also argue that this is somewhat logically inconsistent as well. By its very nature, conservative scholars recognize that we've jumped from, you know, talking about Antiochus in verse 36, we've now jumped thousands and thousands of years into the future. There's no reason to expect we're dealing with anything remotely like it was in the Diodaci Wars. As I think most people understand, and as I've argued earlier in this study, this area is now ruled by 10 kings. It's just a different deal. There are not four kings. This is talking about a different situation. So we read the text and we sit under its judgment. We do not demand, well, it, it's not like Antiochus would have done. Uh, that's just irrelevant to this question. The next thing that people say against the three king theory was brought up by Dr. J. Paul Tanner in his recent commentary, in which he says that it talks a lot about the conquest of Egypt in Daniel 11, 40 through 45, 
but it barely mentions the war with the king of the north. So he's saying that maybe if the king of the north was the Antichrist, you know, it talks a lot about his warring against the king of the south, but it barely mentions the war with Assyria. To this, I would say that it does say that the king of the north came against him, quote, like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. It also mentions that he overwhelms them. So this seems to me to be sufficient discussion of the battle itself, especially if it was a decisive battle, as the text seems to suggest. In addition, it also seems to me that you should also object to the term many countries here, because using that logic, we should assume that these other countries were not really attacked, since we don't have exhaustive commentary on the battles or even how to know which countries are being referred to. Of course, we don't get to demand how much we're told on a given subject, and it's not a good hermeneutic to suggest that we should. I would also point out that verse 40 seems to be a kind of summary verse. It may be that it's summarizing verses 41 through 45, in which case the news from the north and east that troubles the Antichrist in verse 44 might actually be the attack of the king of the north, which is simply summarized in verse 40. I favor the three king view, but at the end of the day, nothing much changes. The Antichrist is still defeating the macro and micro enemies of Israel in this passage. I just think that Assyria is also being defeated as well. The final thing I want to discuss today is the three kings of Daniel 7. And I know I'm confusing you with throwing a different set of three kings at you, uh, but this one is from Daniel 7, which reads, It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man with a mouth speaking pompous words. And then later on in Daniel 7, 24, the angel interprets this as the Antichrist essentially uprooting or uh, humiliating three of these ten kings. I think that these wars in Daniel 11 are essentially a picture of the Antichrist subduing those three horns or king's kingdoms from Daniel 7. This view has a lot to recommend it in my opinion. When the angel interprets what the Antichrist does to these three kings, it uses this Hebrew word, which is sometimes translated as humble or to bring low or to subdue. He does this to those three kings. And in Daniel 11, it's sort of like a picture, a story of capitulation, of almost like groveling, certainly subduing or humbling of these kings would be involved. I think you can make a strong case that Egypt, Libya, and Cush are described that way clearly as being subdued. I think this would also fit with the timeline, that is, whatever the Antichrist does with the three kings in Daniel 7, I think must occur between the covenant and the midpoint for the reasons we've discussed earlier. In my opinion, the three kings could be Egypt, Libya, and Cush, but I lean towards the idea that the three kings are Egypt, Assyria, and whoever the king of the east is. But it should be said clearly that there's no hard evidence that I can see that the three kings mentioned in Daniel 7, which will be subdued, are necessarily the, the people that are uh, defeated in Daniel 11. It's only a theory, but I think it's a pretty good one. Welcome to part five of a multi-week study called A Bible Prophecy Timeline. Today's episode is entitled Palatial Tense. Palatial Tense is an event that I've placed on the timeline just after the Wars of the Antichrist and just before the Abomination of Desolation at the Midpoint. The term palatial tense comes from the last verse in Daniel 11. For context, I'll start from verse 44 and continue through Daniel 12, 1. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury and destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. Palatial tents, or some versions translate it as royal tents or tabernacles of his palace, it seems to amount to the same thing, though, which is that after he defeats Egypt and Assyria and whoever this is from the east and the north, he sets up a camp just outside of Jerusalem. This setting up of the palatial tent seems to be within the flow of the narrative of the wars. In other words, I think we're supposed to understand that the multiple tents being set up are for his army and or for those following in his train, as verse 43 has it. 
It says here in the ESV that these tents are pitched between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Though some translations say things like between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, which actually does change things. So either it's just outside Jerusalem or in Jerusalem, but obviously it's very close to Jerusalem. According, I think, to the narrative flow, the Antichrist is done conquering here. He has proven his might in battle. He has all the wealth of Egypt in his possession. The palatial tents is a picture of a victorious Antichrist. And I think we're supposed to understand it as such because of the next line, which says, yet he will come to his end with none to help him. This could mean that, yes, the Antichrist will have all these successes and take over pretty much the entire Middle East, but it's okay because he will come to his end with none to help him. Sort of like a consolation, like a fast forward statement. I would argue that we have multiple good reasons to think something more is meant here. We talked last time about the connection of Daniel 12.1 and how the chapter break between 11.45 and 12.1 is a bit confusing considering it has clear connecting language with the phrase at that time. I talked about how what it says will happen at that time is that shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. And how that phrase was essentially what Jesus quoted in the Olivet Discourse to refer to the time just after the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist sits in the temple and declares himself to be God at the midpoint of the seven-year period. So the idea I'm going to try to prove here is that when it says the Antichrist comes to his end with none to help him in 1145, it's referencing the death and resurrection of the Antichrist, which by my count is mentioned six times in the book of Revelation. Twice it's described as the reason the earth dwellers worship the Antichrist. And since we know that he does not demand worship until after the midpoint, it's yet another reason to justify this timing. I'll try to convince you more of the fact of the resurrection of the Antichrist next time, but today I just want to deal with the timing of the resurrection, which again I think is just after the victories and just before the midpoint. But to do that, I first need to make sure that you know that Daniel 12.1 is talking about the midpoint. We have this verse that Jesus quotes about the midpoint when he says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. But we also have this reference to Michael the Archangel standing up. I'll deal with this in detail later, but I wanted to quickly point out that Michael the Archangel has a strong link to the midpoint of the seven-year period, which we can see in Revelation 12. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even until death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe unto you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, a times, and a half a time. This war with Michael takes place at the midpoint. The three and a half year period is mentioned or alluded to three times in Revelation 12, and it's about the time when Satan is cast down to earth. This means that Michael throws Satan down at the midpoint. So it's no surprise that Michael is being mentioned here in conjunction with a phrase that is also unambiguously about the midpoint. I'll come back to what Michael is doing here, but the point is that if we need to connect Daniel 11.45 to Daniel 12.1 because of the at that time phrase, and we know that Daniel 12.1 is about the midpoint, it forces us to make some kind of interpretation about timing here. It could be that when it says at that time, it's wanting the reader to go all the way back to verse 40, where it starts out the wars section with another important timing phrase, at the time of the end, as in, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. I think this is the absolute earliest point that Daniel 12 ones at that time could be referring to. In which case, it would necessitate the interpretation that the midpoint begins with the wars of the Antichrist, that is, when Egypt attacks the Antichrist. This is difficult for me to accept, 
partially because it would mean that the first few years after the midpoint, the Antichrist is still consolidating power, which runs against the idea that he has authority over every tribe and nation for three and a half years, i.e. starting at the midpoint. The other option for at that time is simply the preceding verse. In this case, just after the Antichrist sets up his palace tents in Jerusalem and comes to his end. At that time, Michael stands up and an unparalleled persecution begins. So how can the midpoint of the seven-year period be after the Antichrist comes to his end? I think it's because he either seems to or really does resurrect from the dead at this point. It's this resurrection that precedes him declaring himself to be God and demanding worship. And you have to admit, that would be a pretty good time to declare yourself to be God and demand worship right after you seem to rise from the dead. I think we can see even more evidence for this theory when we dig a little deeper on the concept of Michael the Archangel, quote, standing up in Daniel 12.1 because it will lead us down a road that will, I think, prove that the resurrection of the Antichrist happens just before the abomination of desolation at the midpoint. And here I'm going to play an old audio of me reading my commentary on Daniel on this point. Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Michael, the archangel, as he is called in Jude 9, seems to be in view here. God has apparently assigned Michael to, quote, watch over Israel. Michael is an angel with great power. In fact, he seems to be put opposite of Satan in a fight in a number of instances in Scripture, at least one of which he obviously wins, Revelation 12, 7-9, and Jude 1, 9. David Guzik makes the remark that some think that God and Satan are opposites, but a much more theologically correct view would be saying that Michael the Archangel and Satan are opposites. So what does Michael, quote, standing up have to do with the Great Tribulation? Many see this verse as a reference to Michael standing up in the sense of getting ready to defend Israel during the, quote, time of trouble that immediately follows this phrase. But this is a problematic interpretation. One reason is because if that is his mission, to protect them, then he fails at it. This time is linked to the same period described by Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 through 22. If this is the case, then the very moment that Michael tries to protect them, he loses more of them than ever before in history. Such a conclusion is unlikely to be true. Contextually, it would appear much more likely that Michael's standing up is what allows the time of trouble to begin. Colin Nickel, in his paper, Michael, the Restrainer Removed, points out that the term used here for, quote, standing up was understood by Jewish commentators like Rashi to mean, quote, to stand still or to move aside to allow the time of trouble to happen to the Jewish people. Nickel points out that the Hebrew term for stand is very often used in scripture to refer to inaction or a direct contrast to action, i.e. to stand still. Joshua 10.13, Habakkuk 3.11, 1 Samuel 9.27, 2 Samuel 2.28, Nahum 2.9, and 2 Kings 4.6, or to refer to inactivity, 2 Chronicles 20.17, or to describe the cessation of an action, 2 Kings 13.18, Genesis 29.35 and 39, Joshua 1.15, or to mean stand silent, as in Job 32.16. He also points out that the term by the time of the Apostle Paul was frequently used in a figurative sense, meaning to disappear or to pass away. These and a great many other things he details in his paper lead him to the view that Michael is the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2. This would, of course, make a huge amount of sense, as in that passage we see that the abomination of desolation is being held back only by the restrainer ceasing to restrain, which is exactly what we would have here. The Great Tribulation, which begins at the abomination of desolation, is here said to be contingent upon the inaction of Michael. It is almost a certain conclusion that this passage is where Paul gets this idea, after, of course, being directed by the Lord to study the same passage in Matthew 24:15. So we already have Michael being mentioned in connection with Great Tribulation language in Daniel 12.1, and we've seen that Michael is associated with the last three and a half year period in Revelation 12. But if we understand that Michael is the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2, we have one more link to the midpoint, as well as a key bit of evidence regarding the resurrection of the Antichrist at that time. I need to read this entire section in 2 Thessalonians 2 because Paul's response to the Thessalonians, who thought that they had missed the rapture and were in the day of the Lord's wrath, were consoled by Paul by his reminding them that they had not seen the abomination of desolation yet. 
And since the day of the Lord is not until some unknown time after the abomination of desolation, they could not possibly be in the day of the Lord. Paul points to the abomination event because it is the central sign Jesus told his disciples to watch for when they asked him about the signs of his coming, but also because it's such a blatantly obvious thing that would be nearly impossible to miss. Jesus himself says, when you see it, flee from it. Let's read the passage. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God? Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The two takeaways for our purposes here is that Paul calls the abomination of desolation at the midpoint the revelation of the man of sin, which of course makes sense in light of Jesus' warnings about it. It's only after the abomination that people will know for sure that the Antichrist is the Antichrist, because that's what Jesus told us to watch for and to flee from when we see it. The other takeaway is that he equates this event at the midpoint with the restrainer being removed, which again makes logical sense. If the Antichrist gets authority to kill the saints for three and a half years, and as we know, the greatest persecution of all time begins immediately after the midpoint, then of course that is when the restrainer is removed, at the midpoint. Next time I'll talk a lot more about the Antichrist apparent resurrection and the abomination event, but I'm going to argue that Paul here in 2 Thessalonians 2 is following Jesus' instruction to read Daniel to know more about the abomination event when Jesus says, let the reader understand the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, etc., so Paul has gone back and has read Daniel 12, 1 and understands the Michael connection, which is why he's talking about the restrainer here and, act, and telling people that, hey, you remember when I taught you about all this stuff in connection with the midpoint? So he talks about the midpoint. He talks about the man standing in the holy place, declaring himself to be God. And it's that context when he talks about the strong delusion that God sends so that people will believe the lie. That kind of comes out of nowhere if you think about it. What is the strong delusion? I know everybody has a theory or two about it, but I think in context, knowing everything that we've known here, that you can actually find this from the context. It's talking about the resurrection of the Antichrist. That is the strong delusion so that people will believe the lie. And as I said earlier, there are at least two places in Revelation where it says that the reason that people worship the Antichrist is because he had a mortal wound that was healed. That is their reason. That is the reason that they worship him. So, so I believe that is the connection that we need. Welcome back to my multi-week study called A Bible Prophecy Timeline. Today's episode is called The Resurrection of the Antichrist, and I've placed this event on the timeline after the palatial tense and after the Antichrist is killed, but just before the abomination of desolation. And right there I should point out that the bullet point for the Antichrist is killed, which I'm not doing a separate video for because the concept was covered in the last episode, but it might actually be misnamed because as we'll see, though I think that there is ample evidence to suggest that the Antichrist will resurrect from the dead, there are, as far as I know, no details as to how he dies. It simply says he has a mortal wound that was healed. Revelation 13, 3 says, One of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. It seems that this healing is one of, if not the main reason, that people marvel and follow him. Other translations tend to make this a little more clear. The Holman Christian Standard says, One of his heads appeared to be fatally wounded, but his fatal wound was healed, 
the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. So it makes the causation a little more obvious. His mortal wound was healed, which makes the world marvel and follow him. A lot of people reject the idea of the Antichrist being raised from the dead because they rightly argue that Satan cannot raise the dead. It's not one of his powers. For this reason, I tend to use the term apparent resurrection when I refer to this event, but I do that mostly as a courtesy to those people because it takes too long to explain that I believe that it's a real resurrection, not a fake one. But it's not Satan that does it, it's God himself. This is also the conclusion of Gregory Harris in his paper, Can Satan Raise the Dead? Toward a Biblical View of the Beast's Wound, published in the Master's Seminary Journal. Among other things, he points out that in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul is describing the resurrection event in which God is the one who sends the, quote, strong delusion associated with the revelation of the Antichrist at the midpoint. And he does so, so that the earth dwellers would believe the lie, which as we saw in Revelation 13, it does exactly that. It makes the earth dwellers believe the lie and follow and worship the beast. In context, this section of 2 Thessalonians 2 is about the revelation of the Antichrist at the midpoint. Paul talks about him sitting in the temple, declaring himself to be God. And then we come to this verse. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. As a side note, I was thinking a lot about this verse this week where it says uh, that they may believe what is false. The strong delusion God sends so that they may believe what is false. What is it that is false? Is it the resurrection itself? Is the strong delusion to make them believe that the resurrection happened when in fact it did not happen? No, the strong delusion is the resurrection. What is false is that he is who he says he is, God. It is, that's what is false, that the Antichrist claims are true. They follow and worship him as a result of the strong delusion because the strong delusion makes them believe what is false, that he is God or the Messiah or whatever he is claiming to be. So that's what is false here. The strong delusion, in effect, is the resurrection. There are several verses that talk about the resurrection of the Antichrist other than Revelation 13.3, but I think an easy way for me to go through this is to quote at length from a verse-by-verse -verse study I did on Revelation 17 and 18 in my book, Mystery Babylon, and I use the occasion of talking about Revelation 17.8 to talk about this issue in totality, so I'll play the audio from that right now. This next phrase was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. This phrase gives people a great deal of difficulty, and so we will spend quite a lot of time on it. I intend to show that this idea of was and is not and coming out of the bottomless pit is a title referring to the Antichrist's having been miraculously healed or resurrected from the dead. The last phrase in this verse, the beast that was and is not and yet is, being another way to say the exact same thing. That is, that he lives, he dies, and he seems to rise again, and will ultimately go to destruction or perdition. It's sort of a chronology of his entire career on earth, and it functions as a title on several occasions in the book of Revelation. Before I begin to explain the details of this, we need to refresh our memories to the significance that the Bible puts on the seeming resurrection of the Antichrist from the dead. Let's review Revelation chapter 13, which is primarily about the Antichrist, to make sure we understand this preliminary idea. In the relatively short chapter of Revelation 13, it mentions three times the fatal wound of the Antichrist beast that was healed, the first instance being in verse 3. It says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? It seems to imply here that the world's worship of the beast is directly connected to his deadly wound being healed. It says that they wondered after him, saying, Who can make war with him? This is the exact same word used in our current verse, wondered. And it is in the exact same context, that is, wonder from the earth dwellers associated with worship and the resurrection of the dead. 
This is one of the first descriptions of the Antichrist that we are given in the book of Revelation. Right after the symbolic imagery of verse 1 and 2, this is the first thing that we are told about the beast, that he has a deadly wound that is healed. The Bible, as we will see, considers this event very important, if not preeminent. By the second reference of this event in verse 12, the idea of a healed deadly wound has become a title or identifying description of the beast. Here it distinguishes between the first beast from the second by adding the clarification whose deadly wound was healed. And so it says in Revelation 13:12, And he, speaking of the false prophet, exerciseth all the power of the first beast, that is, the Antichrist, before him, and causes all the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And here in the third reference in 1314, we see that the healed deadly wound is again used as a title or distinguishing characteristic of the Antichrist beast. Here it says, and speaking of the false prophet here, he deceiveth him that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. So here again, we see this idea of a resurrection being used as a title to distinguish which beast they're talking about. So this phrase, was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, is basically just another way of saying the same thing. It is an identifier as to which beast we're talking about. It's the one that was, lived, is not, died, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, or come back from the dead. Arthur Pink, an early English Bible scholar who wrote extensively on the Antichrist, agrees. He says the following, A further reference to the resurrection of the Antichrist, his coming forth from the bottomless pit, is found in Revelation 17.8. It is to be noted that the earth dwellers wonder when they behold the beast that was alive and is not, now alive and yet is, raised again. The world will then be presented with the spectacle of a man raised from the dead. Pink, as well as many other people, associate the phrase coming out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 17.8 with the apparent resurrection of the Antichrist in Revelation 13. We will see explicit biblical proof of this interpretation at the end of today's study. The Bible uses the word abyss, which is translated here as bottomless pit in many different ways. It is a prison for spirits in Mark chapter 5. It's almost synonymous with the abode of the dead in the Old Testament. This word abyss is also the same word that the Apostle Paul uses to describe where Jesus went during at least part of the three days in which he was dead before he resurrected. For context, I'll start at verse 6 of Romans 10, 6, and 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or, Who shall descend into the deep? That word there is abyss that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. So, the same word for bottomless pit or abyss is also the place where Christ came out of when he resurrected. We find more detail on this event in Acts 2, verses 27 through 32. This is during Pentecost, where Peter will start off in this quote by quoting from the Old Testament. He says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, that word there is Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Then he continues, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulture is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, again, Hades here, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Now, this is interesting because here the word Hades was mentioned as the place where Jesus' soul went when he died, when Paul says that it was the abyss. But we can see that contextually they are both talking about the place where Jesus' soul went during his death. My point is not to do an exhaustive theological study on this subject, but only to show you that Jesus went to the abyss at some point during his death. He may have also went to other locations in Hades, such as Paradise or even Tartarus, 
There are more references to this event in which I will leave for you to study further. Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, 2 Peter 2, 4 through 5, Matthew 12, 38 through 45, Luke 23, 43. My only point is that coming up from the abyss can be shown from scripture to mean resurrection from the dead. So, these phrases are used like a title referring to the Antichrist's apparent resurrection from the dead. It is as if it's a chronology of his career and a title at the same time. He is the beast that lives, dies, resurrects, and ultimately meets his doom in perdition or in the lake of fire in Revelation 19.20. So, I would suggest that the following phrases are all referring to not only the same person, the Antichrist, but the same identifying event in that person's life his apparent resurrection, the beast that was and is not and yet is, the beast that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, and one more very interesting one that we will look at later. One issue I wanted to address, which I didn't there, is that some people, I think mainly because they simply don't like the idea of the Antichrist being raised from the dead, they think that, well, it has to be Satan that raises uh, him from the dead if he raises from the dead, so therefore I need to argue against this. So they try to limit this passage in Revelation 17 to just be about the kingdom of the Antichrist and not the Antichrist himself. They'll say, well, the Antichrist kingdom resurrects, and they've got all kinds of theories, and everybody's got a theory about which kingdom resurrects and what that means about resurrection and things like that. And while I think that there's no doubt that the kingdom of the Antichrist is also in view here, it's also talking about the man of the Antichrist as well. And there is no contradiction. As I've said many times in this study, I think that scripture demands that you see the heads of the beast in Daniel and Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 as both kings and kingdoms, as it says, I think, directly in Revelation 17, 9 through 11. And if you try to limit it to just one or the other, oh, the heads are just kings or the heads are just kingdoms, then you will run into unresolvable contradictions at some point. You must see them as both. So let's go through this. In this case, in Revelation 17, there's a lot to parse out, but as I detailed, I consider the was and is not and the abyss language to be analogous with the healing of the wound language of Revelation 13, therefore applicable to the king or human aspects of these heads. The next few verses, Revelation 17, 9 through 11, really apply to both aspects at the same time. And I think you're going to be able to see this better because of some of the things we've covered in the earlier episodes. The verses read, This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. So let's think about this from the kingdom aspect first. If the seven heads of the beast are kingdoms, they are probably something like Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the Antichrist kingdom. As I've said in earlier episodes, the Antichrist kingdom is really in two different stages. There is the stage during the first three and a half years in which he, through warfare, conquers the system of the ten kings which ruled the world before he he arrived. And then, though it is technically the same kingdom with the same ten kings geographically, there is a second phase, the theocracy, which begins at the midpoint, where the Antichrist forces the entire world to actually worship him or die, i.e. the mystery Babylon phase. The interesting thing is that this works out perfectly if you substituted the king aspect here as well. And it works out because, as we've seen in the last episode, the resurrection occurs just before the midpoint, i.e. the moment when the kingdom changes to a theocracy as well. So you can have this concept of the Antichrist himself being an eighth, but still one of the seven as a result of his resurrection. And that same concept works for the kingdom. It doesn't change as well. They're the same, but qualitatively different. It's the same with both him as a person and his kingdom in this scenario. Though it should be said that the phrase, the beast that was and is not, is simply a reference to his resurrection only, which has become a title for the Antichrist since Revelation 13.3. 
Next week, we'll look at the abomination of desolation event and try to look at that from a different perspective, because I think when you see what the Antichrist is trying to do by sitting in the temple and declaring himself to be God, you're going to see parallels to what the actual Messiah will do in the millennial kingdom. But the resurrection of the Antichrist is key to that event as well. That incredible boast, that is to say that he is God, does not come out of nowhere. It comes from the fact that he is just publicly raised up from the dead. We have explicit information that this is why the world agrees to worship him in the first place, as we saw in Revelation 13.3. So the abomination event needs to be understood in that light as well. This episode, part seven, will touch on three bullet points on the timeline. The abomination of desolation, antichrist worship, and the great tribulation. As far as the timing of the abomination of desolation, there really is no debate on this one, at least among premillennials, as we all understand the abomination event to take place right in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel, specifically 1,260 days into the seven-year period. This can be determined a number of ways, but chief among them is with Daniel 9.27, but also see Daniel 11.45 through 12.1, Daniel 12.11, and Matthew 24.15. So instead of talking about the timing of the abomination of desolation here, I'm going to offer an interpretation of what is happening with that event. And I'm going to do so by reading from my book, False Christ, and adding in some new information here and there that I've been thinking about since I wrote it. So here we go. So when the Antichrist sits in this apparently rebuilt Jewish temple, the daily sacrifices that have apparently been going on for some time before this will stop. The fact that the daily sacrifices are stopped at this point is often used to promote the idea that the Antichrist will sit in the temple simply for the purpose of blaspheming the God of the Bible and disrespecting the temple, as if to say to everyone that the Jewish religion is untrue and that he is opposed to it. And the chief reason and a good reason to interpret it that way is because that was indeed the nature of the first abomination of desolation with Antiochus Epiphanes around 156 BC, which was a typological prefiguration of this event. We know that it was a typological prefiguration because Jesus in the Olivet Discourse says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. So it had already happened in Daniel, but Jesus is telling us when you see it. So it's a future event and it's a past event. I would take exception to this idea that the actions of the Antichrist at the midpoint should be seen as antagonistic to Judaism and suggests that there are a number of clues in the Bible that suggest that the far fulfillment of this event with the Antichrist will be different in many ways and much more of an abomination than the near fulfillment was. The abomination of desolation will indeed be the height of blasphemy, but the reason it will be blasphemy is because the Antichrist's exaltation of himself as God is untrue. It was not blasphemy for Jesus to claim to be divine, as the Pharisees believed, because he was, in fact, God. However, it will be blasphemy and an abomination when the Antichrist makes the same claim. I suggest that the defiling of the temple occurs not because the Antichrist is claiming that God is bad or presenting any other type of overt verbal blasphemy in the temple, but because he claims to be the God of the Bible and the Messiah and accepts worship as such in the temple. I think that Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 is actually making that particular distinction. That is, that the Antichrist is claiming not only to be the God of the Bible, i.e. Yahweh, but he's also essentially outlawing all other religions of the world at that point. It says in verse 4, speaking of the Antichrist at the abomination of desolation, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So what he says the Antichrist does when he sits in the temple of God is exalt himself above two things, every so-called God and every object of worship. I think that when people casually read this, they think that the Antichrist is claiming to be higher than every God, including Yahweh. But the words that Paul is using here are quite unique. For example, this phrase, objects of worship, is actually a single word in the Greek, sabasma, 
and it's used only one other time in scripture. So that's pretty interesting because you would think objects of worship could just mean idol or something that's used probably thousands of times in scripture. But no, this is a unique word, one other time it's used, and that's in Acts 17. And it's used there to refer to pagan statues of all the various gods of the world and the Greek gods at Areopagus when Paul was visiting there and a missionary journey. So Sabasma, these gods of Greek culture at least, maybe the world, is one thing that Paul says the Antichrist will exalt himself above at the abomination event. The other thing that he will exalt himself over is every so-called god. Now that phrase is a combination of Greek words lego for to say and theos for god. And though the individual words are not unique, the combination, that phrase, is unique. As far as I can tell, and it's a little harder for me to research combinations of words, but as far as I can tell, it also is used only one other time in scripture, which is in 1 Corinthians 8. And I think Paul is there explaining essentially what he means by the phrase so-called God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods, that is our phrase lego theos, in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist." Some commentators think that Paul is just simply equating the so-called gods with the idols here, just saying that so-called gods are just fake gods in the way that idols are also fake. Though I tend to see him here saying that, yes, idols are obviously not real, they're made of wood and everything, but there are spiritual beings behind some of them in both heaven and earth that people worship. It really doesn't matter because in either case, the point I'm making here stands, which is that the phrase so-called gods and the word sabasma or objects of worship in 2 Thessalonians 2 are specific and unique terms that Paul uses in other places to refer to pagan gods. In addition to 2 Thessalonians 2 saying that the Antichrist is declaring himself to be higher than all pagan gods and pagan idols, it's also, I think, making it explicit that he is declaring himself to be Yahweh, the God of the Bible, which seems quite evident by the next phrase, which says, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. So it's saying that in the taking of the seed of Yahweh, he is claiming to be Yahweh. I think this is as clear as day. Okay, moving on. This event and related scriptures show that the Antichrist is actually carrying his messianic theology of the first three and a half years to its logical conclusion with the abomination of desolation. He would not be disrespecting the Jewish religion. He would be attempting to be seen as fulfilling it. What I mean is that the two main actions that the Antichrist takes at the abomination event are in line with good theology. In fact, they're in line with Christian theology. Christians agree that the Messiah is also God and that animal sacrifices should be stopped when the Messiah comes. The idea that sacrifices stop when the Messiah comes is standard theology that can be demonstrated from the Old Testament. In fact, there are Jewish rabbinic traditions stating that when the Messiah comes, sacrifices must cease. In addition, even though most Jewish people would argue passionately that the Messiah, when he comes, will not be God, but rather only a man, they could no doubt be convinced of their error on this point by the same Old Testament scriptures that Christian evangelists use to convince Jewish people that the real Messiah, Jesus, was in fact God and sacrifices should cease for salvation. This would be especially true if the person showing them those scriptures was also able to call fire down from heaven, as the false prophet will be able to do. So I think that what the church father Ambrose said is true. Quote, Antichrist will attempt to prove from scripture that he is the Christ. Further evidence that the Antichrist is actually reinforcing his claim to be the Messiah with the abomination event can be seen by the two other actions he takes at that point. Revelation 13, 14 through 15 says that the Antichrist sets up an image of himself. The people of the world will apparently be forced to worship this image under the penalty of death. The institution of this necessarily involves a worldwide or semi-worldwide pilgrimage to Jerusalem. If people are supposed to choose between worshiping the image or being killed by it, they must, it would seem, be physically present to do so. 
I would also argue that at least one way of worshiping will be offering gold, silver, and precious stones, Daniel 11.38 and Revelation 18.12, which further suggests that people who worship the Antichrist must go up to Jerusalem to do so. And I'll just interject here that in my book, Mystery Babylon, I think the entire Revelation 17 and 18 is the story of what happens when the entire world is forced to go to Jerusalem to worship the Antichrist. And why the merchants get so rich is because everybody has to buy all this stuff to worship him. But the point is, all of this stuff that the Antichrist does is actually stuff in the Old Testament that is prophecies about what the Messiah will do. Isaiah 60, 3 through 22 and 18, 7, Zechariah 14, 16 through 18 say that when the Messiah comes, he will rule the world from the temple and cause all the nations to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to offer praise and worship. In other words, exactly what the Antichrist is said to do. I want to expand a little bit on this concept of the image of the beast. I think that the Antichrist sets up this image, and it's probably in the temple where he sets it up. There's a few things that suggest that, though it doesn't say it explicitly. And it may even be that the abomination event itself is not him sitting in the temple, but rather the image. It's not exactly clear in my mind. It could be both, actually. He he initially sits in the temple himself, and then he sets up the image. In any case, I think the reason it's an image of himself, or it needs to be, is because he is still trying to make it look like he is fulfilling a very important prophecy, i.e. that the idea that the Messiah rules from the temple. Now, the real Messiah, Jesus, can probably rule from the temple for a thousand years or, or, or eternity or whatever, and also be other places because he actually is God and, you know, is God. But the Antichrist is, you know, while he's probably got supernatural stuff going on, he is not God and he's just a man. So I think the image is a way to sort of have your cake and eat it too, or at least that's my thoughts on it. The problem the Antichrist will face in attempting to falsify this prophecy is logistics. My guess is that he's not able or willing to sit in the temple to receive worship for extended periods of time. He may have other things to do, based on what the scripture says about his career after this event. So the image he sets up is a kind of stand-in for him. He gets to have all the legitimacy of seemingly fulfilling one of the most important aspects of messianic prophecy, while not actually having to physically be at the temple. I did want to insert here that over the years, I've come to believe that the image of the beast, in addition to that, is probably also a mechanism for Satan, that ancient serpent, the power behind the Antichrist throne, so to speak, to receive worship. It's it's really, this is all about Satan's plan anyway. It's all about how Satan getting the worship. So the image is just a proxy. It's getting the Antichrist out of the way just to sort of mainline the worship through that image. And that view is in part based on Revelation 13, 2 through 4. It's just suggestive when it says, and speaking of the earth dwellers, they worship the dragon, that is Satan, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast. So the earth dwellers are seeming to worship Satan, and they're worshiping the beast. It really never you know, fleshes that out or what that means. But the fact that it's distinct means that, you know, Satan is, is attempting to get worship on his own here. And the fact that this is in the same context, when it sort of institutionalizes worship later on in the chapter, when the false prophet actually sets up the image of the beast and forces the world to worship it or die, um, you know, that's kind of in this same context. That's how the uh, worship is done, so to speak. Something else that happens at the abomination event that seems to support the idea that the Antichrist is bolstering his messianic claim and not diminishing it is the persecution that begins at that time, the greatest persecution of all time called the Great Tribulation. Before I get into this, I should explain that when I say that the Antichrist is bolstering his messianic claim at the midpoint, not diminishing it, what I'm doing is arguing against the idea that some people have this notion that the Antichrist is pretending to be a good guy for the first three and a half years, but it, at the midpoint, they interpret it as him taking off the mask and just saying, whatever, you know, I'm the devil, worship me, you know? When I'm saying that, no, everything, including the midpoint, is a part of the deception. In fact, it may be, and I sort of lean towards the view that during the first half, when he's conquering and all the different things, he's probably 
I don't know if he's saying that he's the Messiah yet. I think it's only after he actually does it. He actually conquers the enemies of Israel uh, and he raises from the dead and all that, that he actually says, hey, your suspicions are correct. I am the Messiah. Let's go ahead and start the Messianic age. And in my book, I'm about to talk about how even the great tribulation, the greatest persecution of all time, is actually a part of Messianic, not only tradition in rabbinic tradition, but also in the Bible. That is to say, and I go through this in my book, uh, False Christ, about the extirpation, the belief that, you know, when the Messianic age starts, there needs to, to be a wiping out of people who won't go along with it. That's the rabbinic tradition, though there is a uh, similar thing in the Bible in which uh, uh, Jesus sort of uh, uh, deals with the enemies of Israel as well. I think one way to see the persecution that begins after the abomination of desolation in a different light is to recognize that there must be a lot of people that go along with it, that don't see the abomination as blasphemy at all. In fact, most will see the Antichrist declaration to be God as scriptural truth. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, 21, that the abomination will spark the greatest persecution that the world will ever see, and that it's of the utmost importance for people to leave Jerusalem very quickly when they see it occur, if they want to escape that persecution. You can assume that it's the people that believe the Antichrist claim to be God that are the ones doing the actual persecuting at this time. I mean, the Antichrist is going to have soldiers doing this. He's not going to have you know, flying monkeys like the Wizard of Oz doing the greatest persecution of all time. And you can actually read in the Olivet Discourse in this context about the Great Tribulation, it shows the psychology of the people that are doing the persecuting. It often talks about how, you know, brothers are going to give up their brothers and mothers are going to give up their children. These are people that are true believers that really want to give up those that won't worship the Antichrist. They think that they're just the, oh my gosh, I can't believe you don't worship the Antichrist. He's obviously so great. That's the kind of psychology that's being discussed there. So who are these people that join the Antichrist side? Well, basically the whole world, right? I mean, uh, mostly Gentiles because most of the world is Gentiles, but we forget that the Bible implies that the vast majority of Jews will also follow the Antichrist. Zechariah 13, 8 through 9 says that only one third of national Israel will repent in the end times. And since we know that either you're in the repentant group or you're in the group that got the mark and or worship the beast, therefore it can reasonably be argued that the majority of the Jews, two-thirds of them, will be worshipers or at least on team Antichrist in the end times. I think an often overlooked picture of this apostate Jerusalem in the end times can be seen in Revelation 11, where when the Antichrist is able to kill the two witnesses, so the two witnesses have been prophesying for three and a half years, uh, they are finally killed by the Antichrist. And the people of Jerusalem are said to celebrate the deaths of the two witnesses and give gifts to one another. They're so happy that the two witnesses are, are dead. Of course, they uh, resurrect three and a half days later, but uh, during that three days, they think it's all good. So you're looking at a Jerusalem that has rejected God's prophets, the two witnesses, and celebrated their death by the hands of the Antichrist. So it's not a good time spiritually in Jerusalem in the end times. So the idea that the Antichrist will claim to be the Messiah is supported by everything we know about this abomination of desolation event, the Antichrist declaration of himself as God after a major victory over the enemies of Israel, the stopping of the daily sacrifices, the setting up of an image to be worshipped by the world, and the greatest persecution of all time that has its epicenter in Judea. Before I wrap up this episode, I wanted to touch on a relevant topic that I have not had an occasion to talk about before, which is a criticism of this view, which goes like this, that the word antichrist in the Greek means against Christ. And of course, Christ means Messiah in the Greek. So the argument goes that the Antichrist, the Antichrist, what we call the Antichrist, can't be pretending to be the Messiah because the word Antichrist means against Messiah. So I suppose he is against the idea of Messiahs or against uh, uh, Jesus in particular uh, as a Messiah in something to that effect. However, when you look at the lexicons for this Greek word, Antichrist, you find that it's a lot more nuanced. And I'm just going to read a few entries 
The Lexham Bible Dictionary says the term Antichrist could mean either against Christ or in place of Christ, while the actual term Antichrist, which originates in the New Testament, appears infrequently in Scripture. The concept of the Antichrist appears numerous times in the New Testament because the broader concept appears more often than the specific term. Multiple perspective have been pre. Uh, presented on Antichrist, leading to the understanding that the better phrase used to discuss this issue may be eschatological antagonist. Other lexicons sort of reflect that idea. For example, this one says, Antichrist, one who opposes Christ, implying the usurping of Christ and his position. So you see what it did there? It's usurping. It's, yes, he's an opponent of Christ in that he is usurping Christ's position. Uh, another one, this is the pocket uh, lexicon to the Greek New Testament from Oxford. It says, Antichrist, either one who puts himself in the place of or the enemy opponent of the Messiah. And I don't even think it's an either or thing. I think the Antichrist does both when he shows up. He usurps the position of the real Messiah, even though he is not the real Messiah, and therefore makes himself an enemy of or an opponent of the Messiah because he does that, because he usurps that position. A couple more points on this. You have the biblical usage of Antichrist in 1 John. It's mentioned a few times there. And every one of those times essentially adds up to if a person denies that Jesus is the Messiah, then he is a general Antichrist. Because John was talking about how there were Antichrists at that time, mostly meaning false teachers that were teaching that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. But John also seems to equate that to the eschatological uh, Antichrist as well, who will in some way deny that Jesus was the Messiah, which I think is a probable uh, aspect of the Antichrist theology, namely that he'll say that Jesus didn't fulfill all the things that the Messiah was supposed to fulfill. Remember, this, the Messiah was supposed to uh, conquer the enemies of Israel and set up the kingdom in Israel, and Jesus didn't do that, so Jesus wasn't the Messiah. So I expect that to be in some way a part of the Antichrist theology, though I would say that it's difficult to know exactly what that will be. And finally, I would point to the Olivet Discourse, in which one could make the point that the main argument there is to warn people not to fall for it when a person pretending to be the Messiah shows up. Jesus starts out the whole message by saying, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And then he later continues on that theme of not following false messiahs in verse 23, where it says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there he is, don't believe it for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect see, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it for his lightning comes from the East and shines from uh, uh, as far as the West. So will the coming of the son of man be. So for those people that say that anti-Christ means against Christ only and can't mean in the place of or usurping the position of Christ, I would say, who are these guys in the Olivet Discourse? Because these are obviously people pretending to be the Christ. And we have very strong language saying, look, they're going to deceive many and lead many astray, even if possible, the elect, and don't go after them. Don't go in the wilderness and all this language to say, don't go after people pretending to be Christ. So are these antichrists under their view? I guess they would have to say no. And real quick, I should argue that though a lot of this is in the plural, where it says many shall say, look, I'm the Christ and they're going to deceive many. Are many going to do that? Are there going to be many false prophets and many false Christs? Well, I think that it says, yes, there will be, but that doesn't mean that that won't culminate in the false Christ and the false prophet. In fact, I think that the parallels in Revelation 6 and Matthew 24 prove that at least one of these false Christs is the Antichrist and one of these false prophets is the false prophet. I would argue probably that this is explained by there, there being really high messianic expectations because of the events of the first three and a half years. The conquest of Israel's enemies, the restarting of the sacrifices, the rebuilding of the temple. It would be an obvious thing for people to you know, show up and say, hey, I'm the Messiah because they see the signs around them. The Messiah must be here because all these things are supposed to happen. But it really does culminate in the one guy who's off conquering the enemies of Israel, raises from the dead, and sits in the temple. So after the midpoint, it sort of whittles all those competitors down to just one. Welcome back to the Bible Prophecy Timeline series. 
This is being released as a video and as an audio podcast, both of which are available at my website, BibleProphecyTalk.com. You can also go to my new website, BibleProphecyArchive.com, to download a free 18.5 gigabyte file with audio, video, and articles about Bible prophecy from me and many other teachers, which we have designed to be an offline library of information. I explain all the details about why that project exists and how to use that file at the website BibleProphecyArchive.com. This is part eight of the timeline series, and it's about the mark of the beast. I wanted to do a study of what can be known about the mark of the beast at this point, because this is where we are in the timeline. We are just now after the midpoint of the seven-year period. The Antichrist has just declared himself to be God. He has demanded the worship of the world and has begun the persecution of those who will not worship him. It's in this context that the mark of the beast comes on the scene. Let me first read Revelation 13, 11 through 18, so we can get a bit of context. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. This is speaking of the false prophet in context. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. The first beast is the Antichrist. And makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It, the false prophet, performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So what I'm going to do is go point by point in this passage to determine what we can know for sure about the mark of the beast, and I'll let you know when we start to get into speculative territory. The first fact about the mark of the beast I see here is that it's the false prophet that makes everyone get the mark of the beast. I think this is important for us because if we look at what the false prophet is doing in context, it really gives us perspective on what is happening in the world at this time. Specifically, we see from verses 13 through 15 that the false prophet can, quote, cause fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. He also has this image of the Antichrist made and is allowed to give it breath so that it speaks and it forces people to worship it. This is all serious stuff. You know, fire down from heaven and stuff like that is stuff you're not likely to miss. And it's stuff that's explicitly stated here in the scriptures. And despite it sounding crazy, it makes perfect sense if it was literally true. This is because the Antichrist is going to present himself as a Messiah. And if he's going to do that, then he is going to need a prophet, specifically one that claims to be Elijah, in order to act like he is fulfilling the very important scriptures in Micah, for example, that Elijah will come before the Messiah. This is a major part of Jewish tradition, even today. They, you know, set out a chair for Elijah. It's a part of the prayer that concludes every Sabbath. This Elijah is expected to herald the Messiah. And this idea of calling fire down from heaven, which we are told that the false prophet does, is something that only Elijah did. It's sort of Elijah's calling card, if you will, or at least that's what I think the false prophet will want people to believe, and I think it works. And yes, we have this whole image of the beast thing in which he causes it to give breath, and it, you know, it's all very sci-fi sounding, but the reason I'm saying this is that we know from scripture that it's this guy, this miracle-working false prophet, fire down from heaven guy, that's the one that causes people to get the mark of the beast. And that's a really important thing. You have to, whatever your theories of the mark of the beast, they have to incorporate that because it's a, an explicit teaching of the Bible. The next thing I think we can know for sure about the mark of the beast is that it is a global requirement, which we get from this phrase, also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave. This one is not really contested by anyone. Pretty much everyone thinks it's going to be a global thing, so we can move on. The next thing we can know is that it is a mark, which comes from the Greek word charagma, which means a stamp, an imprinted mark, such as a mark branded upon horses. It can be a thing carved, like a sculpture or a graven work. The face value interpretation is that it is what it is in English, a mark. A mark. 
though I suppose it could be a non-visible mark. Many people envision a microchip, for example. But I do think that the context demands that it is something that is physically there because of the buying and selling aspect. In other words, you need to be able to see it or check it. It also is explicitly said to be in the right hand or on the forehead. This, in my view, eliminates the view that it is a spiritual mark that one gets because they worship the Antichrist or something similar. In fact, there's a long list of, I think, false teachings that use as its basis the idea that the mark of the beast is not a real thing at all, which I obviously disagree with for the points above. I think it's important to point out that there's nothing in the text here that says this mark has to be anything more than a physical mark or tattoo or something on one's body that a person needs to show in order to buy or sell things. It certainly could be something more high-tech, but there's nothing at all in this text that suggests that it will be. All that is modern interpretation and newspaper eisegesis that may or may not be true. The next point I think we can know for sure is that it will be required to be in or on the right hand or forehead. The reason there is an option could be that not everyone in the world has a right hand, but everyone has a forehead. Thus, it seems likely that the hand will be the preferred method. The next pretty clear teaching is that no one might buy or sell unless they have this mark. This is probably the most famous aspect of the Mark of the Beast besides the number 666. And I think it means just what it says. If you don't have this mark, you won't be able to conduct commerce. This would effectively cut those who won't worship the Antichrist out of society. And it's more than just them not being able to buy or sell. This is all to facilitate this war against the saints. Remember, this is during the Great Tribulation, when the Antichrist starts the greatest persecution of all time. His main goal is to kill, to war against the saints, and to slay them. This is kind of a, a method to kind of flush them out of the system and make sure that they can't, it's illegal for them to go buy food or whatever, so they are further isolated and that kind of things. It makes them easier to catch. It also has the uh, effect of making those who are sort of on the fence choose to get the mark, you know, in order to eat and feed their families and these kinds of things. So it's a carrot and the stick thing, but mainly it's to flush out those in the midst of this war on the saints. I want to mention a few things at this point because, as I said, this verse is so famous that it has spawned all kinds of spin-off doctrines that are not necessarily true. For example, the concept of a cashless society. This idea of a cashless society being associated with the mark of the beast emerged in the 70s, and to this day, I think some people genuinely believe it's what the Bible says. And let me be clear, it is possible that we will go into a digital currency system. I actually consider that likely. It seems that's where the elites are pushing us. And yes, a digital currency might make something like not being able to buy or sell without a mark easier from a bureaucratic standpoint, but it has nothing to do with what the Bible is saying here. Again, I'm not saying it's not a chip or a digital tattoo or something high tech. It very well might be, but I am kind of tired of people sending these news stories about chips or something and saying, look, the system of the Mark of the Beast is being developed because that's just a guess based on a major extrapolation of a very simple phrase here. Next up, we have these four concepts. It will be the name of the beast. It will be the number of a man. You need to calculate it. And that number is 666. Let's look at the number itself first, which is the number 666. That is the number that comes after 665. It's not three sixes in some combination. This is a critical, often overlooked data point that refutes a lot of theories out there. For example, some people say that every UPC code has three sixes in it, one at the beginning, one at the middle, one at the end. Well, even if that were true, which we'll see later it is not, the passage doesn't say that there will be three sixes sprinkled in amongst other numbers. It says that there will be a number 666. This also refutes other theories out there about patents for cryptocurrencies that have sixes in the number or bills in Congress that have sixes in the number. The number is 666. It's not the presence of three sixes in any combination. Related to this is the idea of calculating this number. And here I will refer you to an excellent paper published in the Conservative Theological Journal by Hal Harless entitled 666, The Beast and His Mark in Revelation 13, where he attempts to systematically answer this question. And I agree with his conclusion, namely that what is being referred to here by calculation is probably gematria.
In Greek and Hebrew, before the use of Arabic numerals much later, letters were used for numbers. This is called gematria. And while this process became overly complex by the period of the Talmud in which seven different methods of gematria were developed, only one of those seven, the so-called ragil method, fits all the criteria laid out in this paper, such as being the one in use during the time of the writing of the Book of Revelation. Based on this paper, it seems probable that the mark will actually be written in either Hebrew or Greek letters, and it will simply be the name of the man who we call the Antichrist. In ragil gematria, that name will equal 666. As a side note, I should briefly mention here that there is a textual variation in which the number is recorded as 616. Irenaeus, an early church father, mentions this variation in his teaching against heresies in the early 2nd century and calls that number spurious. He points out that it was likely caused by a copyist error and that he, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John himself, knew of people that attested that the number was 666. In any case, the vast majority of manuscript traditions support 666, as do most scholars, though it is something to keep in mind. The last thing I'll mention in the fact section is related to our timeline, and it's that this Mark of the Beast event occurs after the midpoint. I put this one last because unlike the other facts, this one is not explicitly mentioned in the text. Though there are no chronological phrases in Revelation 13, that is phrases like, and then this happened, and then this other thing happened, there is a logical flow of events from verse 11 regarding the false prophet, and this aspect of the mark of the beast is the last thing mentioned in that chapter, following the section of the institution of the worship of the image of the beast. This chronology and therefore association with the mark of the beast and the worship of the Antichrist seems to be supported by the rest of the book of Revelation, in which the mark of the beast is mentioned six other times. And each of those six times, it mentions the mark of the beast in association with the worship of the Antichrist, usually with the image of the beast. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sores upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. This supports the idea that the worshipping of the image of the beast mandate comes first, and then the mark, because the mark is instituted in order to mark those that worship the image of the beast. There are no scholars that I know of that think that the Antichrist demands this worship until after the abomination of desolation event at the midpoint. That's why it is an abomination, because that is when the Antichrist declares himself to be God and worthy of worship. And if the mark is about worship, then it also means the mark can't happen until all the other precursors to that event take place, such as a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and the reinstitution of the daily sacrifices, which begin exactly three and a half years before the abomination. All right, let's move on to some of the things that people propose for the Mark of the Beast, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. I should also say that I did a graphic a couple years ago about this, which is a flow chart with all this information on it, so you can determine if your theory about the Mark of the Beast is correct. You can download it in the description below. Let's start off with this UPC idea, since I have already mentioned it. The idea is that every UPC code has three sixes in it. This is because these white and black bars represent numbers, and there are these so-called guard bars, which are two thin black lines at the beginning, middle, and end of every barcode, which they say are the same thing as the bars that represent the number six. So there are, in this theory, three sixes in every single UPC code. And while this would be a bit creepy if it was true, it would not line up with what the Bible says about the number, which is explicitly that it will be the number 666, not three sixes separated by lots of numbers. But this is a myth in any case. The guard bars are two thin black lines, and the number six is two thin black lines plus a thicker white bar on either the left or right, depending on which side of the guard bar it is. So no, there are definitely not three sixes in every UPC barcode. So just spend some time learning how to read UPC barcodes. It will take you five minutes and you will immediately understand that this is not true. One theory that gained popularity after 9-11 was that the Mark of the Beast was really misunderstood by Bible translators and that it was really a picture of an Arabic phrase in the name of Allah, as well as a picture of crossed swords. This one I've done an entire debunking video on, which is unfortunately almost impossible to find on YouTube. So I will play it at the end of this video as a kind of appendix. 
The big one, of course, these days is that the mark of the beast is the COVID vaccine, or perhaps the vaccine passports. And I should say that this camp is typically divided into the sort of radical versions that say, you know, it's the mark of the beast right now, and that there is chips in it and the rest of it. And then there's those that say, no, it's not, you know, the, the mark of the beast right now, but it could be down the line with vaccine passports and other events take place, etc. It's just like the setting up of the system of the mark of the beast kind of thing. You could, for example, look at the idea that it must be on the right hand or forehead. Maybe the vaccine passports could be implemented this way. I have seen, you know, somebody injecting a chip into the right hand or whatever for a vaccine passport. So that's a possibility, but certainly not with the vaccine itself. Also, there's nothing about 666 or the number of a man's name or anything like that in the vaccine. Uh, the big one here is that it has nothing to do with the worship of the Antichrist. The point of the mark of the beast is to say that you will worship the Antichrist. Some will do this because they love him and believe his message. Some will do it to get food and to not be killed. But all of them will worship the image of the beast. It would mean that someone could hold you down and give you the mark of the beast against your will and damn you by their will, or give you the mark of the beast in your sleep and damn you to hell. So this is a choice that people will make with their eyes wide open. I know there were a lot more theories I didn't get to, but I hope that the first part of this study will help to answer some of those questions about whatever the theory may be. You can also use that uh, image that I mentioned before to check your facts about the mark of the beast. And here is the video that I mentioned, and we will see you next time. Walid Shobat, in his book, God's War on Terror, endorses a very unique approach to understanding the so-called Mark of the Beast in Revelation 13, 18. Most Bible scholars and teachers have understood the Mark of the Beast in Revelation to be the number 666. Shobat, however, proposes that John, the writer of the book of Revelation, did not intend for us to understand this mark as a number at all. Shabbat says that John was supernaturally shown the Arabic words for in the name of Allah and a picture of crossed swords when he was writing Revelation 13:18. John then supposedly wrote down these Arabic letters and symbols just as he saw them. Later generations of scribes, however, apparently misunderstood John's intentions due to the Arabic symbols resembling the Greek letters Chi, Psi, and Sigma. These scribes wrote the Greek letters instead of the Arabic symbols when making subsequent copies, and since the Greek numbering system is based on letters, scholars mistakenly believe the mark of the beast to be the number 666. Contextual Problems I want to begin with the argument that the context of this passage does not support Shabbat's thesis. The verse in question reads as follows. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Revelation 13, 18. Notice the words calculate and number in the above verse. These are words that are quite blatantly telling us that we are to look for a number. Because we see phrases like, it is the number of a man, and his number is, it would seem that John was well aware that he was intending the reader to understand the mark as a number. Shabbat says the following about this problem in his book, quote, Now consider the alternate translation that the Allah theory could produce. The Greek word sephizo, translated above as count, can also quite naturally mean reckon or to decide. Likewise, the Greek word arithmos, translated above as number, can also mean an indefinite number or multitude, multitude in the case of more than one, such as a multitude of people. With this in mind, consider the following translation as it makes very good sense. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding reckon or decide discern the multitude of the beast, for it is the multitude of a man, that is, Muhammad and or the Mahdi Antichrist, and his multitude, are identified through the following, in the name of Allah, and the two swords, or jihad. Let's start with the word sefidzo, which is often translated as count or calculate. Shabbat says that the word can simply mean to discern or decide, and doesn't necessarily have to do with counting anything. Sefidzo is a very rare Greek word in the New Testament. In fact, the only other time it occurs in the Bible is in Luke 14.28, where it says, 
For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count, say Fidso, the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Here, the word is obviously used in the sense of counting. Jesus is talking about a man counting his money to see if he has enough to finish a building project. The word sefizo is never used in a general sense, as in to discern, or decide, or reckon. The Greek language has a much better word for that, dokimatso, which is used quite often in the Bible. And if John had meant to simply say reckon, decide, discern, in the sense that Shubat is using it, he almost certainly would have used the word dokimatso. Shubat says that the word sefizo, calculate or count, quote, can also quite naturally mean reckon or to decide. In other words, he says it can be used without reference to numbers or counting at all. I can only imagine that Shabbat looked at some Greek lexicons, like Strong's or Thayer's, and simply saw the word reckon and decide, but failed to read the full lexicon entry carefully, because these lexicons clearly define the word as related to counting something. Thayer's entry for Seifizo says, to count with pebbles, to compute, calculate, or reckon, to explain by computing, commonly and indeed chiefly in the middle in the Greek writings, to give one's vote by casting a pebble into the urn, to decide by voting. The word reckon in the lexicon entry above is expected to be understood as being synonymous with the other words in the definition, like compute and calculate. Reckon, in this case, is limited to reckoning as it relates to counting. Similarly, notice that in the discussion of how the word was used in other Greek writings, that sefizio meant to decide in the sense of deciding by voting, which is related to counting. After consulting every major Greek lexicon that I have available to me, I have not found a single one that would allow sefizio to be used in the way that Shobat uses it. If Shobat would like people to believe his translation, I would suggest that he needs to produce a Greek scholar or some very good argumentation that would be sufficient to overturn the understanding of this Greek word in the scholarly world. The word number, which is used three times in Revelation 13.18, comes from the Greek word arithmos, which is where we get the English word arithmetic. Shobat translates this word as multitude. While it is true that the word arithmos can mean multitude, it cannot be used the way that Shobat is using it. Lexicons give two possible definitions for arithmos. Number one, a fixed and definite number, and number two, an indefinite number, a multitude. The second definition is only using the word multitude in the same way that English speakers use the word number to describe an indefinite number. For example, there are a number of cats over there, or the number of homicides in the city has risen alarmingly. One way to show that Shobat's translation is not possible is to first show you that the Bible already has a word for multitude when it is used the way that Shobat is using it. The Bible uses the Greek word oklos to refer to a crowd of people and it does so 175 times in the Bible, including four times in the book of Revelation, Revelation 7, 9, 17, 15, 19, 1, and 6. When oklos is used, it is always used to describe a group of people, never anything else, only people. So, for example, Matthew 9, 8 says, Now when the multitudes, or oklos, saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. A good way to see the difference in these two words is to try to substitute the word arithmos, or number, for oklos, or multitude, in the same verse we just got done mentioning. So, in this case, it would read, Now when the number saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. In this case, we would wonder, the number of what? It requires a subject because the second definition of arithmos simply means an indefinite number, where oklos means a group of people. That's it, only people. I again referenced every lexicon I have available to me and did not find a single one that would allow for Shabbat's interpretation of this passage. When Walid Shabbat says a Greek word, quote, can also quite naturally mean something else, 
he needs to give some significant reasons to believe him, especially considering that the reference material disagrees with him. Shobat, in an attempt to justify his translation of Revelation 13, 18, says that the Restoration Scripture's True Name edition translates the passage in an almost identical way as him. That leads us to a pretty interesting story. The Restoration Scripture's True Name edition is a translation put together by one man, a Messianic author and pastor from Florida named Moshe Kaniochowski. Kaniochowski has many sermons that preach almost verbatim the theories of Walid Shobat, including Shobat's Mark of the Beast theory. In fact, I started to expect plagiarism on the part of Shobat when reading over Kaniochowski's material, since it was written long before Shobat published his books. Then I discovered the Simon Altoff connection. Simon Altoff was a member of Kaniochowski's ministry team at one time and heavily influenced Kaniochowski's end times teachings. Walid Shobat was a good friend with Altoff in the early days of Shobat's ministry. In fact, they wrote a book together called This Is Our Eden, This Is Our End, which is now out of print. Two years before Shobat's book God's War on Terror came out, Simon Altoff wrote a book called Islam, Peace, or Beast about the Islamic Antichrist Doctrine, which included the exact material on virtually every topic Shobat covers, including the Mark of the Beast material that later appeared in Shobat's book. Simon Altoff accuses Walid Shobat of plagiarizing his work in an article on his website, and the two are no longer friends. Altoff's book was published originally by Your Arms to Israel Publishing, which is Moshe Kaniachowski's ministry. Shobat has since accused both Altoff and Kaniachowski of being, quote, cult leaders, which practice polygamy and bad doctrine. And it should be noted that both Altoff and Kaniochowski do not deny that they practice polygamy and seem quite proud of that fact. So, to sum up this point, Walid Shobat, in an attempt to justify his translation of Revelation 13.18, points us to a self-published Bible, which he admits was written by a cult leader that he personally knows. In addition, Shobat himself clearly influenced the translation of Revelation 13.18 in Kaniochowski's Bible, either directly or, if you believe Simon Altoff, Altoff influenced Kaniochowski with the exact same arguments that Shobat would later steal from Altoff. Either way, this is an absolute mess, and Shobat does not gain an ounce of credibility for his decidedly awful translation of Revelation 13.18 by citing Kaniachowski's Restoration Scripture's True Name Edition. Let's move on to examining Shobat's thesis about the Mark of the Beast from the Greek text itself. When making his case on the Mark of the Beast, Shobat puts particular emphasis on the facsimile of Codex Vaticanus that is in the library of Bob Jones University. Shabbat claims that when he visited the library, he was surprised to find that he could read the 666 section of Revelation 13.18 because, quote, it was in Arabic. The following is a picture of the two relevant pictures that are typically shown to demonstrate this theory. The top image is of the Arabic words, in the name of Allah, followed by a picture of crossed swords. Remember, Arabic is written from right to left. The bottom image is from the copy of Codex Vaticanus at the Bob Jones University. There are misrepresentations in virtually every aspect of these images, but I think that the best place to start would be with regard to the history of this copy of the Codex Vaticanus and its lack of relevance to Shabbat's thesis. Throughout Shabbat's book, he continually tells his readers that the codex he saw at Bob Jones University is dated to 350 AD. This is significant because Shobat is trying to get us to believe that the earliest copies of Revelation 13.18 looked like the image he is presenting. So convincing his readers that the image he shows them is a very early copy of Revelation is paramount to his theory. The problem is that while much of the copy of Codex Vaticanus is dated to around 350 AD, the book of Revelation, where we find this verse, was not included in the original and was added by a scribe in the 15th century. 
The styles of writing between the early portions of the Codex and the Book of Revelation are vastly different. The style of the Greek text in the picture Shobat shows his readers is called minuscule, and it wasn't even invented until around the 9th century. All of the early Greek writings of the New Testament were written in a style known as unical, which looks nothing like Arabic. In the image above from the P47 fragment of Revelation, which is dated to around 250 AD, you will notice that the Chi Tsai Sigma, that is 666, look very different than the way it is presented by Shobat. The same is true with every single early copy of the Book of Revelation, such as the P115 fragment, in which you can see that, for example, the sigma looks very simple, like the English letter C. All early Greek writings were written in a completely different way than in the picture Shobat shows. Remember, this is a picture which he dishonestly says was written in 350 AD, when in fact it was written over 1,000 years later in a type of Greek writing that would have been completely foreign to John or any other Greek writer at the time. As I said earlier, there are misrepresentations in virtually every aspect of Shobat's images, so I will need to take this section by section in order to debunk it. I will start with the Greek letter Chi, which Shobat says is really a picture of crossed swords. It should first be noted that there's no actual correlation with Chi, which looks like an X, to any Arabic letter or word. When Shobat says he was surprised he could read this section of Revelation 13, 18, he couldn't have been referring to the letter Chi, since there is no Arabic letter equivalent to it. Instead, Shobat claims that John was shown a picture of crossed swords by God, which he says is used universally throughout the Muslim world to signify Islam. So the first thing that we must accept if we are to believe Shobat's theory is that God showed John a mixture of Arabic words as well as a picture to John. It seems more likely to me that Shobat, when finding no way to incorporate the letter Chi into Arabic, had to resort to claiming it was a picture instead of an Arabic word. It is obvious that Shobat would really need to emphasize the universality of the crossed swords relationship to Islam in order to make this theory coherent. But the crossed sword symbol is far from a universal symbol of Islam. In fact, most jihadist flags, banners, and badges don't contain any swords at all. Some of them have only one sword, if any. There are a few that have two crossed swords, but only an extremely small minority of those contain the words in the name of Allah. The most common Arabic phrase on Islamic insignia is the Shahada, which says there is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. And it looks nothing like the Greek symbols for Chi, Tsai, and Sigma. One of the many reasons that Shabbat sticks to the version of Revelation 13.18 produced by this 15th century scribe is because of the way that that scribe wrote the letter Chi, which is different than other scribes. It should be noted that with Greek minuscule texts in the 15th century, it was common for scribes to have their own unique style. This particular scribe wrote the letter Chi with the flourishes on the bottom two legs of the X, which made it possible for Shabbat to claim that they were sword handles. There are two problems with this. The first is that this is how the scribe wrote the letter Chi in all the other instances of the letter in the book. See picture above. There is nothing unique about the scribe's letter Chi in Revelation 13, 18 than any other instance of the letter Chi. He didn't add sword handles just to this verse but apparently he added sword handles every time he wrote the letter. The second problem is that this scribe's particular style when writing the letter Chi, putting the flourishes on the bottom two legs, is different than other scribes of the era, see picture below, and indeed is not consistent with how the letter was written at any time, including all the earliest copies of the book of Revelation. If flourishes were to be added to Chi, even in the much later minuscule texts, they were almost always on the same line. Shabbat's theory wouldn't work with these images because that would mean that one of the swords in the picture consists of just two handles while the other is just two blades. We will keep running into reasons why Shabbat must stick to this particular 15th century scribe's version of Revelation. Let's move on to the next letter, the Greek letter Tsai. 
Shabbat says that the Greek letter Psi in Revelation 13, 18 corresponds to the Arabic word for Allah. The first thing to note is that this is not how Tsai was written in John's day, nor is it the way it is written in the earliest copies of the book of Revelation. Notice that the letter is not curvy at all in the oldest copies of Revelation. Tsai was originally just three lines, but by John's day had developed into more of a jagged zigzag form. It would not be for almost another 800 years before the letter Tsai began to be written with the curvy fashion that Shabbat shows. The line above Tsai. Here again we will see an example of why Shabbat emphasizes this 15th century version of Revelation in the Codex Vaticanus above all others. Notice that the line above the letter Tsai is only above that letter in this illustration. Though it must be said, in the actual Codex Vaticanus, the line extends just a little bit more over the other two letters, which will be important later. Also notice the flourish that the scribe adds to the line. In other manuscripts, the line extends over all the letters in the series, and does not contain the flourish that we see above. As mentioned previously, the Greek alphabet doubled as the Greek numbering system. To avoid confusion, Greek writers would draw a line above the letters that were intended to be read as numbers, with the line clearly extending over all the letters and without the flourish. Shabbat's theory is wrong because in the oldest versions this looks nothing like the word for Allah when the line designating the numbers is shown in the correct way. Upside down Allah. Another thing Shabbat has to do in order to make this theory work is turn the word Allah on its side and then display its mirrored image. Here is how the word Allah is written in Arabic. And then you can see if it's turned 90 degrees, and then its mirrored image. It seems very unlikely to me that God would show John the word for Allah flipped on its side and reversed. It's even harder to believe that if John saw the word for Allah right side up originally, that he would have decided to flip it around and reverse it himself. Shabbat deals with this problem by saying that in some cases, like when the word for Allah is written on a circular object, such as a coin, it can be written on its side. This may be true for circular objects, but it's not true in any other case, nor does this explain the reversal of the word. It's just as wrong for Islam to write a word on its side and reversed, as it is for an English speaker to write an English word on its side and reversed. I believe that, just as in the case of the crossed swords, Shabbat is doing everything he can to force Arabic words and symbols into the Greek alphabet. The Greek letter Sigma Shabbat says that the Greek letter Sigma in Revelation 13.18 is really the Arabic word Bismi, which means, in the name of. Here again, the Greek letter Sigma looks nothing like it would have in the era that the early copies of the New Testament were written. In the image above, notice the absence of the dot that appears in the image below. In the case of bismi, the dot is a very important part of the Arabic word, but is not and never has been a part of the Greek letter sigma. The dot seen in the 15th century Greek text that Shabbat uses was actually a period, since the chapter ends with the number 666. Punctuation marks were not even added to this text until well after the 15th century. In conclusion, we have seen that Shabbat's theory fails in several ways. His attempt to rewrite Revelation 13.18 by explaining away the words for count and number was utterly ridiculous, defining Greek words in a way that no Greek lexicon or Bible dictionary agrees with. His pointing to Koniochowski's Restoration Scripture's True Name Edition was almost funny considering that he influenced Koniochowski's translation and that Shabbat himself considers Kaniochowski to be a cult leader. We also have seen that Shabbat continually misrepresents his key text of the Codex Vaticanus in the Bob Jones University Library, without which his theory cannot work, as being written in 350 AD, when in fact the section of Revelation in that book was written in the 15th century. We have seen that in order to make the Greek texts look like Arabic, he has to insert an image, cross swords, instead of letters, turn the word Allah on its side and reverse it, act as if the line that the Greeks used to designate numbers was connected only to Zai, 
pretend that a period added very recently by a scribe was in the original and is actually an Arabic symbol, and above all, act as if the Greek minuscule text was somehow known of by scribes in the first century, despite the form of writing not being invented until the ninth. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Bible Prophecy Timeline series. This is part nine, entitled Apostasy. All right, so in this episode I'm talking about apostasy, but specifically this end times apostasy, this apostasy that takes place in the end times that is associated with the Antichrist and false prophets' deception. And I will argue that this apostasy takes place more or less where we are at in the timeline series, that is, just after the abomination of desolation at the midpoint, and so is associated with the Antichrist's revelation. So we've got a lot of things happening here, his resurrection from the dead, his declaration of deity, his sitting in the temple, all of this stuff looked at from a very religious perspective. The point is that a lot of people buy what he's selling. A lot of people believe his lies more than we would like to think, I think. And as a result of that believing of his and the false prophet's doctrine, there is a great falling away. There are three main passages that specifically reference this end times apostasy, Matthew 24, 9 through 13, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 through 4. I will read them here. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Second Thessalonians says, Not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion or apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And 1 Timothy 4, 1-5 through 5 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciousnesses are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. There are other passages that give us more information about this time period, but that do not specifically mention the apostasy, such as the parallel passages in Luke 21, 12 through 19, Mark 13, 9 through 13, and 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Several different words are being used in these passages to refer to this falling away. A lot of times it's using biblical imagery such as like stumbling or departing, such as ephistomy or scandalizo or parapipto. The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery states that there are at least four distinct images in scripture of the concept of apostasy all connote an intentional defection from the faith. These images are rebellion, turning away, falling away, or adultery. Apostasia is really the only technical term used for leaving the faith, whether if Judaism or Christianity, depending on the context, that is used in 2 Thessalonians 2. I know a lot of people believe that that is a reference to the rapture, and we'll talk about that when we get to the rapture section, but you can see the film that I wrote and produced called Seven Preacher Problems. Uh, if you want to see this, an, an entire section devoted to that concept of apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2. But long story short, even the majority of pre-trib scholars reject the idea that apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2 means the rapture. It causes way more problems than they think that it solves, or some people think uh, that it solves. I do think it is helpful to know that Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 is using that technical term for apostasy uh, and he's referencing the falling away that the Lord mentions in the Olive Discourse. Um, a lot of people have understood that Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 is only giving the Thessalonians a Bible study about the order of events leading up to the day of the Lord. He says, hey, don't you remember the day of the Lord can't start until the apostasy or falling away happens, as well as the man of sin being revealed, sitting in the temple declaring himself to be God, which are the exact order of events 
that uh, the Lord uses in the Olivet Discourse. He, the day of the Lord, which is the sign leading up to the rapture in Matthew 24, 30, and 31, can't happen until the falling away comes first and the man of sin being revealed in the temple. So it's the exact order of events that the Lord mentions, and Paul is just reminding the Thessalonians of that order of events to show them that no, the day of the Lord cannot have happened yet because you haven't seen these obvious signs that will happen before the day of the Lord. So when does this great apostasy or falling away take place? And I think that you can make a case that it takes place after the midpoint. Matthew 24, 10 puts the falling away in the context of the persecution following the abomination of desolation at the midpoint. This can be seen by understanding that Matthew 24, 9 through 14 is a summary and that the following discussion of the abomination of desolation starting in verse 15 is more detail on the event just summarized. This is a widely accepted view, but rarely articulated. Another way to show the same thing is that the same order of events, abomination of desolation, the persecution, then the falling away, can be seen in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 through 5. The day of the Lord won't come until the revelation of the man of lawlessness in the temple in Jerusalem and the apostasy. I also think Revelation 13, 5 through 8 can help with this question. It has these same events, that is, persecution that follows the abomination and the worship of the Antichrist, occurring explicitly during the three and a half year period, which is a reference to the second half of the 70th week of Daniel, which begins at the abomination of desolation. What are the characteristics of the world during this end times apostasy? So what I've done here is I've taken all the relevant passages about the apostasy and just took the sections that I believe are directly related to this time period. And then I basically counted how many words are devoted to various themes. I think there are about 10 or so themes in these passages, things like warnings about deception from false Christs and false prophets, um, about how they're going to be delivered from the persecution or how they are need, need to be a witness even unto death. There are a lot of themes that are repeated in these various passages about or surrounding the events of the end times apostasy. And I basically just counted how many words are devoted to each theme and found that the vast majority uh, 20% is devoted to warnings about false Christs and false prophets and their deception. And I think this is an in interesting point that I've noted, you know, just in passing before, specifically about the Olivet Discourse, when they ask the Lord, what are the signs of his return? It seems to me that he devotes a, a huge amount of time to telling them, hey, don't be deceived by the false Christ and false prophets. They're going to be in the desert, but don't go after them. There's just all these words that are basically saying they're going to try to deceive the elect if it's possible, but see that I've told you beforehand, um, they're going to perform false signs and wonders. Just a lot of detail about the false Christ and false prophets. And that seemed to extend not just to the Olivet Discourse, but to all these passages about the apostasy seem to be related to this false doctrine. So, it, it helps to bolster this case that the apostasy is not as some people define it, and we'll talk about later what people think it is, but, you know, that it's just generally talking about sin or something like that. No, it's talking about a, a bunch of Christians leaving Christianity, and we'll talk about the theological implications of that or whatever, but that's what it is. Christians leaving Christianity in the end times, presumably because of the deception of the false Christ and false prophets. And this graph which uh, shows that the majority of these words are devoted to that specific thing, uh, seems to bolster that case. Other prominent themes are directly related. For example, there is a discussion of the persecution, presumably as a result of rejecting the false messiah, at 16%. So another huge chunk is talking about how they're going to persecute you and throw you in jail. And another theme, the necessity to flee from the persecution. So there's a pretty big chunk specifically in the Olivet Discourse where it says, you know, when you see the abomination of desolation, don't go back and get your coat, all that. That adds up to about 14% uh, of the time. How they're going to be hated during that time and how there's going to be, you know, people are going to uh, give up their children, and the whole world is going to hate them for Jesus's name's sake. That is 7%, and how they should be a witness even unto death, 8%. The second biggest section at 17% is the discussion about how they will be delivered from this persecution by the rapture. So, 
you know, most of this is bad news, but there is a sizable chunk that's saying, hey, yes, it's really bad, but you will be delivered from that persecution by uh, the rapture. Other less prominent themes include how the time will be characterized by lawlessness, a lack of love at 6%. There are some other interesting characteristics that didn't really make the graph, such as in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, it talks about how in the latter times when this departure from the faith happens, there's going to be apparently a false demonic teaching that's going to be about legalism, the, the requiring the abstinence of foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving. He makes this whole argument about how that stuff has been, uh, you know, in the new covenant is not uh, illegal to eat anymore, which I think is an interesting thing to say that the Spirit expressly says that will happen in the latter times because it's a very legalistic argument. You could make the case, and I think you should make the case, that that Paul is saying that in the end times, there's going to be this massive uh, a legalistic thing that you can only look at it as a, as a Jewish kind of prohibition. I suppose there could be like some other kind of thing that says we shouldn't eat uh, certain foods because they are unclean. But in the context of the false messiahs and the false prophets, it all seems to, to make sense. Another aspect of the characteristics of this end times apostasy can be seen in the psychology. And I think that we get a glimpse into the heads of the people at that time through these passages that talk about the hatred of all nations for Christians during that time, as well as the betrayal of one Christian to another. So I think there are two types of uh, hatred and betrayal going on in these passages. One is the hatred of the world for Christians because of Jesus at this time as well as the betrayal of one Christian over another. And I think that is the more interesting one to look at. Just a few uh, of these verses. Hated by all nations for my name's sake, Matthew 24, 9b. So that's probably just the, the whole world hating Christians who will not follow the, the false Messiah. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. That, I think, is probably talking about how Christians will betray one another, as we see in the Mark 13, 12 through 13 uh, which goes into detail about this. And brother will deliver brother over to death and father his child and children will, will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So that one gets both of them. It gets the hatred for his name's sake, but also the betrayal aspect of the brothers to, to betraying their brothers and the fathers their children and the children their parents. My main point here is to say that these betrayal verses give us a glimpse into psychology. And I think what it's saying is that there is major deception going on here. Specifically, when it talks about how the fathers or mothers are going to turn in their children or the children are going to turn in their parents to put them to death. So they're going to say to the authorities, hey, my, uh, my mom here, she's one of those that don't believe the, the, the right things, please take her away or put her to death. Or on the other end, a mother telling uh, the authorities, please take my kid here. My kid doesn't believe the right thing. Please put him to death, please. That is so crazy that it can only really be explained by deception. And in context, this is all about deception. But I even think it's different than, let's say this is communism taking over or whatever. I don't even think in communism, you have people devoted to a system as much as this. So it gives us this extra detailed glimpse into the hearts of people about how sure that they have found the Messiah. You know, this this is something, the Antichrist is going to do something pretty spectacular, and people are going to be just incredibly devoted to the idea. And these verses help me to understand what we're up against in terms of the deception of the Antichrist. It's going to be good, and it's going to be convincing to people who will literally kill their children because they believe this so much. No other ideology or political thing can do this. So I think it's showing us that something significant is happening here, deception-wise. What are some of the modern views of this end times apostasy? And so, you know, I've read a lot of commentaries and listened to a lot of sermons about these passages. And it's weird, because on the one hand, I think most theologians in a vacuum will tell you exactly what this is, that in the end times, there is a mass exodus from Christianity. These could be people that maybe were not saved before, but, you know, were professing Christians. But there's going to be a massive exodus of Christianity in the end times as a result of the Antichrist's persecution. But because certain theological 
questions arise at that point, such as these people that left, were they, you know, Christians and they like lost their Christianity or were they just professing Christians? And there's this whole can of worms there. And as a result of that, I think you get different theories about what the end times apostasy is that people propose for reasons other than uh, maybe what the text is saying. So, for example, a lot of people will believe that the end times apostasy is just bad doctrine. You know, uh, maybe cults like Catholicism or something like that. In the end times, there will be a great apostasy. And by that, what it means is that in the end times, there's going to be a whole bunch of cults. And so they've sort of excluded themselves from that possibility because they aren't in one of those cults. And it's just talking about something that it, for all intents and purposes already exists. So that is a actually pretty sizable uh, portion of what a lot of people believe about what it's talking about, this great falling away in the context of the uh, uh, midpoint. Of course, I don't think that they would probably even talk about the midpoint aspect of it, but they would just, that's how they would exegete that particular passage. Another thing I've heard is it's referring to people that heard the gospel and rejected it, uh, i.e. presumably all people besides the elect. So basically, they're saying that in the end times, there will be this great apostasy. And by that, what it really means is just basically the unsaved world. Anybody that's not a Christian is what it's referring to. There's a leaving of Christianity in the sense that they probably heard the gospel at some point and rejected it. You know, just the world, basically. So there is that idea, which I think is not tenable. There are some that will take it more or less as it says here that there is going to be an end times event associated with the Antichrist in which a lot of Christians will fall away. But they see that as more of a one-time thing. In other words, they solve the theological conundrum by saying maybe it is possible for Christians to leave Christianity, maybe even true Christians to leave Christianity uh, and follow the Antichrist and worship him and get his mark um, if it's a one-time thing. In other words, once saved, always saved is the rule, except in the end times with the Antichrist, there seems to be another rule that you can't worship the Antichrist and still be a Christian. And if you do that, you will uh, apostatize. There's also pretty much prevailing idea that if anything like you know, true Christians or seemingly true Christians leaving Christianity for the Antichrist happens, it is people that were never really Christians in the first place. And so that's that's kind of a prevailing theme. And I suppose that is good because it's unfalsifiable, of course. We'll never know what is in somebody's hearts. You know, we can see for all the world, it looks like a person who really was saved and had the fruits of the Holy Spirit rejected Christianity and left it. We have to believe under certain ideas that they just weren't really saved in the first place. I'll argue later that there are a lot of verses that seem to suggest that they were really saved and they really did have the Holy Spirit, but weren't really elect because they did apostatize and God foreknew their apostasy. But because it is unfalsifiable, there's no way to really prove the anecdotes or disprove the anecdotes. You know, if somebody says, no, this person really was saved and they were in church and I'm telling you, they had the fruits of the Holy Spirit and they just left it because they wanted to do this sin more and they just left. And I'm here, I'm just talking about anecdotes. You can't prove it or disprove it. So in a way it makes the whole argument not worth having because we'll never know that this side of eternity or maybe ever will know it. Let's look at some ancient views on the end times apostasy, and we'll start with the Didache, chapter 16. The Didache is a document, one of the earliest, if not the earliest document that we have from the early church besides the New Testament. Um, it says, watch for your life's sake, let not your lamps be quenched, nor your loins unloosed, but be ready, for you know not the hour in which your Lord comes. But often shall you come together seeking the things which are befitting to your souls, for the whole time of your faith will not profit you if you be not made perfect in the last time. For in the last days, false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied and the sheep shall be turned into wolves and love shall be turned into hate. Uh, when lawlessness increases, they shall hate and persecute and betray one another. Then shall appear the world deceiver this, uh, as the son of God and shall do signs and wonders, etc. So he's going through all the stuff uh, in the Olivet Discourse. He ends this way but they that endure in their faith shall be saved from under the curse itself. So he could be, I think, probably talking about the, the rapture there and, and the saved there. So it's not necessarily there, but the endurance 
is the operative part there. He's saying to endure this persecution that will come from the Antichrist, pretending to be the son of God, and those that do endure will be saved in that case he's talking about the, uh, the the rapture and the endurance of the end times persecution is an extremely prevalent uh, theme that if you think it through it only means that there is consistent New Testament uh, uh, calls to endure faithfully through that persecution in order to be a part of those that are in the resurrection to life so it's hard to look at that any other way except for the early church believing that there was something for Christians to do, i.e. endure. And we'll see that uh, and later when we look at Revelation 2, where it's an, a very important theme. Also, Barnabas, another early uh, church father, Barnabas 4, 11 through 13, we take earnest heed in these last days, for the whole past time of your faith will profit you nothing, unless now in this wicked time we also withstand coming sources of danger, as becomes the sons of God, that the black one may find no means of entrance. Let us flee from every vanity. Let us utterly hate the works of, of the way of wickedness. So a similar idea there that the past faith will profit you nothing if you do not endure in these uh, end times. Okay, so now I want to talk more about the early church, but in this case, it's just about apostasy in general, not necessarily the apostasy of the end times, though I think a lot of these guys actually thought they were in the end times. But nevertheless, this is also trying to zero in on the idea that these events of people, of Christians rejecting their faith were done in the face of persecution. So it was like, I will torture you if you don't say that Jesus isn't Lord and stop following him, or just say the words, renounce Christ, and I'll let you stop being tortured, which is a weird thing all by itself, which we'll go into in the modern stuff as well. But let me just read some of these uh, quotes I found in various places uh, online. The martyrdom of Polycarp is sometimes considered to be the first of the acts of the martyrs. In this document, Polycarp is killed for refusing to confess Caesar as Lord and offer incense. He refuses to revile Christ. Other Christians did not always follow his example. Some fell into idolatry in the face of persecutions. Eusebius was an early church father who wrote a lot about uh, the various martyrdoms that were happening. And he talks about how people fell away in the face of persecutions. He mentions Quintus who threw away his salvation in the sight of the wild beasts. So they used to have lions rip people to, to death. Uh, Marcus Aurelius's reign, Eusebius affirms that the Christians confess their faith despite their sufferings from abuse, plundering, stoning, and imprisonment. It is recorded that in Gaul, some became martyrs, but others who were untrained and unprepared, about 10 in number, proved to be abortions. This is a Greek word. Discouraging the zeal of others. A woman named Bilblias, who had earlier denied Christ, confessed him and was joined with the martyrs. Certain defectors did likewise, but others continued to blaspheme the Christian faith, having no understanding of the wedding garment. This, this is what he's writing. And I think this is interesting because he notes a woman who earlier denied Christ and then felt guilty about it and then uh, said, hey, about that thing I said about denying Christ, I, I wasn't true about that. I do, I do believe in Christ and she was killed for it. During the reign of Decius, the Christians of Alexandria are said to have endured martyrdom, stoning, or having their belongings confiscated for not worshiping an idol, an idol's temple, or chanting incantations. But some readily made unholy sacrifices, pretending that they had never been Christians, while others renounced their faith or were tortured until uh, they did. In his account of the Diocletian persecution, Eusebius commends the heroic martyrs, but is determined to mention nothing about those who made shipwreck of their salvation, believing that such reports would not edify his readers. He, and this is something he mentions in 823, he recollects Christians who suffered in horrible ways, which included their being axed to death or slowly burned, having their eyes gouged out, their limbs severed, or their backs uh, seared with melted lead. Some endured the pain of having reeds driven under their fingernails or unmentionable sufferings in their private parts. Ignatius, another church father, has an interesting story in his letter to the Christians in Rome. He gives insight into the heart of a Christian who is prepared for martyrdom. He hopes to see them when he arrives as a prisoner. He fears that the love they have for him will in some way save him from certain death, yet he desires to obtain 
grace to cling to my lot without hindrance unto the end. So he's wanting to, I hope I can endure this torture because they're going to kill him. You know, they're going to torture him to death so that he may attain to God. So he sees his unwaveringness in that, in that not denying Christ so that he may attain to God. He requests prayer for, quote, both inward and outward strength that he might not, quote, merely be called a Christian, but really be found to be one a Christian, quote, deemed faithful, Epistle to the Romans 3. So the, the early church, whether you like it or not, believed that enduring torture and not denying Christ in the face of torture was paramount. I mean, it, their, their Christian faith, faith was based on that. I mean, so these are not inconsequential church fathers by any means, Eusebius and Ignatius and Irenaeus and others. These are the church fathers, and this was the view of the early church. Another way to sort of drive home the point I'm trying to make here is by looking at modern day persecution. So what I did here was just do a search engine searches for modern day examples of Christians being persecuted or killed for their faith that could have gotten out of it if they would have just recanted their faith. So that's number one instances of persecution, which I would say are most of them that would not have happened if they had just recanted. I also wanted to grab a subsection of these from basically every religion. These are not just Islamicists that are doing this. These are Indians and South Koreans and literally everybody out there. Doesn't matter if they're, you know, some tribe that's never heard of anything else. They're killing Christians because they won't recant. This is a satanic thing that Satan is doing where he is torturing Christians to death, but he will stop doing it if they just recant. It's the weirdest thing. You can get out of jail. No one's holding you here. All you got to do is just recant and you can walk out. You don't have to do this Iron Maiden or the rack or whatever. It's a, it's a great deal that Satan has offered people all around the world. And I guess I'm trying to say there's some reason for that, I think. But anyway, here's some of these headlines. Villager in India beaten unconscious for refusing to recant Christian faith as a result of the attack. Kawasi was hospitalized for seven days, unable to speak. 13 Christian families in India... Odisha state have been displaced from their home village since January after they refused to recant their Christian faith. China now legally co can now legally coerce Christians to recant their faith. This is a quote from that article. The new interpretation also says that cult members that repent of their cult activity may be allowed to avoid their punishment. So China, and by the way, China is doing some pretty brutal stuff to Christians. You don't hear about it very much. You hear about the Uyghurs, but you don't hear about what they're doing to Christians and they're getting worse every day. Another one, more than 50 Christians refusing to recant their faith uh, were killed. That is in Somalia. On Monday, Muslims murdered 30 Christians who were riding to, in a bus to a monastery. And in speaking to pilgrims at St. Peter's Square, Francis said the victims amongst which were also children were killed after having refused to renounce their Christian faith. He called the victims these courageous witnesses, these martyrs, and asked God to convert the hearts of the terrorists. Another one, young woman killed in Eritrea for refusing to renounce Jesus Christ. Two killed, dozens abducted in an attack on a Christian church in Nigeria. Quote from the article, the pastor stood his ground by refusing to renounce his Christian faith, even when he knew it would cost him his life. Luca said, quote, he was killed alongside a member of his church. There's no doubt it was worth dying for Jesus Christ. Another one, China now torturing Christians who refuse to renounce faith, torturing Christians who refuse to renounce their faith. China forces Christians to renounce faith, destroying Christian symbols, or be cut off from welfare. Starved, beaten, tortured, forced to undergo abortions, and shot, all for being Christians. Horrified abuse of religious prisoners in North Korea is laid bare by those who survived. I would say that the North Korea stuff is absolutely crazy, the stuff that they're doing to Christians there. It is, it, it is unbelievable the kinds of torture they're doing to Christians in North Korea. It just is unspeakable. Um, moving on, Vietnamese Christians beaten and arrested for refusing to worship Buddha and renounce their faith in Jesus. So you think, oh, the, Buddha, the Buddhas are fine. They are beating and arresting Christians for what? For refusing to worship Buddha and renounce their faith in Jesus. This is a consistent th thing. Another, Christians ordered to renounce their faith in Laos. This idea of endurance is a prominent end times um, theme and in Revelation, I think an important place to see this is in the letters to the seven churches. So the seven churches have a lot of if-then statements that people are 
kind of uncomfortable with and often do not get uh, preached on. In fact, I think most of what people preach on the uh, seven churches is wrong, even sort of mystical. But um, here's some things that it says. I should say that the letters to the seven churches are very uh, structural. They all have the same kind of themes. They have a beginning, middle, and the end with the same kind of uh, issues. And included in that is this message to the overcomer at the end. And remember what the context of the book of Revelation is. Revelation 2 and 3, these seven letters, come before the book of Revelation. So we're about to see the Antichrist in Revelation 12 and 13 given authority to conquer the saints, to uh, destroy those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ in Revelation 12 and 13. And he's given this power to do this for a while before the day of the Lord starts. And so this is in the context of that. And I think that while these seven churches perfectly apply to these churches at that time, probably very specifically, as well as to churches in general throughout time, they are, I believe, more of a message to the church that will about to, that's about to face the Antichrist. It's very appropriate for them as well. But in that, it says things like, uh, in every single letter, it says things like this. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, etc. And so there, it uses words at the end of each of these letters that, that basically mean to him I will give eternal life. It uses different allusions for each, but the, the theme is the same. Moving on, let's see. Philadelphia says, I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God. Never he, he shall go out of it, etc. And we see similar things like uh, Ephesus. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. To the one who conquers, I will grant him, etc. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto the end and I will give you the crown of life. So it's a lot of if-then statements um, uh, to Pergamum. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and will war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone and a new name, etc. So I did another graph here where it shows that 29% of the words in the seven churches, Revelation 2 and 3, are devoted to endurance for eternal life. So the vast majority of the message, according to just the numbers of words devoted to certain topics, the vast majority of the message to the letters of the seven churches is that you need to endure in order to get eternal life in the context, I would assume, of what's about to happen in Revelation. Sometimes it's more or less explicit. Uh, that is to say, endure the persecution, but not always in those letters. But the concept itself is there 29% of the time, the vast majority. I think you could actually bump that up to nearly 40% of the letters to the seven churches if you also included, for example, words devoted to the need to repent before he returns in order to attain eternal life. It is a very, it's a touchy subject, but it's there in black and white. And I'm here trying to say that what, whatever you believe about theology, you have an issue to resolve here because the Bible does seem to be particularly uh, serious about this subject. So let's talk about apostasy in general, and let's get into the, the theology of this very briefly. And I should say that I'm going to land very firmly, and I always have been, on the side of the preservation of the saints in terms of that you cannot sin your way out of the covenant, uh, but you can apostatize. You can leave Christianity if you want out of the covenant for various reasons. If you want to go out to worship other gods. That seems to be a prominent reason in scripture that people leave God with their eyes wide open. I, I, I'll get into the theology in a minute. I just wanted you to know up front that I'm not going to preach a works-based salvation, but if you deny that there is a caveat to that in apostasy, then you are, I believe, setting yourself up for uh, difficulties if you are in the generation that is in the end times at the very least, and it may be bigger and broader than that. So let's first look at the book of Hebrews and 
the, the book of Hebrews has a lot of verses in it that talk about apostasy. And it's interesting because I believe that the book of Hebrews is also one of the most once saved, always saved books in the Bible. If you look up once saved, always saved verses, it's like a list of them. A lot of them are going to be from the book of Hebrews, and that's not a mistake. But it's also the place that you're going to find a lot of the verses that seem like you can lose your salvation. So what's going on there? And I believe that the answer to that is simply that the once saved, always saved Every argument about that, I almost believe in every single one of them, except that there is a situation in which you can reject Christ with your eyes wide open in order to, A, save your skin, which I think is what was happening in the book of Hebrews. One way to demonstrate that is in Hebrews 12, verse 4, when it says that he's, you know, I think of him who endured such opposition against himself by sinners so that you may not grow weary in your souls and give up. You have not yet resisted to the point of bloodshed in your struggle against sin. And and have you forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as sons? So he's talking to a group of persecuted Christians who apparently have not yet been killed for it, but they are starting to be killed. You know, the heat is growing in their area or whatever. <clears throat> and he's writing this because they've already started to apostatize, apparently, even in the face of that sort of minor to Paul persecution. And so he says things like uh, this in Hebrews 3.12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hebrews 6, 4, for it is impossible in the case of those who has once been enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding them up to contempt. That's a really difficult one for people because it says very <clears throat> plainly there that these people have tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, and yet then have fallen away. So that is a very difficult verse for people to uh, 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 interpret. Uh, Hebrews 2, 1 through 3 says, Therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken through the angels proved to be so firm that every violation or disobedience received is its just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So the drifting away, you can't uh, drift away from something that you weren't in beforehand which is his message in context. He has illustrations about apostasy uh, in Hebrews 12. It says in, about Esau and see to it that no one becomes immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know the latter when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no opportunity for repentance, although he sought it with blessings and tears. So he's giving warnings to apostasy and different things like that. I think a lot of people will mention Peter here and say that Peter basically did this. Peter was being threatened. Hey, you're one of those Galileans. You sure talk like a Galilean. And he's out warming his hands by the fire, trying to figure out what's happening to Jesus. And he's like, no, no, I don't know the guy. I'm telling you, I don't know that guy. And the rooster crows and he realized what he's, do what he's done. I think that there's even something important there in the idea that Jesus has him you know, thrice sort of restore himself in that. Although he says, you know, look, the rooster is going to do this. You're going to deny me, but I've prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. So there's something there too. I think that it's also important that Peter, I don't know. Um, I think it's a picture of the grace in a lot of these situations. And it's the reason why it's important not to be too dogmatic about this, because maybe there is a situation in which true elect can't really apostatize. And I actually think that's what's being said in the uh, the passage in the Olivet Discourse, where it says that if it was possible, it, the Antichrist could deceive the very elect in the same breath that he's saying many will fall away, which the only way to read that is that, that people who were Christians are now leaving the faith, but he will not be able to deceive the very elect. And we take that Hebrews verse where it says, it seems to suggest that one can have the Holy Spirit and yet apostatize the Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. It is impossible in the case who have once been enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, etc. So it says very explicitly there, I would say the, uh, the passage of the parable of the, is it the sowers, where it seems to suggest the same thing. In Jesus's interpretation of the parable of the sower, it says, and the ones on the rock are those who, when they heard the word, received it with joy, 
but these have no root. They bleed for a while and in a time of testing fall away. So you could say, well, it sounds like the falling away happened as a result of the testing. <clears throat> and I'll say to you that for a long time, the way that I resolved this in my heart, because again, I believe very strongly in the concept of the preservation of the saints, which is the name of a doctrine that you can't lose your salvation. Uh, I, I often quote Ephesians where it says that to be given the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the purchased you know, possession. If you have been changed by the Holy Spirit, it means you've been declared righteous by Christ's righteousness, not of yourselves, obviously. And the fact that you have the Holy Spirit is, according to that, my understanding of that Ephesians verse, evidence that you have been declared righteous with Christ's righteousness. And since it is Christ's righteousness and not yours, that you can't lose it. And you can't get the Holy Spirit without being deemed if you will, in the eyes of God, um, perfect through Christ's righteousness. You're clothed with Christ's righteousness, and therefore you can be indwelled with the Holy Spirit. So there's a whole chain of theological stuff going on that makes me very confident that you can't just sin your way out of the covenant. And so what I was saying is that the way that I've used to interpret this was that there was a caveat that one could apostatize. And apostasy, I think, is not just a normal sin. It's not even a sin, I don't think. It's a it's a approaching the throne of God and saying, I want to uh, deny you. Because I think there's two main things that are happening in the end times. These are people that are believing the Antichrist with all their heart. They desire it. And I think the Antichrist is going to have a theology along with the false prophet that necessitates you denying Christ because he wasn't the real Messiah. He wasn't the real son of God or whatever version of the theology that he's going to have is going to have as a component. You, these people that still think that the, the, the Messiah was came back in 2000 years ago and was Jesus. They're not right. They're wrong. I am the right one. You need to deny that. And you need to get with the real program. I'm the real Messiah. Look, I've done all the Messiah things. I've saved us from the whatever. So there's a denial of Christ in that. It's certainly going to have a persecution component to it as well, obviously, with the greatest persecution of all time. It's going to have deception, it's going to have persecution, and it's going to have the biggest theme about apostasy in the Bible, which is the worship of false gods. And there you would see things like uh, Solomon or whatever, literally going and worshiping false gods, choosing them over and above, and maybe Solomon's not the greatest example, but other, uh, you know, the northern tribes of Israel, worshiping false gods or whatever, or all of Israel at various points, and, and choosing to worship them as opposed to worship God. That is apostasy according to the Bible. So it's got really all the components in this end times apostasy, worshiping false gods, uh, persecution and deception. And it all that combines into a sin. So I, I, I would say that there's a part of me that says that this is a special situation that occurs in the end times. And I wanted to tell you that. And I wanted to say, that and, and again, there may be this situation in which I'm not understanding the, the, the nature of the Holy Spirit and all this. I think you can make the case in some of these verses that these people, the, the parable of the sower, etc., and 2 Peter 2.20 and Hebrews 10, uh, 25, 30 through 31, just talk about the knowledge of our Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Take 2 Peter 2.20 through, uh, through 22. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What what the true proverb says has happened to them, the dog returns to its own vomit, etc. And then the Hebrews 10 verse uh, says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but fearful expectation of judgment. So I could make the case in those that, because it sounds like in those, we're not talking about persecution or worshiping false gods or any of the things that we see, which are more explicit. That's talking about just going back to your sins. And in those two problematic passages, it does, it, it doesn't, talk about the Holy Spirit so much as it does the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. as opposed, And I think you could equate that to the parable of the sower. That is to say, people were preached the gospel. They sort of went to church. In other words, the sort of John idea that those who were went out from us were never part of us in the first place. And in that case, of course, John is talking about something specifically that's happening in that church that he's writing to. But it, it's a principle that could apply, I think, here to Hebrews 10 and 2 Peter, that, that is people that never really were saved. They never were elect. And that goes back to my point of 
if that's the argument, then th this isn't an argument worth having because you'll never know if they really were saved or what degree the Holy Spirit uh, was working on their hearts because you just can't know that. All, all you can know is that it seemed like it. And so therefore to have theological d discussions and debates about those kinds of anecdotes is fruitless and always will be. But you do have these other uh, uh, verses about specifically the end times and uh, that does seem to me like this renouncing of the faith in the midst of persecution is not something I suppose you could say it like this. You could, you could look at all the verses about perse persecution and the in need for enduring them in scripture. And you could have a lot of verses. It's a difficult and complicated subject and I'm not going to solve it here, but I can say that anyone who is ever telling you nothing, there's nothing to worry about about this end times apostasy. And it's just talking about, oh, you know, it's just talking about people that aren't saved. They're going to have trouble. No, the Antichrist is coming for the church and he's going to try to deceive everyone in the church that is not elect. And he will find out who and who isn't elect because the deception, which is going to be aimed at Christians, will deceive as many as it possibly can that aren't elect. And we are going to find, like uh, Ignatius was saying, we're going to find out if he's elect or not, if he can endure that I think he got burned alive or something like that, I'm not sure, without renouncing Christ. And I also want to make the point that something weird is happening both in history and in the current present day about Satan, these, these people who are probably possessed by Satan or demons that are torturing Christians that will just let them leave the jail if they renounce Christ. Why is that? I mean, I guess it could be some sort of demonic game or something like that, but that is weird. Think of a jail where you can just go if you renounce Christ. And that's not a particular religion. As I showed, it's every religion and it's every time period since Jesus died. The renunciation of Christ is important to Satan and it is therefore something we should take very seriously. And tell me if you, I mean, you can read accounts in the early church about how they were wondering what to do with these people that would denounce Christ and say they weren't Christians just to avoid being tortured or killed. And they wondered, should we allow them back into the church? And, you know, again, I think that there's grace and there's Peter as an example and things like that. So I'm not dogmatic about what that means, but I am saying the Bible is very verbose on this subject and how important it is for you to endure that torture and to not deny Jesus Christ. And you need to prepare your heart for that. And a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the importance of believing, you know, in this case, I believe the, the pre-wrath rapture, which is that the rapture will not occur until at some unknown point after the midpoint. It could be a, a week after the midpoint. It could be uh, years after the midpoint, but it has to be after the midpoint that, and the persecution of the church with the Antichrist that the rapture happened and the day of the Lord starts. People ask me, what's the point? I mean, really, what's the deal? If you believe the pre-trib rapture or the, or the pre-wrath rapture, I think the major point is this, prepare your hearts as the Bible has instructed us over and over and over again. And if you see all these verses, this flood of verses telling you to prepare your hearts and to endure persecution in the face of the Antichrist persecution particularly, and you look at every one of those verses and say, ah, not for me. That's for the tribulation saints or whatever. Basically, there's nothing I need to worry about. I certainly don't need to prepare my heart for that in America. And that is, that's the danger. That's the danger. You are sitting ducks. You're completely unprepared. It takes time and, and prayer to prepare your heart for that. And if you're not prepared, I don't know. That's where we get into the theology question. And I just don't know the answer to that. This is episode 10, which is going to be about the rapture, but it's going to cover three of our bullet points on the timeline, the celestial disturbance, the rapture, and the day of the Lord. All three of those subjects, especially with regard to their timing, is discussed at length in a recent two and a half hour film that I'm going to play in its entirety here, which I wrote and produced called The Seven Pre-Trib Problems and the Pre-Wrath Rapture. I honestly think I can't cover these three specific topics any better than I did in that film. So without any further ado, here is Seven Pre-Trib Problems. It's a story that most of us in the West know, or think we know. If you've spent any time in the Christian faith, you've probably seen the movies, read the books, 
or heard the sermons about a forthcoming supernatural event known as the rapture. A time when millions of people will suddenly vanish from the earth, just prior to the greatest apocalyptic event imaginable. For Christians, this has become a message of hope and comfort, but it's also been the cause of major disagreements. And even after years of debate, the church is still equally divided on the major questions about the rapture. Can it really occur at any moment? Or does the Bible speak of certain prophetic and celestial events that must occur first? Will the church have to face its greatest enemy, the Antichrist, before the rapture? Or will the rapture happen just before he comes on the scene? Join us as we go on a journey through the Holy Scriptures to review and answer the most critical aspects of the rapture debate. This is Seven Pre-Trib Problems and the pre rap Rapture. Over the years, many different views about the timing of the rapture have been proposed, but the rapture debate has been especially active in the last decade or so, and as a result, there have been some major shifts in the way that the scholars have been teaching them. For example, if you studied one of the more popular views, pre-tribulationism, 20 or 30 years ago, you probably wouldn't even recognize what is being taught in the seminaries today. Part of the reason for these sometimes drastic changes in pre-tribulational theology has been a direct result of criticisms from scholars holding to the pre-wrath position on the rapture, which has massively gained in popularity in the last 30 years, overtaking the mid-tribulation position, for example, by a significant amount. But most of this debate has taken place among scholars in theological journals and in university lecture halls, so it's not something the average Christian engages with. And even most pastors aren't aware of the intricate arguments that the theologians have been wrestling with the past few years. In this documentary, we interviewed many scholars, theologians, and pastors who hold the pre-wrath position on the rapture, and asked them to help us determine the most critical aspects of the rapture debate. We then distilled these arguments down to the seven pre-trib problems which we will present one by one. Before we present the first problem on our list, we need to understand the basics of the main rapture timing positions. Most rapture views teach that the end times are played out over a period of seven years. This seven-year time frame is sometimes called the 70th week of Daniel, because of Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27, where the seven-year period is first introduced. The disagreements primarily concern when the rapture happens, and when the wrath of God, known as the day of the Lord, begins, in relationship to that seven-year period. Pre-tribulationists believe the rapture can begin at any moment, but whenever it does happen, it will prove to be just before the seven-year period begins, and that the entire seven-year period is the day of the Lord. Mid-tribulationists believe the rapture occurs at the midpoint of the seven-year period, and the last half of the seventieth week is the day of the Lord. Post-tribulationists believe the rapture occurs at the very end of the seven-year period. Most post-tribbers believe that the day of the Lord is a literal 24-hour day occurring at the very end of the seven years. It should be said that some post-tribbers believe the day of the Lord is longer, specifically that it will start at the midpoint and continue to the end, but that the church will be supernaturally protected through the wrath of God until the final day when the rapture will take place. The pre-wrath view teaches that the rapture occurs at some unknown time after the midpoint. They say that no one knows exactly when the rapture happens. It could be weeks or it could be years after the midpoint, but that it will be after the midpoint. They teach that on whatever day the rapture does occur, the day of the Lord's wrath will begin on that same day. Pre-wrathers therefore believe that the church will face the persecution of the Antichrist that begins at the midpoint of the seven-year period, but that persecution is said to be cut short with the rapture. Basically, the idea is that on the very day that God's people are out of the way, 
The wrath of God known as the day of the Lord begins on the rest of the world. I'll explain all the details and the reasonings behind most of these positions as we progress, but there is one more term that really needs defining before we go any further. Recently, it has become something of a tradition to refer to the entire seven-year period as the tribulation period. This is unnecessarily confusing since there is a recognized theological term called the Great Tribulation, and almost all biblical scholars, regardless of their view on the rapture, recognize that the Great Tribulation is specifically the time of the Antichrist persecution, which begins after the midpoint. In other words, in order to avoid confusion with the Great Tribulation, we will refer to the seven-year period as either the seven-year period or the 70th week of Daniel in this film. The first pre-trib problem on our list is called the precursor problem, and in order to understand it, we need to first talk a little about the so-called Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord is an Old Testament concept for when God shows up uh, in history and finally in the end uh, to judge his enemies and uh, sometimes to vindicate or rescue his people. It really means the time of God's wrath, in an ultimate sense, when God will pour out his judgment, his vengeance on a wicked world. Scripture explicitly declares that the saints will not experience the eschatological wrath of God, the wrath of God that is typically associated with what we call the day of the Lord. Therefore, the question, in my opinion, the really the only question, uh, is when does the wrath of God begin? As mentioned earlier, pre-tribulationists teach that the entire seven-year period is the wrath of God, and that the rapture will occur just before it begins. Importantly, they also believe that the rapture is imminent, meaning that it can happen at any moment, and there are no prophetic events that must come before the rapture. However, there are at least four events explicitly stated to come before the day of the Lord in Scripture. Elijah will be sent before the day of the Lord. A rebellion or apostasy will occur. The man of lawlessness will be revealed before the day of the Lord. Also, a very specific series of cosmic disturbances will be given as a sign before the day of the Lord. Now, this is a very big problem for uh, pre-tribulational imminence. Because as pre-tribulational imminence is defined, there are to be no precursors, no necessary precursors before the coming of the day of the Lord or the coming of the rapture. But we have explicit declarations in the Bible that we have several precursors that have to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Pre-tribulational teachers admit themselves that if you can find one event that will occur before the rapture, then it contradicts imminence theology and hence it contradicts pre-tribulational theology. Well, definitely the fact that the, the scriptures uh, uh, tell us that there are going to be precursors to the day of the Lord is an argument against pre-tribulationism. To clarify, based on where pre-trib teachers have traditionally placed the rapture, if these four biblically prophesied events occur before the day of the Lord, it means there are, in fact, events that must come before the rapture, the very thing pre-tribbers say cannot occur. We will discuss several of the precursors in other sections, but I want to focus on one in particular here, found in the book of Joel. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Joel 2, verse 31. Many of the Old Testament prophets wrote about this time, the day of the Lord, the time of God's wrath. And almost every time you read about it in the Old Testament, you're going to find it connected with something that I term cosmic disturbance. Something happens to the sun, the moon, and the stars. Isaiah 13, uh, other passages in the Old Testament present these cosmic disturbances that will be uh, signs that the day of the Lord has arrived. Joel explicitly states it's going to happen before, not during, before the day of the Lord. 
This is so important because there are two prophecies in the New Testament about when this particular celestial sign takes place. The first, in Matthew, makes it clear that the sun, moon, and star sign occurs immediately after the tribulation of those days. And everyone agrees that those days, in context, is a reference to the persecution that begins directly after the abomination of desolation, which theologians call the Great Tribulation. So if you compare Joel 2 verse 31, which says that this sign occurs before the day of the Lord, with the passage we just read in Matthew that says the cosmic sign comes after the Great Tribulation, which begins at the midpoint, you have explicit evidence that the day of the Lord is not seven years long, but rather that it begins at some unknown point after the middle of the 70th week. We see this confirmed in Revelation chapter 6, where it says that this celestial disturbance sign occurs at the so-called sixth seal, and even most pre-tribulationists will agree that the sixth seal in Revelation takes place after the midpoint of the seven-year period. We will talk more about Revelation 6 and the seals in another section, but for now, let's see how pre-tribbers try to explain some of the things we have brought up so far. Surprisingly few pre-trib scholars have addressed the precursor problem at all, but of the few that have, they present three possible solutions. Dr. Richard Mayhew, a very accomplished and well-respected pre-tribulational scholar, chose to simply agree that there were precursors to the Day of the Lord connected to the midpoint, and that the Day of the Lord must therefore start after those precursors, after the midpoint. But I'm inclined to follow more along the lines of Dr. Richard Mayhew, who argued that the uh, typical uh, long-term historical aspect or thinking regarding uh, the beginning of the Day of the Lord probably needs to be rethought uh, among uh, pre-tribbers. As you may have noticed, this timeline of Mayhew's is pretty much exactly what the pre-rathers teach, with one very important exception. Mayhew places the rapture the same place that pre-tribbers always have, just before the seven-year period starts, whereas pre-rathers place the rapture just before the Day of the Lord starts, at some unknown point after the midpoint. Mayhew does this because he is still a pre-tribulationist, and so he can't compromise on the idea of imminence. Therefore, he can't allow these events to occur before the rapture, as it would destroy the idea of an any-moment rapture. So while he allows for these events to occur before the day of the Lord, he moves the rapture well before the day of the Lord, so there are still no events that occur before it. Pre-rathers have come to call this method of dealing with the precursor problem the gap theory. Basically, this theory places a significant gap of time between the rapture and the day of the Lord. In Dr. Mayhew's view, the gap is over three and a half years long. But there are slightly different takes on the gap theory out there. For example, pre-tribulationists like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who recognize various aspects of the precursor problem, but still want to maintain the traditional pre-trib view that the day of the Lord is seven years long, have to do something a little more radical. They assert that the rapture happens at some undefined but significant amount of time before the seven-year period even begins. It has to be a fairly long gap to accommodate all four precursors, though there has been no attempt to define exactly how long of a gap it will be. Both manifestations of the gap theory have the same fundamental problem, which is that Jesus teaches that the rapture and the beginning of the wrath of God are back-to-back -back events that occur on the same day. And if that is true, there can be no gap between the rapture and the day of the Lord. One of the reasons people on all sides of the debate have historically placed the rapture just prior to the day of the Lord, with no gap, is because of Jesus' teaching in the Olivet Discourse, which says, But concerning that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, 
until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And in Luke's account, the parable of Lot is added to this. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. They are joined. They are back to back. And we see that pattern throughout Scripture. Like with uh, Noah, it was on the same day that Noah entered the ark that the floods came. Furthermore, uh, with Lot, it was on the same day that he uh, exited that the wrath came and fire came upon Sodom. Really, the rapture triggers the day of the Lord because now it is time for retribution, for vindication. This idea that the righteous would be rescued on the same day that the day of the Lord began is probably why the New Testament writers consistently spoke of the day of the Lord as good for believers, but bad for everyone else. It is the day we will receive our rewards and be with Christ, but it's also the day God's wrath will be poured out on the world. This is why Peter said we should look for and hasten the day of the Lord. It's why Jesus said, when we see the sign that the day of the Lord is about to occur, we should lift up our heads, because our redemption draws nigh. This idea that the rapture happens on the same day that the day of the Lord's wrath begins is very conservative theology, believed from the earliest days of the church. It's actually still believed by the majority of pre-tribbers. It is only those who have realized the implications of the precursor problem who have begun to seek out alternative theologies about the timing of the day of the Lord in relationship to the rapture. The third way pre-tribulationists have attempted to deal with the precursor problem is to claim that there are two days of the Lord, one that is seven years long and another 24-hour day of the Lord associated with Armageddon. This theory allows them to have all the precursors take place before their new 24-hour day of the Lord, and because they place the rapture immediately prior to the beginning of the seven-year-long version of the day of the Lord, they can maintain pre-trib imminence that no prophesied events occur before the rapture. There are a lot of problems with this argument, but the main one is that, as we have seen, the celestial disturbance precursor which is said to occur before the day of the Lord in Joel 2 verse 31, takes place at the sixth seal in Revelation 6 verses 12 to 14. This is significant because even though there are some minor disagreements about the timing of the first few seals in relationship to the seven-year period, the sixth seal is almost universally believed to be after the midpoint. So that means this theory would require a third day of the Lord to be added to their list, because the sixth seal is unquestionably after the beginning of the seven-year period, and at the very least five months before Armageddon. We know this because the fifth trumpet, which is a part of the day of the Lord, is said to be five months long. We will learn much more about the sixth seal and how it relates to the day of the Lord in another section of this film. But needless to say, this third option isn't a very popular one among pre-tribbers. In their defense, the precursor problem doesn't leave pre-tribbers with many good options, and so the most common way they deal with it is to avoid explaining these problems to their fellow pre-tribbers in the first place. The second pre-trib problem is related to the Olivet Discourse, which is the name for the teaching about the end times that Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives, recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Christians throughout the ages have believed this passage to be speaking of the signs leading up to the rapture. In other words, they believed that the signs that Jesus tells his disciples about in the Olivet Discourse are signs that will happen before the rapture and that the rapture itself is pictured in Matthew 24, 
verses 30 to 31, which says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. There are lots of reasons to believe that the rapture is being described in Matthew 24, starting with the clear parallels between the events described in Matthew 24 and the events described in other rapture passages, such as 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, which says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Jesus' description of his coming in Matthew chapter 24, verses 29-31, through 31, parallels, ideally, Paul's description of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And Paul confirms this through many linguistic connections in his first epistle to the Thessalonians. There are tons of parallels. Uh, everything from, you know, the angels and the trumpet and uh, the gathering of God's elect, but also, um, you know, the thief in the night imagery, the drunkenness versus so sobriety imagery. The problem with this for the pre-tribber is that if the rapture is in view in verses 30 and 31, it leads to the conclusion that there must be precursors or signs before the rapture, because in context there are lots of signs that happen before the events in verses 30 and 31. For example, a straightforward reading of this passage means that before the rapture can take place, the following events will happen first. A number of smaller signs Jesus calls birth pains. The abomination of desolation when the Antichrist declares himself to be God in the temple at the midpoint. A great persecution like none that has ever been seen in history. A falling away or an apostasy from the faith. And an ominous sign in the sun, moon, and stars followed immediately by the rapture. As we have seen, the idea of precursors before the rapture is unacceptable with pre-tribbers because it would mean that the rapture is not imminent. In other words, if the rapture is what is being referred to in verses 30 and 31 of Matthew 24, it would mean that there are things that will happen first, that the rapture can't occur at any moment, and most significantly, it would mean that the church will face the Antichrist persecution before the rapture. After the pre-trib view was proposed in the mid-1800s, all these problems in the Olivet Discourse were immediately recognized and a new sort of anti-Matthew 24 movement began. At first, they essentially taught people not to pay attention to this section of Scripture at all. They said it was only meant for those left behind, such as Jews or the so-called tribulation saints. Arguments for this would begin by saying things like, Matthew is a particularly Jewish gospel, and because of the Jewish focus of the book of Matthew, this section was not meant for the church. Thankfully, this particular line of argumentation has been mostly rejected in recent years. Even pre-tribulational scholars have come to realize its flaws. For example, they point out that Matthew might be the most church-focused gospel of them all. It's the only one that mentions the Great Commission and the section on church discipline in chapter 18. In fact, Matthew is the only gospel that uses the word church at all. If you're going to make the argument uh, that Matthew chapter 24 is not for believers, um, are you going to make the same argument two chapters later um, when Jesus institutes the ordinance of the communion? Uh, it's, a, it's a real problem for pre-tribulationists in that regard. Pre-tribulationists did come up with one interpretation of Matthew 24 that seemed to stick. In the mid-1800s, they began to teach that verse 31 was not the rapture at all, but some other event that occurred at the end of the seven-year period. Most often, they said it referred to the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, where Jesus descends to battle with the armies of the Antichrist. Historically, classical pre-tribbers did not, would not allow 
the, the rapture to be put um, in the proximity of Matthew 24 and 25. They argue that the rapture is nowhere to be seen there, that any mention of a coming of Christ in that passage uh, has, it refers to Armageddon. There are lots of problems with this view. For instance, many of the parallels that we see with the Thessalonian letters and Matthew 24 just don't apply to Armageddon. The events in Matthew 24 verses 29 to 31 and the events at Armageddon are fundamentally different. In Matthew, there is a rescue of God's people from the earth to heaven. But in Armageddon, Jesus returns from heaven to destroy the wicked people on the earth. But the biggest problem with the Armageddon view, and the one pre-trib scholars in the last few years have been scrambling to solve, comes from the obvious contradictions this view creates with the second half of the Olivet Discourse. So in the latter part of Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, we are introduced to many parables of Jesus concerning uh, the day and hour and readiness for his coming. And from a pre-tribulational perspective, this proves to be a problem in many different ways, regardless of the way it's interpreted, which are various. To set the stage, it's important to remember a basic outline of the Olivet Discourse. The disciples ask Jesus what the signs of his coming will be. Then Jesus gives them a fairly large list of signs ending with the coming itself, i.e., the rapture in verses 30 and 31. From that point on, after verse 31 and going all the way through chapter 25, Jesus tells his disciples various parables about how important it is for them to watch for the signs of his return, signs he just got done telling them about. It is in this last section where pre-tribbers have so many problems to solve, because when they changed the meaning of verses 30 and 31 from the rapture to Armageddon, they changed the meaning of these parables as well. And these parables just don't make sense if verses 30 and 31 are anything but the rapture. For example, in one of these parables, it says that no one knows the day or the hour of Jesus' coming. And while many laymen pre-tribbers will quote this verse in reference to the rapture, they do this ignorantly. The pre-trib scholars know that if they have changed verse 31 to be about Armageddon, then they must make this not knowing the day or the hour to be about Armageddon. After all, according to them, Jesus wasn't talking about the rapture at any point in this chapter. And in context, whatever verses 30 to 31 are referring to is what the parables that follow them have to be about. So they're stuck having to defend the idea that no one will know the day or the hour of Armageddon. The problem here is that we know from several other verses in Scripture that the day Armageddon occurs will be exactly seven years and thirty days after the covenant is made by the Antichrist, and exactly 1290 days after the abomination of desolation at the midpoint. In other words, since it seems very likely people will at least know when the abomination of desolation at the midpoint occurs, since Jesus says people should flee when they see it, all anyone would have to do is calculate the days from that event to arrive at the day Armageddon will occur. Commentaries from pre-tribbers either don't mention this problem at all, or admit it's a problem but offer no solutions. John MacArthur is a good example of the latter. In his commentary he says, Nevertheless, even with all those indisputable signs and precisely designated periods, the exact day and hour will not be known by any human beings, not even tribulation believers, in advance, although the Lord gives no reason for their not knowing. David Guzik says something similar in his commentary. In this there is a dilemma. How can the day of Jesus' coming be both completely unknown and at the same time be known to the day, according to Daniel 12 verse 11? Another problem caused by interpreting verse 31 as anything other than the rapture is that twice in these parables, Jesus says that one will be taken and one will be left. If this is talking about the rapture, then it flows quite naturally from the gathering in the clouds in verse 31, and it makes perfect sense in context. But because of the pre-tribulational teaching that verses 30 and 31 are about Armageddon, 
Pre-tribbers must interpret this one being taken here as either Armageddon or the sheep and goat judgment. Basically, they must see this being taken as a bad thing for unsaved people. They must interpret it as a wicked person being taken to be judged instead of a righteous person being taken to their eternal reward. It's a full reversal from historical Christianity on this point. In defense of this, they will point to the parable in the previous verses about Noah, in which Jesus talked about how the flood came and took people away. They say that since the word sometimes translated took in that passage was about being taken for judgment, the flood came and took the unbelievers away. That is how the word taken in verses 40 and 41 should be understood, that the one was taken for judgment, not rescue. The truth is the Greek actually precludes this from being a possibility. Two different words are actually being used. And it, the one taken is to receive to oneself, to receive warmly. In fact, it's the same word Jesus uses in the departing discourse in John, which I will not leave you but I will as orphans, but I will come again and I will receive you unto myself. And if I go to make a place ready for you, I will come again and take you, per Lovano, take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. So here, Jesus uses the term per Lovano. And guess what? Every pre-trib interpreter believes that John 14, this John 14 passage, when Jesus says, I will take you to be with me, is referring to the rapture. Another argument for this one being taken, being a reference to them being taken in the rapture and not being taken to judgment, is that in the Ten Virgins parable, a few verses later, which is on the exact same subject, which we know because it ends with the exact same warning, watch because you do not know the day or the hour, it is only the wise virgins that are taken, not the foolish ones. In other words, the purpose of Jesus' warning to watch because you don't know the day or the hour is so that you can be a part of those that are taken, not left. Interpreting verse 31 as Armageddon is also logically incompatible with the next parable, in which Jesus says the wicked people of the world will be carefree and unaware before his coming. He says they will be marrying and being given in marriage, and eating and drinking, up until the very day of his coming. This creates a huge problem, since according to the pre-trib interpretation, this would mean that the wicked are relatively carefree right up until the day of the Battle of Armageddon, even though Armageddon takes place at the very end of the seven-year period, after the trumpet and bowl judgments have been poured out. To put this in context, at this time every living thing in the sea will be dead. All the fresh water in the world will be undrinkable. The sun will be so hot that no one can bear it. Everyone will have been plagued with terrible sores, and there will have been five solid months of torment from demonic, scorpion-like beings directly from the pit of hell. I could go on, but I think it's safe to say people will have noticed that the wrath of God has started and that they would not be living carefree lives right up until the day the Battle of Armageddon begins. There are precious few pre-trib commentaries that even attempt to justify this idea. Again, the most common tactic is to not mention the problem at all. But pre-tribulational scholars have recognized the various problems that interpreting verses 30 and 31 as Armageddon has caused. And in the last decade or so, there have been two competing theories from them to answer their critics on these issues. One from Dr. Craig Blazing of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and one from Dr. John Hart of Moody Bible Institute. While Blazing's theory gained popularity from being featured in Zondervan's Three Views on the Rapture book, it's a somewhat convoluted argument, and in many ways, it represents an entirely new way to teach pre-tribulationism. As a result, it seems to have had less acceptance among pre-tribulationists than Hart's theory, though it should be noted that in both cases, these theories rely on the same underlying proof text, but more on that later. John Hart wrote a paper in 2007 that simply agreed with the historical church and the pre-wrath rapture proponents 
that all of the parables after verse 36 are in fact talking about the rapture and not Armageddon, thus avoiding the various contradictions we have been talking about. The unique thing about Hart's view is that he maintains that the first part of the Olivet Discourse, including verse 30 and 31, is still a reference to Armageddon as pre-tribbers have taught since the 1800s. So he is essentially saying the first half of the Olivet Discourse has nothing to do with the second half. That Jesus was teaching his followers about the signs leading up to Armageddon until verse 35, and then, for some reason, he reversed the order of events and began to teach parables about the rapture in verse 36. Both Hart and Blazing's theories rely on the argument that in verse 36, the Greek phrase peride, which is often translated now concerning, represents a transition to an entirely new topic. In other words, they argue that this Greek term gives them an excuse to decouple the first half of the Olivet Discourse from the second. Hart argues, and Blazing does the same, that the transitional phrase in Greek in verse 36, uh, peride, uh, which means uh, now concerning or something along those lines, uh, is intended to distinguish or to mark the, the, the change from answering one question to the other. However, since peride basically means the same thing that the English phrase now concerning does, it can mean now concerning something entirely different, but it can also mean now concerning another aspect of the thing that was just discussed. It's used both ways multiple times in the New Testament. In Matthew, it doesn't necessarily mean that the author is going to a new, entirely different subject. Rather, it means that he may be discussing another aspect of the central focus at hand, which is exactly what's happening in Matthew 24. The peri day line in verse 36 starts off, now concerning the day or the hour. So this is about the specific timing of something. Hart wants us to believe this is the first line on a totally new subject. But the problem is that this line is obviously a continuation of the question about the timing of the events begun in the parable of the fig tree just before this. The parable of the fig tree teaches that the followers of Christ should be able to determine the general time of his coming by the signs Jesus just described in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 31, and that his disciples could know his coming was near by looking for the signs, in the same way that they could know summer is near by observing the leaves on a fig tree. So with the fig tree parable, Jesus says that we will be able to know the general time but in the next line he says, concerning, or peride, the day or the hour, i.e. the specific time of my coming, no one will know. It is a qualification then, because we do not know the exact day or hour. So we know the season, but we do not know the day or hour. So these two things complement one another, and they must be taken together. Another criticism of Hart's view revolves around the term parousia, which is translated as coming. Since these new views of heart and blazing separate Matthew 24, beginning at verse 36, from the previous section, it would mean the question the disciples asked about the parousia in verse 3 is different from the answers about the parousia given by Jesus in verses 37 and 39. They have to say that what Jesus refers to as the coming of the Son of Man uh, is different from the coming of the Son of Man in Matthew 36 to 41. That's very difficult to maintain exegetically. There's no uh, evidence within the text, not even the, the transitional phrase peride, that suggests he's shifting from one coming to some other coming. Um, this is clear because when the disciples ask the question, they say, what is the sign of your coming? And Jesus just uses that same language, his parousia, uh, in both parts of the text. He doesn't give any indication that he's switching topics. The bottom line is that the old pre-trib view, which has the parables at the end of the Olivet Discourse, talking about Armageddon instead of the rapture, is a brand new argument with multiple contradictions and pre-tribbers who know 
know it. But the supposed fixes for this major problem, proposed in the last decade or so, which revolve around the idea that the first and second halves of the Olivet Discourse have nothing to do with one another, is an even worse argument. And now, hopefully some of you know it. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1-4 to The most problematic passage for pre-tribulationists is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians was written by the Apostle Paul, in part to refute a false teaching circulating at the time that the Thessalonians had missed the rapture and were in the day of the Lord. Paul's message to the Thessalonians was very simple. He told them not to worry. They had not missed the rapture and were therefore not in the day of the Lord. And so the way he disabuses the Thessalonians from that notion is he says certain things have to happen first. Uh, And those things uh, were the apostasy and the revelation of the man of lawlessness, that is, the Antichrist, what we would call the Antichrist. There are two main reasons why this is a problem for the pre-tribulationists. The first is that, as we have seen, pre-tribbers maintain that there are no events that must occur before the rapture. And here Paul blatantly says, there are two events that must occur first, the rebellion, sometimes translated as apostasy, and the revealing of the man of lawlessness. If Paul had taught pre-tribulationism, his simplest answer would be, no, the rapture hasn't occurred yet. Instead of, no, there are certain things that have to happen first. And as soon as you say there are certain things that have to happen first, you've undermined pre-tribulationism. So uh, pre-tribulationists have a very difficult time, in my opinion, uh, making Second Thessalonians 2 fit with their, their uh, thinking. Second Thessalonians 2 poses the greatest problem for the pre-trip position, or certainly is one of the greatest problem passages for the pre-trip position. Because Paul does exactly what the majority of pre-tribbers say Um, does not occur, and that is he gives us a list, a chronology of events uh, specifically connected to the rapture. We know that Paul was teaching that these two events would occur before the day of the Lord, in part because he uses the specific Greek word proton or protos, which is often translated first, and is specifically used here to describe when these two events would take place in relationship to the day of the Lord. In the Greek, the Greek is very specific. It uses the term protos, and it means before or first. So Paul here is teaching explicitly that two events have to happen before the day of the Lord. Yeah, the fact that Paul says these things must happen first is important. He doesn't just say these things must happen, but these must happen first. The second problem for pre-tribulationists is that at least one of the precursors mentioned here, the revealing of the man of lawlessness, is an event that takes place at the midpoint of the seven-year period. And most significantly, this revealing of the man of lawlessness, which Paul describes in saying he will set himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God, which places the revealing of the Antichrist at the midpoint. So the coming of our Lord and our being gathered to him cannot occur until after the midpoint of the 70th week. Take a look at this chart detailing the views of five prominent pre-tribulationists about 2 Thessalonians 2, 
and you get a sense that they have fundamentally different, often mutually exclusive ways of explaining this section of Scripture. But despite this confusion, there are some pre-trib arguments about 2 Thessalonians 2 that are more common than others. For example, the most common way that pre-tribulationists deal with this is to say that Paul did not actually mean that these two events would happen before the day of the Lord. Rather, he meant that these two events will happen during or be features of the day of the Lord. For example, in his commentary, David Guzik says of this problem, Paul will not describe events which must precede the rapture, but events that are concrete evidence of the day of the Lord. They are saying that Paul wasn't saying these two events would come before the day of the Lord. Rather, Paul was just naming things that happen during the day of the Lord. Despite this denial that Paul meant these things would happen before the day of the Lord, being one of the most common ways pre-tribulationists deal with this problem, pre-tribulationists never seem to explain why they feel it's okay to ignore the grammar of this passage, such as the Greek word proton which means that these two events must come before the day of the Lord. You can confirm this by looking at other places in the New Testament where the same Greek construction occurs. The same conditional word aeon me, paired with proton, always means one thing comes before the other. Our law doesn't condemn a man unless aeon me, it first, proton, hears from him and learns what he is doing, does it? Another example of the same construction is in Mark 3, verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless, aeon me, he first, proton, ties up the strong man. Then, tate, indeed the house can be plundered. Mark 3, verse 27. These two examples that share the same Greek construction with 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 confirm that the correct reading here is that before the day of the Lord begins, two events must happen first, the rebellion and the revelation of the man of lawlessness. So at the end of the day, with all these interpretations, the 800-pound gorilla is the word protos. Another popular way that pre-tribulationists try to deal with 2 Thessalonians 2 relates to the word rebellion, sometimes translated as falling away or apostasy in verse 3. It is one of the two things that are supposed to happen before the day of the Lord. This is usually understood to mean a falling away from the faith, that is, Christians apostatizing or leaving the faith of Christianity. Recently, some pre-tribulationists have put forward the idea that the word behind this word rebellion apostasia in the Greek, means the rapture. The idea is that Paul was teaching that the rapture would happen first, and then the man of lawlessness would be revealed. This is usually done to preserve the all-important pre-trib doctrine of imminence, that no events can come before the rapture. But in Second Thessalonians, they come to this text, they got real problem, they know it's difficult, they know it poses a great problem for their position, and so what do they do? They take a word, apostasy, say, aha, this word is referring to the rapture, the falling away, the taking away of the believers on the earth. This interpretation has two serious problems. The first is the complete lack of any evidence that the word apostasia can mean the rapture. And the second is that such an interpretation would mean that Paul is making a nonsensical and utterly useless point in this passage. Pre-tribulationists claim that the apostasia can mean the rapture because the word is sometimes translated in early English Bibles like the Tyndale and Geneva Bibles as the English word depart. They would say that if the word can mean depart in English, it might also be a reference to the rapture, where believers will depart the earth. The problem is that the word is never used that way. When the early English Bibles used the English word depart to define apostasia, they meant it to be understood in a non-spatial sense, as in, he departed from the faith, or he departed from sound doctrine. The word is never used to describe physical departure as in, he departed from his house, or as in our case, 
he departed from the earth. It always means a non-physical departure, such as, for example, a, a political rebellion or a, uh, an apostasy from the faith. The word is used five other times in the Bible, and each time it's used in a political or religious sense, never in a physical sense. Even if you expanded your search to include all of the secular writings in Koine Greek, you wouldn't find the word used in a spatial or physical sense. Show me a historical reference where this word is used that way. Any writing, any historical writings, 200 years before the New Testament, 200 years after the New Testament. In defense of this view, some pre-tribbers will go so far as to committing the so-called root fallacy. What they will do is say that the root for apostasia, which is probably the Greek word aphistemi, can mean a physical departure. This method of interpretation is universally rejected by Greek scholars because it's not a reliable way to determine the definition of words. To give you an example from English, the root word for nice in Latin actually means to be ignorant, but no one thinks that the sentence John is nice has anything to do with John being ignorant. Bringing up the root of apostasia is a desperate attempt to defend a particularly bad theory. The second reason this argument makes no sense is that if the word apostasia means the rapture, then Paul's argument to the Thessalonians is essentially that the rapture can't happen until the rapture happens. The fatal problem with this is Paul says that these things happen before the coming of our Lord and are being gathered to him, which is the rapture. And so it is illogical to say that the rapture must occur before the rapture occurs. What it's doing is it's making Paul say that, well, the rapture can't come before the rapture. To their credit, this apostasia is the same thing as the rapture theory is openly rejected by the vast majority of pre-trib scholars. Even their own scholars, such as Paul Feinberg and John Walvoord, two of the most esteemed pre-tribulational scholars, have completely rejected this interpretation. Uh, they haven't even convinced all pre-tribulationists of this, uh, who argue that the apostasy, in Greek, hey, apostasia, uh, means the rapture. By that, Paul means the rapture. Um, that's a very difficult case to make, if not an impossible case to make. Some pre-tribulationists, who don't want to play the kind of games with the text we just saw, will actually agree that Paul wrote that the apostasy and the revealing of the man of lawlessness will occur first, or before the day of the Lord. Take, for example, John Wolverd and John MacArthur. Both men, in their commentaries, tell their readers that the two events, the rebellion and the revealing of the Antichrist, would occur before the day of the Lord, which, of course, we agree with. But for them, it's a very odd thing to say, since in other places they teach that the day of the Lord is a seven-year period, which is immediately preceded by the rapture. And since both men also agree that the revealing of the man of lawlessness in verse 3 is a reference to the abomination of desolation, which happens at the midpoint, they are essentially saying that something which they know happens at the midpoint occurs before the day of the Lord. The obvious result is that the day of the Lord can't be the seven-year model that they teach in other places. The rapture must start sometime after the midpoint. This massive contradiction is not brought up or explained in either of their commentaries. Astute viewers have already noticed another contradiction, which is, how can they teach that these two events occur before the day of the Lord, but not before the rapture? Since, like most pre-tribulationists, they teach that the day of the Lord occurs immediately after the rapture, with no significant gap between the rapture and the day of the Lord. In other words, since neither Walvoord or MacArthur are rapture gap theorists, in their view, if something is before the day of the Lord, it is necessarily before the rapture as well. So why are they essentially teaching here what they certainly don't agree with in other teachings? that there are events before the rapture. It's not clear.
As I said, they don't mention these serious contradictions in their commentaries. This could be called the forgetful Paul view, because in their commentaries and sermons they will correctly teach that in verse 1 the words coming and gathering are in fact references to the rapture. This is not a debate among pre-trib or pre-rathers. Pre-tribs and pre-rathers agree that this reference, the gathering to be with him in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, is the rapture. But they will go through the rest of their commentaries talking about these two precursors to the day of the Lord as if they are only precursors to the day of the Lord, as if they have nothing to do with the rapture. It's as if Paul forgot to talk about the rapture, even though he said that was specifically what he was going to talk about in this section. He says, now regarding the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, let me just stop there. Well, Paul hasn't made any connections here. He's just saying, now I'm going to talk about this. Now, isn't it sort of odd if he says, now I'm going to talk about the rapture and the parousia, and then he doesn't mention it ever again? Well, he actually does. He's um, he's unpacking what it means, the day of the Lord. Prerath solves this problem by understanding that these two events will occur before the rapture and before the day of the Lord, and that Paul is using both concepts interchangeably here, as he often does in the New Testament. Prerath also understands the revealing of the Antichrist in verse 3 is a reference to the abomination of desolation at the midpoint of the seven-year period. They also see the falling away or rebellion in verse 3 as a reference to the falling away that Jesus mentions in association with the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24. In fact, this clear and consistent connection between Matthew 24 and 2 Thessalonians 2 is a really important point. A fundamental problem of the way that pre-tribulational interpreters interpret the Apostle Paul is they don't recognize that Paul is getting his teaching from Jesus. For example, just look at the similarities. In Matthew 24, before the rapture in verse 31, what does Jesus say must come first? You guessed it. A falling away and the abomination of desolation. And it's only after those events occur that you can expect to see the sign of the impending day of the Lord in verse 29 and the rapture in verses 30 and 31, just before it begins. Jesus' teaching on the end times is a perfect mirror to Paul's in terms of the timing of events, which is probably why Paul said that he got this doctrine about the rapture, quote, from the Lord. How do we know that the Apostle Paul received his teachings from the Olive Discourse, from Jesus' Olive Discourse. Well, we know this. We know this because there are thir at least 30 parallels between Paul's teaching in First and Second Thessalonians and between the Olive Discourse. There's 30 cohesive links between their teachings. It's not just pre-rathers that see the connection between First and Second Thessalonians and Matthew 24. Just check the margins of your favorite Bible. Ever since cross-references have been invented, they have been linking these two passages. It's only the pre-tribulationists who can't accept that these passages are parallel to one another. If you're a pre-tribulationist, just you know, lay your presuppositions aside for a moment and just read 2 Thessalonians 2 without your traditions and see what it says. There are several passages in the book of Revelation supporting the idea that the church will face the Antichrist persecution just before the rapture, and that both the rapture and the day of the Lord will not begin until after the midpoint of the seven-year period. This is all, of course, contrary to the traditional pre-trib model, which teaches that the rapture will occur before the seven-year period begins. In the book of Revelation, most of the events that take place in the book correspond to various stages of a symbolic scroll being opened. For example, there are seven seals on the scroll, and each time a seal is removed, a prophetic event takes place. After all seven of the seals are removed, seven angels with seven trumpets are introduced, and one at a time 
each angel blows their trumpet, and a new prophetic event takes place, until finally seven angels with seven bowls of wrath appear, and seven more events take place. There are a variety of different viewpoints in pre-tribulationism as to the exact timing of the events that correspond to these seals, trumpets, and bowls. The main difference between pre-tribulationism and pre-wrath in this regard is that most pre-tribulationists believe that all the seals in Revelation chapter 6, as well as the trumpets and bowls found in later chapters, are events that take place during the day of the Lord's wrath. Pre-wrathers believe the seven seals on the outside of this proverbial scroll are not the wrath of God, but rather only the contents of the scroll, represented in the book by the trumpets and bowls, are the day of the Lord's wrath. And so these seven seals are preconditions that need to be met before the scroll is opened. It is only after all seven seals are broken that the scroll can be opened and then the wrath of God unfolds. And this is exactly what we see in the flow of Revelation 6 through 8. Pre-wrathers point out that the events that take place during the seals are mostly things that are the direct result of the Antichrist's evil workings, not the result of God's wrath. For example, the first seal is the introduction of the Antichrist as the rider on the white horse. The second seal is about the wars that the Antichrist will fight as he gains power. Then, in the next two seals, you have famines and people being killed in large numbers, quote, with the sword. The fifth seal is an interesting one, and this is where many pre-wrathers begin their argument that these seals cannot be a part of God's wrath. The martyrs uh, that are depicted uh, in the Revelation at um, the fifth seal, in my opinion, is one of the strongest arguments for the pre-wrath position. Pre-tribulationists claim that the seals on the scroll, the seven sealed scroll, the seals are all of God's wrath. But that's contradicted by the fifth seal. In Revelation 6, 9, it says, Now when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been violently killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, How long, sovereign master, holy and true, before you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? Each of them was given a long white robe, and they were told to rest for a little longer until the full number was reached of both their fellow servants and their brothers who were going to be killed just as they have been. But they asked God, when are you going to start your wrath on the people on the earth who are responsible for our death? That is powerful, in my opinion, because to me, that explicitly declares that the wrath of God, that eschatological wrath, has not begun. How long, O oh Lord, until you vindicate our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In other words... It hasn't been happening yet up to the fifth seal. And they're told, wait a little while uh, until the rest of your brethren uh, are killed. And then uh, the sixth seal is open and the great day of God's wrath has arrived. There are very few pre-trib responses to this issue. But one example is from Robert Thomas, who, though he doesn't say it directly, implies that what the martyrs were actually doing is crying out for God's wrath to finish. In other words, the martyrs are crying out for the end of God's wrath, not for God's wrath to begin. The problem, of course, is that the plain reading in both the Greek and English of this phrase, how long before you judge and avenge our blood, means that no judgment of any kind has begun at that point. This is reiterated in the next verse when God tells them to wait a little while longer until the full number of Christian martyrs are killed. Both grammatically and contextually, God has not begun his judgment on the wicked at this point, which is probably why we found so few pre-trib commentators willing to try to explain this passage at all. This causes another problem for pre-tribbers because if God's wrath has begun by this point, as they say, it would mean that these Christian martyrs in the fifth seal had been going through God's wrath 
which contradicts the doctrine that Christians will not go through the wrath of God, derived from 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 and other places, a doctrine that is agreed upon by all sides of this debate. God promises that, that believers will not have to experience the wrath of God, the, the day of the Lord's wrath. And yet, pre-tribulationists contradict themselves when they say that the fifth seal is God's wrath. You can't have both. Pre-tribulationists try to get around this by calling these Christians tribulation saints. They define tribulation saints as people left behind in the rapture who become Christians during the day of the Lord. Well, a common argument that I hear often is that, oh, well, th these, these, these believers, they're not, quote-unquote, part of the church. Uh, they're, they're quote-unquote, tribulation saints. And the, they'll even go to the extent, not all of them, but some of them will actually say, you know, because they didn't accept Christ before the rapture, this is like a, a, cer a certain judgment on them. I'm, I'm sorry, that's absurd. And it also, again, it contradicts what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is that we are promised exemption from God's wrath. Some pre-tribulationists, Bill Salas for one, have proposed an entirely new theory which removes the fifth seal from the 70th week altogether. Salas places the first five seals before the seven-year period, which avoids the fifth seal martyr problem. But this model is almost unheard of in pre-trib circles. While many pre-tribbers argue about where to put the first three seals, and some pre-tribbers do, in fact, put the first three seals before the seven-year period begins, placing the fourth and fifth seals before the seven years is fairly radical because they have such strong ties to the midpoint of the seven-year period. But it does have the one benefit of keeping these fifth seal martyrs out of the wrath of God and thus avoiding this major contradiction. The next bit of evidence to which pre-Rathers point to show that the wrath of God has not begun during the seals is the celestial disturbance sign found in the next seal, the sixth seal. This is the sign which Joel 2 verse 31 says will occur before the day of the Lord. So if this sign in the sun, moon, and stars in Revelation 6 is the same one that Joel talked about, then the day of the Lord cannot have begun by this point, because this sign happens before the day of the Lord begins. We see evidence that this cosmic disturbance sign in Revelation 6 is in fact the same one that announces the day of the Lord's wrath, because as a result of people seeing this sign in the heavens, we see the following reaction. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and every one slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17. Here again, a plain reading shows that the people of the earth believe that the wrath of God is about to begin at the sixth seal. Uh, the earth dwellers are diving into the rocks because it is now time for the day of recompense, for the day of uh, repaying the world for persecuting the people of God. In an attempt to deal with this damning evidence that the seals cannot be the wrath of God, pre-tribbers will typically argue about the tense form of the Greek word for has come in Revelation 6 verse 17. Many pre-tribbers say that since the phrase has come is in the Greek errorist tense form, it is in the past tense. In this case, they would prefer a translation such as the wrath of God has been occurring. Pre-tribulationists generally want to argue the day of the Lord began with the first seal. And so when people say the great day of God's wrath has arrived, all they're doing is finally recognizing that they've been experiencing the great day of God's wrath. A growing number of Greek scholars strongly disagree with this idea, pointing out that the reason any Greek word is rendered in the past, present, or future tense is determined by the context, not from Greek tense form. This can be seen by reviewing other instances in the Bible, including in Revelation 19, verse 7, 
where the errorist indicative tense form is clearly not supposed to be translated in the past tense. It says, The wedding of the Lamb has come, which is obviously not supposed to be translated, The wedding of the Lamb has already come. Take the text at face value. Allow the text to speak. The fact that the aorist is used more than 11 times in that sixth seal, uh, all of a sudden, just the one occurrence of it, though, has such high and important significance, seems to me to betray the very system you're trying to build. Also, consider the actions of the people in this verse. They are hiding themselves in the rocks because they saw the very same sign Joel said would herald the wrath of God. These people didn't hide themselves during the first five seals. What has changed other than the celestial announcement that the wrath of God was about to begin? Another line of evidence for the pre-wrath position in Revelation 6 comes from the recognition that the six seals line up perfectly with the teaching of Christ during his Olivet Discourse. Revelation 6 is a revelation to a lot of people when you start to compare it to Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. And this is a very key part of pre-wrath rapturism. It's actually something that was key to me really coming into the position. Juxtaposing both the flow of Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6 shows a lot of parallels. The opening of the seals... Uh, is parallel to the uh, elements of uh, Jesus' discussion in Matthew 24. So uh, the rider on the white horse corresponds to the false Christs. Uh, the rider on the red horse is war. Uh, the black horse is famine. The, uh, the sickly horse is death. Uh, and then there's martyrs. The first three seals, uh, these are corresponded to Jesus' beginning birth pains. Uh, the fourth seal is correlated to the persecution of the Antichrist, Great Tribulation. And the fifth seal is part of the Great Tribulation too, but it's showing the, a result of the persecution, and that is martyrdom. That's why it's called the fifth seal, uh, martyrs. In case there is any doubt we are on the right track, the next thing mentioned after the persecution in Matthew 24 is the celestial disturbances sign in the sun, moon, and stars, which we now know means the day of the Lord is about to begin. We see this exact same sign in the sixth seal, which all but confirms that this parallel between Matthew and the seals in Revelation 6 is correct. In the book of Revelation, in exactly the right location as you're reading it sequentially, you'll find a clear discussion of something happening to the sun, the moon, and the stars. This is the clear identifier, indicator, that God's wrath is about to commence. It is about to pour down on a wicked world. Now, the reason why this is so key is because in both the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation, we have this sign occurring. And that which occurs in the wake of this sign is an indication of deliverance. It is immediately after the distress of those days that Jesus appears in great power and glory and gathers his elect from the four winds. What so few people realize is that you can see the rapture directly after the sun, moon, and star sign in Revelation as well, though there is a kind of interlude after the sign and before the wrath of God. For example, the very next thing we see is an angel saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Then these angels go about sealing the 144,000 to protect them from the wrath that is about to come. Uh, you get this interlude in chapter 7, and it, the interlude is explicitly centered around protecting people from God's judgment. And so it says, Bef hold on, before, don't let any wind blow on the trees and things like that. Um, but before any of that happens, we want you to seal the servants of God on their forehead. Directly after the 144,000 are sealed, we see the result of the rapture from the viewpoint of heaven. A great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages,
standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Revelation 7 verse 9b We are given the final proof that the pre-wrath view of this timeline is correct a few verses later, when the angel tells John exactly who this group is. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7 verse 14 b. Remember, the Great Tribulation is not a seven-year period. Theologically speaking, it is the persecution that begins just after the midpoint and extends until it is cut short by the rapture. This phrase, out of the Great Tribulation, then, confirms the pre-wrath timeline, and it means that the day of the Lord will not begin until after the sixth seal and that the rapture occurs at some point after the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel, and finally, that the church will face the persecution of the Antichrist before the rapture. There's a depiction of the church's appearance in heaven, apparently as a means of protecting them from God's wrath, between the arrival of the great day of God's wrath and the actual execution of the great day of God's wrath. That's a pre-wrath rapture. Regarding this multitude in heaven, pre-tribbers would emphatically declare that this group is not the raptured church, but rather the so-called tribulation saints. But if you press them about why they must be tribulation saints and not the church, they will answer with a classic circular argument. They don't believe the church will be in the great tribulation, so this group can't be the church. There are, as far as I know, no other arguments for the existence of the tribulation saints view. You may be wondering why pre-tribulationists believe that the seals in Revelation 6 have to be a part of the day of the Lord's wrath, especially in light of all this evidence to the contrary. Do they have some proof text I'm not telling you about? Not really. The most common defense pre-tribulationists offer is that the seals are the wrath of God because Jesus opens them. This argument comes from Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, which says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. They argue, essentially, that since Jesus was the only one worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, the seals as well as the scroll must be judgment since in other places in the Bible, Jesus is said to be the only one worthy to judge the world. The problem, of course, is that it doesn't logically follow that just because Jesus is the only one worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, that the seals on the scroll are judgment. This verse in Revelation 5 verse 9 would make just as much sense in the pre-wrath view in which the scroll's contents, not the seals of the scroll, are the actual judgment. This is often the sole argument from pre-tribulationists to prove that the seals are the wrath of God, and in my opinion, it's rather weak, especially when you compare it to the actual explicit biblical evidence we have seen here. And that brings us to something we have referenced many times in this film, but have yet to fully explain, the pre-trib doctrine of imminence. Imminence is really a keystone issue for the pre-tribulational rapture. Well, in the pre-tribulational theological sense of the term, eminence means that there are no prophesied events that must happen before the rapture. The rapture is signless. It can happen at any moment, right now. Uh, and hence, they consider the rapture imminent. It's hard to overemphasize how important this idea of imminence is to the concept of the pre-tribulational rapture. Pre-tribbers often claim that imminency and pre-tribulationism are basically one in the same thing. Take, for example, this quote from one of the most prominent pre-tribulational scholars, John Wolvert. For the most part, scriptural evidence for imminence today is equivalent to proof of the pre-tribulation viewpoint. For all practical purposes, abandonment of the pre-tribulational return of Christ is tantamount to abandonment of the hope of his imminent return. The first thing that you should know about imminence is that it is a brand new doctrine. It appears to have originated in the early 1800s with the so-called Plymouth Brethren and John Darby, 
and there is no sign of the belief in an imminent rapture before the Antichrist arrives among any of the church fathers of the previous 1800 years before Darby. And it's not just pre-trib critics saying that. Even pre-tribulationists agree that it cannot be found in the writings of the early church. Take, for example, Dr. Larry Crutchfield, an expert in church history and a pre-tribulationist. He spent a huge amount of time looking for evidence of imminence in the early church writings, and concluded his paper on the subject like this. While there are in the writings of the early fathers seeds from which the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture could be developed, it is difficult to find in them an unequivocal statement of the type of imminency usually believed in by pre-tribulationists. We do not say that the early fathers were pre-tribulationists in the modern sense, only that the seeds were indeed there. Earlier in the paper, Crutchfield said that what the early church did believe about the timing of the rapture should be termed something like imminent intra-tribulationism, meaning that most of the church fathers believed that the rapture would only come after the Antichrist was revealed and the persecution of Christians began. They believed the rapture would be imminent, but only after the certain precursors occurred, most notably the abomination of desolation at the midpoint. This pre-tribulational expert on the church fathers, therefore, is essentially telling his readers that the early church was for all intents and purposes pre-wrath. We will deal more with the early church in the last section of this film, but for now we will go through all the ways pre-tribbers will try to prove imminence from the Bible alone. If you take all the verses that pre-tribulationists use to prove imminence, a few patterns emerge, so we have categorized each proof text in its own group. The first group I will call waiting for verses. This includes verses like Titus 2 verse 13, which says, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or Philippians 3 verse 20, which says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see another example of this type of proof text in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7. But the basic idea is that believers should wait for and be expectant of Christ's return. There is no technical reason to believe that these verses are speaking of imminence. In other words, you can do a word study in Greek with the terms for waiting for or await, and you will find that these words do not mean that no events will occur before something or another takes place or that something could happen at any moment. They mean pretty much what they mean in English, that you are just waiting for something. In the case of this waiting for group of proof texts, a pre-tribulationist would say that if you are eagerly waiting for the rapture, then the rapture must be able to happen at any moment. But it should be obvious that that doesn't logically follow. You can eagerly await all kinds of things that are not imminent. You can eagerly await Christmas, but it doesn't mean Christmas can occur at any moment. You can eagerly await a wedding, but it doesn't mean that the wedding will happen at any moment. You can see a biblical example that imminence is not the logical conclusion of eagerly awaiting something in 2 Peter 3 verse 13, where it says, But according to his promise, we are waiting for, pras dakao, new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The Apostle Peter says that we are to watch for and to expect the new heavens and new earth. But we know, and even pre-tribulationists would admit, there are certain prophesied events that have to happen before the new heavens and the new earth. So if to watch means imminence, that then they would have to admit that the new heavens and the new earth are imminent events, which of course they would not admit. What the Bible is saying is that we should, as Christians, look forward to, wait for, and eagerly anticipate all the wonderful things that God has in store for us, including His return, so we can begin our eternal life and be with Him. But to be expectant of something is obviously not the same thing as thinking it will happen at any moment. The next group of proof texts for imminence could be called, Be Good because Jesus is returning. This is probably the largest group of pre-trib proof texts for imminence, 
which consists of verses like 1 John 2, verse 28, which says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Or Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, which says, And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There are a few more verses like this that are basically saying the same thing, that Christians should strive to live moral lives, to do good works, and that they should live those moral lives because Jesus is returning. The argument pre-tribbers would make here is that because the New Testament writers are telling people to be morally blameless because of Jesus' return, it must mean that his return could happen at any moment without signs. In other words, according to pre-tribbers, the New Testament writers were telling people that they should keep doing good, because if they don't, they could get caught doing something bad, because Jesus could return at any moment and surprise them while they were sinning. Pre-tribbers have taken this concept very seriously and have even developed a doctrine about sanctification which uses this idea as its base. That is, that the fear of being caught in the act of sinning from an imminent rapture keeps Christians on the straight and narrow path. Pre-tribulational teacher John MacArthur claims that our very sanctification depends on imminence. He says, quote, the hope of Christ's imminent return is therefore the hinge on which a proper understanding of sanctification turns. This position really does not accurately reflect how the scriptures declare we are to seek to live godly in Christ Jesus. I live the Christian life because I love God. The fact that his son is coming for me is added benefit. But not knowing when he's going to come does not demur my desire to live holy at all. You better have more motivation than merely the fear that Jesus is going to come back uh, to lead uh, a life of, of, of um, committed discipleship. Uh, if that's your only reason for, for, uh, for being committed to Christ or submitting to his lordship, then you've got a deficient view of discipleship. The question is, though, is there a better explanation for why the Bible says that Christians should do good works because of Christ's return? The answer is resoundingly yes. In fact, these verses which pre-tribbers think are about imminence are really just a few more examples of one of the most prominent themes in the New Testament, which is that Christians should live godly lives in light of the fact that they have been given eternal life. Let's turn back to 2 Peter 3 to show how this works. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since we are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him. This verse shows us that the reason we are told to live godly lives is not because of an imminent rapture or anything at all to do with being surprised by something unexpected. Rather, the point Peter is making is that the new heavens and new earth are a picture of the eternal life that a believer is promised. That is why we should live godly lives, because of the joy of our inheritance, because of the sureness of our resurrection to eternal life. When you look at the other so-called proof texts in this group, it becomes clear that the same theme here in Second Peter is in view, and that the only reason those verses even mention the rapture is because the rapture is the very picture of eternal life. It's the moment believers become immortal. But the point is exactly the same. Let me show you a few more verses where it says the same thing in the supposed imminence proof text, except the rapture is replaced with eternal life. So we can be sure this is less about the event of the rapture, but more about what the rapture represents, i.e., our eternal life. For the one who sows to his own flesh 
will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. Galatians 6, verses 8 and 9. Here, Paul says that reaping eternal life is a reason Christians should not grow weary of doing good, not the rapture. Not being scared of being caught by something sudden, but because of something sure and wonderful. I know some of you are thinking this is a little too legalistic for comfort. Are we to do good works to obtain eternal life? Well, don't worry, because in the next verse, Paul clears all that up. It's found in one of the most famous passages in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Since this verse comes directly after Paul was talking about the amazing gifts of immortality, death, where is your sting and all that, we can see that he is saying here that Christians do good works because eternal life is a sure thing. It's real. Our good works are not in vain. We will be rewarded on that day. We will live eternally in the new heavens and new earth with Jesus. That is the blessed hope of Christians. In any case, I hope you can at least agree that whatever these verses mean, they are most certainly not giving us any information about whether or not there are prophesied events before the rapture. Hopefully you are starting to see how absurd that particular idea is. The next group of proof texts for imminence is the easiest to dismiss. For some reason, these verses always appear in pre-trib lists of proof texts, but all they prove is that Christians will not go through the wrath of God which of course pre-wrath and many other viewpoints also teach. One example from this group would be 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, which says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In a recent major theological paper that was supposed to be about proving the doctrine of imminence, two of the six verses offered up in defense of imminence were these two verses, which have literally nothing to do with imminence. You can carefully read through the argumentation on these verses in that paper and see he doesn't even try to make an argument for imminence. He is literally just using these verses to show that the church will not go through the wrath of God, and I guess hoping his readers will believe that somehow proves imminence. The next type of proof text for imminence is one of the strangest, but also one of the more popular. It could be called the rapture is a good thing proof text and it comes from John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. So you may be asking yourself, where does this talk about the rapture coming at any moment, or that there are no prophesied events that come before the rapture? Well, don't worry, you didn't see it because they derive eminence from this verse in a way that is less than obvious. Their argument has two premises. Number one, that Jesus implies that the rapture is a good thing when he says, let not your hearts be troubled. And number two, that the rapture is in fact what Jesus is talking about, because he says, I will come again and will take you to myself, which is a reference to the rapture. So far, I am in total agreement with these premises. The rapture will be good, and this passage is about the rapture. But the odd conclusion pre-tribulationists draw from these two points is that because the rapture is considered good by Jesus, it therefore can't have anything bad before it, namely the persecution of the Antichrist. They insist that if Christians were to go through some kind of persecution before the rapture, then Jesus would not have implied that they should not be troubled about it. First of all, the reason that Jesus told them not to be troubled was not because they were worried about persecution just before the rapture. He told them not to be troubled because of what they were talking about just before he said this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, 
but you will follow afterward. After Jesus tells them what he does, he then concludes it by saying, And you know the way to where I am going. So we know that the let not your hearts be troubled statement was concerning their fear that they would not know where he was going or how to follow him there. To further illustrate how absurd the idea is that Jesus was saying, let not your hearts be troubled, to assure his followers that they would not have to go through terrible persecution before the rapture, consider that most of these very disciples would be tortured to death not many years after this. In fact, millions of Christians have died in the past and will die because of persecution. The fact that the rapture is a good thing is in no way promising that the events just before it will be without pain. And more to the point, this verse is not even in the same ballpark as a discussion about whether or not there will be prophesied events before the rapture, contextually. Just in case you think we are cherry-picking bad arguments for eminence, that paper I mentioned earlier opens up with this verse. It is the headliner argument he has for eminence. But all it really does is demonstrate how bankrupt the argument for eminence really is in modern pre-tribulationism. The next group of proof texts are what I call nearness proof texts. They are verses that speak of the rapture as being near or soon. A prominent example is in Philippians 4 verse 5, which says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And there are several others like this. But the doctrine being expressed in each of them is that the Lord's return is near. And because it's been around 2,000 years since the time these verses were written, people are usually looking for a new definition of the word near or at hand, and pre-tribbers choose to define it as imminent. Once again, we need to point out that the underlying Greek is of no help here. The words being used don't have a technical meaning of imminence or that something will happen at any moment. According to the lexicons, they just mean that something is near. Let's look at one of the most famous passages, supposedly about imminence, to see if we can tell if James is talking about an any-moment rapture. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. This verse from James is clearly parallel to Jesus' teaching of the fig tree parable in Matthew 24. We know this in part because of the word near and the idea that the judge is standing at the door, both of which appear in the fig tree parable. But most of all, we know it's derivative because it is the exact same teaching about the same issue the rapture. In the fig tree parable, Jesus is saying that you will know that his return is near, engus, at the very door or gates, thura, because you will see certain signs, namely the signs he just got done telling them about, in the same way that you can tell summer is near by studying the leaves on a fig tree. You will see the signs and know his return is near. James is saying the same thing with his agricultural parallel, that the harvest of fruit the rapture, cannot occur until certain things happen first, until it receives the early and late rains, and so they need to be patient and establish their hearts. Obviously, the harvest, or rapture, is not supposed to be understood as imminent in this illustration, as a number of things have to happen before crops can be harvested, not the least of which is the early and latter rains, and the actual growing of the crops. Even James telling his readers to be patient three times in this passage is the exact opposite thing to teach if what he meant was that the rapture could occur at any moment. While it is true that the rapture being spoken of as being near is a difficult thing to understand in light of it having been 2,000 years and counting since the prophecy was made, I don't think it means we should go looking for a new definition of the word near. I think we can take some instruction from this passage in 2 Peter 3 which seems to suggest that any delay in events leading up to the rapture and the day of the Lord is to allow for more to be saved before the judgment begins. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, 
but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. And that brings us to our final group of proof texts, which is the thief in the night proof texts. There are several instances in Scripture in which the return of Jesus is spoken of like a thief. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. The idea is that if Jesus' return is unexpected, like a thief breaking into your house at night, then it must be imminent. Interestingly, this line of argumentation seems to have fallen out of popularity with pre-trippers recently, because if you follow the thief idea throughout the New Testament, it ironically ends up proving imminence wrong. The reason for that is that all of these coming like a thief verses can be traced back to Jesus, who in this section of the Olivet Discourse was talking about the need for his followers to watch for the signs of his return. He says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is confirmed in spades all throughout the New Testament, where the idea of the thief is specifically about the importance of watching for the signs of the return of Christ, and that the Lord's return like a thief is only for those unbelievers who do not know or care to watch for it. Let's take the very verse pre-tribbers use in 1 Thessalonians 5, and put it back in context to show the utter uselessness of the thief idea to prove imminence. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. The thief motif is not talking about an imminent event. What it is talking about is that when he does return, it's going to happen suddenly. That's different than the idea of imminence. Jesus' return will come as a thief, but it's going to come as a thief to unbelievers, not believers. So the return of Christ will only be like a thief for unbelievers. For them it will come suddenly and unexpectedly, because they will not be watching for the signs of it. And the very idea of watching for signs of the rapture means that there are prophesied events before the rapture. If you tell me to watch, then I've got to be watching for something. All the disciples, most of the early church, millions of Christians of all ages, have been brutally tortured and killed for their faith. It is something Jesus over and over told us not only to expect, but to rejoice in. So I can't follow the logic that says that the rapture will prevent one small group of Christians from persecution but not others. Whatever the blessed hope is, it must be a blessed hope for all those martyrs of the past as well, which is, of course, the resurrection to eternal life itself. I believe that like the man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz, simply revealing to pre-tribbers what most pre-tribulationists really teach about imminence is enough to understand that the concept of an imminent rapture is a totally new, fraudulent doctrine that needs to be quickly abandoned for the good of the church. One of the foundational arguments for the pre-tribulational rapture is concerning the relationship between national Israel and the church. It's based on Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27, where we find the so-called 70 weeks prophecy. This prophecy is where we get the concept of a future seven-year period in which the majority of the end times events take place. This prophecy in Daniel is about the future of Israel. The weeks, as in the 70 weeks prophecy, are understood to mean groups of seven years. So 70 weeks 
would be 70 groups of 7 years, which works out to 490 years. In Daniel, these 70 weeks are divided, with the first 69 weeks having been fulfilled in the past, and the final week, the final 7-year period, still awaiting fulfillment in the future. And during the gap between the first 69 weeks and the final week, there has been something like 2,000 years and counting. This gap of time that we are currently in is commonly referred to as the Church Age. Most of the proponents of the various rapture positions we have mentioned in this film, like pre-trib, post-trib, and pre-wrath, all agree on the basics of this prophecy, that there is a future seven-year period in which the end times events will primarily play out, and that the seven-year period will culminate with God fulfilling His promises to national Israel. I think the scriptures are very clear that God uh, has a future for Israel and that that future is going to be uh, culminated in the millennial reign of Christ on earth after his return. Pre-tribulationists, however, have proposed a unique interpretation of this prophecy which supports their view of the rapture. The theory is that God does not work with Israel and the church at the same time. They insist that a hard distinction must be made here that God has completely and totally paused his dealings with national Israel during the church age. Pre-wrath takes a similar view, with the difference being that pre-wrath teaches that God has only relatively postponed his dealings with Israel during this church age, not absolutely, and that God can and has worked with both the church and Israel during the church age, and that he will continue to do so in the final seven-year period. The reason pre-tribbers are so insistent that God will absolutely not work with the church and Israel at the same time is because they use that particular idea in one of their arguments for the pre-trib rapture, which is that since the 70 weeks prophecy was made to Israel and is about Israel, and since the time between those two sections of the 70 weeks is the church age, they say that when the clock starts on this prophecy again, it will be all about Israel and so the church must be raptured before it begins. They'll say that God doesn't work with Israel and the church at the same time. Israel is going to be part of the seven-year period. Therefore, the church cannot be part of the seven-year period. The assumption is that uh, God cannot deal with Israel and the church at the same time. And so since Daniel's 70th week uh, was part of God's dealing with Israel, the church must not be uh, on earth when uh, Daniel's 70th week begins. Let's start with their premise that because this 70 weeks prophecy was made to and concerning Israel, that the church will not have any part in its fulfillment. One great way to show the complete inconsistency of pre-tribulational thinking here is by turning to Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, where we see a prophecy that in many ways is just like the 70 weeks prophecy. For example, it was explicitly given to Israel and was concerning only Israel. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And, like the 70 weeks prophecy, it was given at a time when the church didn't even exist. But in this case, nearly every Christian agrees that this prophecy applies to the church as well, as it is talking about the new covenant instituted by Christ, in which the Spirit of God will dwell within the hearts of men and change them from the inside out. Before I show more evidence that this idea is wrong, I would like you to notice that this critical doctrine among pre-tribulationists, that God does not, will not, work with Israel and the church at the same time, has no actual proof text like other doctrines do. It is merely an assumption among pre-tribulationists, and worse, it's an assumption that they routinely abandon when it suits them. Take, for example, the so-called tribulation saints idea. Whenever a pre-tribber reads in the Bible about Christians existing within the last seven-year period, which is a very frequent occurrence, they call those people tribulation saints, people of various nationalities left behind after the rapture, who become Christians. Well, if God won't work with the church and Israel at the same time, how do they explain these tribulation saints? Are they not saved? Do they not have the Holy Spirit? Are the Gentile believers among them not the church? Is God not working with them because he won't work with them and the Jews at the same time? 
To drive the nail in the coffin of this unbiblical doctrine that God won't work with Israel and the church at the same time, let me simply show you lots of places where the Bible says God works with both groups in the past, in the present, and in the future. In the past. God worked with Israel during the church age in A.D. 70. Before the death and resurrection of Jesus, during the Old Covenant dispensation, a prophecy was given to Israel concerning God judging Israel with the temple's destruction. Jesus, on a number of occasions, he prophesied the judgment on Israel. When did that happen? In A.D. 70. God is also working with both the church and Israel at the same time in the present, in at least two ways. The first is that God is making Israel jealous and saving a remnant of Jews during the church age. Paul cites the following prophecy about God making Israel jealous through extending his salvation to the Gentiles. But again I ask, didn't Israel understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by those who are not a nation. With a senseless nation I will provoke you to anger. And Isaiah is even bold enough to say, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became well known to those who did not ask for me. Paul responds to Moses' and Isaiah's prophecies, exclaiming God's faithfulness to his promise to Israel. I ask then, they did not stumble into an irrevocable fall, did they? Absolutely not. But by their transgression salvation has come to the Gentiles, to make Israel jealous. For I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. God is using the salvation of Gentiles as a means to provoke Israel to come to salvation. And he is in fact saving a remnant through those means at this time. If we look at the last 2,000 years plus, God has been dealing with Israel and the church at the same time. The, the church defined as the assembly of the Lord, of both Jew and Gentile, God has the gospel going out, and he is gathering the constituents of his kingdom, and he has been doing that. But Israel is still his chosen nation, still his people. They are still under discipline. There still is a remnant being saved. The other way God is working with Israel in the present age is by God regathering Israel back to their homeland. A key aspect to this would be the monumental event of the creation of the modern state of Israel in 1948. God has been, and continues to this day, providentially regathering Jews to their homeland Israel. The prophet Ezekiel prophesied that this would happen in his Dry Bones prophecy in Ezekiel 37, verses 1-14. to In 1948, Israel became a nation again. It's fulfilled. These are the dry bones. Of course, the flesh, the flesh part of the prophecy has not been fulfilled. That's going to be the spiritual regeneration of Israel that will happen at the end of the seven-year period. But the dry bones part of the Ezekiel prophecy, by the way, Ezekiel's prophecy was made to Israel, but it's being fulfilled during the church age. In the future. This next one cuts to the very core of the matter since if you can show that God in the future works with both Israel and the church, specifically during the final seven-year period, you have refuted the very foundation of this odd doctrine. And while there are many ways to show this, there is one in particular that I like the best, and it is found in Revelation 12, which says, But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, and times, and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman, and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12, verses 12 to 17. Here we have a picture of events squarely within the last seven-year period 
And yet, we read that after the dragon becomes furious at his inability to get to the representative of Israel, i.e., the woman, he then goes after the church, i.e., those that hold to the testimony of Jesus. Both groups are obviously on earth at the same time, and obviously during the final week of Daniel, because of the reference to the last three and a half years in verse 14. So it follows that God is in fact working with both groups at the same time, in the end times as well. God works with Israel and the church at the same time, in the past, and in the present. So it shouldn't be surprising that the church will also enter into, with Israel, this future seven-year period. The Antichrist is going to go after both groups, not just Israel, but Israel and the church during the Great Tribulation. The last pre-trib problem that we will cover in this film concerns patristics, which is a name for the study of the writings and beliefs of the early church. The writings from the early church fathers date back to the first century, and of course we should never take their writings as proof of one doctrine over another. The Bible is always the ultimate source for our doctrine. But at the same time, most, if not all of the doctrines we hold today, were taught at some point by the early church fathers. At the very least, these writings provide insight into what the earliest Christians believed about certain subjects, whether those beliefs were right or wrong. So the big question is, what did the early church believe about the timing of the rapture? And in one sense, the answer to that question is pretty simple. Every single early church father who taught on the relationship between the church and the Antichrist believed that the church would face the Antichrist before Jesus returns. The belief that Christ was going to return after Antichrist had done damage to the body. That believers had suffered and had been under his uh, rampage and that they would be set free from that by the appearing of Christ in the sky. That is the basic sequence. And you'll see that in the writings of the fathers, you'll see that in, uh, say, the Didache. Uh, as we kind of look at their collected writings, they believed in uh, the truth that the church was going to encounter the Antichrist, in that the coming of Christ was going to occur in the wake of their encountering of the Antichrist. It's not just pre-Rathers that think this either. Pre-trib scholars would by and large agree with what was just said. I mentioned in the section of this film about eminence a paper written by a pre-tribulational early church expert named Larry Crutchfield in which he concluded that while he couldn't find any evidence of pre-tribulationism in the early church, he did find what he called intra-tribulationism, by which he meant people who believed they would be raptured out of the middle of the persecution of the Antichrist, which is essentially pre-wrath. In another paper, written more recently, James Stitzinger, who is very much a pre-tribulationist, agrees with Crutchfield's conclusion when he wrote, The early fathers largely held to a period of persecution that would be ongoing when the return of the Lord takes place, and most would see the church suffering through some portion of the tribulation period. He further writes, A type of imminent intra-tribulationism, Crutchfield, or imminent post-tribulationism, Walverd, with occasional pre-tribulational inferences, was believed. In this paper, he quotes 15 church fathers, which, as we will see, certainly do not help his case, and then oddly concludes his paper by contradicting his opening statement when he says, George Ladd, post-tribulationist, is no longer credible when he writes, We can find no trace of pre-tribulationism in the early church, and no modern pre-tribulationist has successfully proved that this particular doctrine was held by any of the church fathers or students of the word before the 19th century. So I'm going to go through these quotes he provided, so I can show you his logic, and by extension, most pre-tribulational logic, as it concerns the church fathers. Before we get started, though, I want to reiterate something that is crucially important. As I said, these pre-tribbers know and freely admit that the early church, almost without exception, believed that the rapture would occur after the Antichrist showed up and began to persecute the church. They also freely admit 
Those church fathers that mentioned the seven-year timeline in relationship to the rapture universally believed the rapture would take place in the last half of the three-and-a-half-year period. So pre-tribbers know very well that they will never, ever win an argument about the early church teaching pre-tribulationism in any kind of traditional way. It's just far too obvious that the early church was anything but pre-tribulational. So what they do is never mention to their congregations what the early church actually believed about the timing of the rapture, and instead claim that the early church believed in imminence. You'll remember that is the idea that Jesus could return at any moment. So the thinking is, if they can prove that the early church believed the rapture could come at any moment, they will call that proof of pre-tribulationism even if the church father in question also taught the rapture would occur after the midpoint and after the persecution of the church by the Antichrist, which is the very opposite of pre-tribulationism. And as absurd as that premise is, they don't even manage to accomplish that much. In Stitzinger's paper, six out of the fifteen quotes from the early church can be placed into a category which could be called imaginary eminence proof texts. This is where he quotes early church fathers who mention words that pre-tribbers have defined as meaning imminence, but don't actually mean imminence. For example, a church father might mention the rapture is coming soon, or that it is near, or that it will be sudden, or that we should watch for it. On the one hand, we could rehash what we talked about in the section on imminence, which is that just because something is soon or near doesn't mean it is imminent. A harvest of crops can be near, but that doesn't mean the harvest will occur at any moment with no preceding signs. Another way to prove this wrong is by noticing that in most cases, the same writers Stitzinger says believed in imminency also teach in other places that lots of signs will come before the rapture. In other words, when a church father said that the rapture is at hand or near, they clearly didn't mean it was imminent since they also said there would be lots of prophesied events before the rapture. One of the best ways to illustrate this is with the Didache. The very first document outside of the New Testament is called the Didache, and it was written roughly uh, of the turn of, turn of the first century. In his paper, Stitzinger says the following, The final chapter of the Didache provides one of the clearest and most comprehensive statements on imminency. And then he quotes this line, Be watchful for your life. Let your lamps not be quenched and your loins not ungirded. But be ye ready, for ye know not the hour in which our Lord cometh. So the writer of the Didache is simply telling his readers to be watchful and to be ready because they don't know the day or the hour of the rapture. As we have seen, in the pre-trib mind, if you are watchful and ready for something, it means that thing could occur at any moment and that such words in and of themselves are proof of eminence. But if you read the full quote from the Didache, you will see that the writer goes on to name the various signs he wanted them to watch for, signs he believed must come before the rapture. By my count, there are 18 events that the writer believed would need to come to pass before the rapture. Most notably, the Antichrist declaring himself to be the Son of God and the persecution of Christians that would follow that event. So you can see the problem. Stitzinger tells his readers that the writers of the Didache clearly and comprehensively taught the rapture could come at any moment, just like he believes. But all you have to do is read a few lines after this quote to find out that the writer actually believed there were multiple things that must happen before the rapture, i.e., the opposite of imminence. This is by no means the only instance of a pre-tribulational scholar in a highly respected journal quoting church fathers out of context. It's unfortunately incredibly common. Many have tried to uh, look at some of the, the quotes from some of the early church fathers and have tried to say, well, see, it looks like they're uh, pre-tribulational because they hold to imminence, um, which is the idea that uh, Jesus Christ can return at any moment. There are no prophesied events that need to transpire before he returns. And I would suggest to you strongly that the, uh, that the early church fathers did not subscribe to an imminent uh, rapture.
Conversely, uh, many of them understood and made it clear in their writings uh, that there would be a time of coming persecution uh, before believers would be raptured. The centerpiece of pre-tribulational church father quotes, though, is from Pseudo Ephraim, and I should mention that we have moved well beyond the early church at this point. This particular quote was from the Middle Ages, and it is almost certainly a forgery. Pseudo Ephraim. Thousands of dollars spent, countless hours spent, searching every historical record we could find for a reference or proof of the pre-trip position. They come up with a document that's called Pseudo Ephraim. Pseudo means false. So here is a writing ascribed to a man named Ephraim that everybody knows he didn't write it. And it supposedly is proof of a pre-trib rapture. There are lots of writings written by somebody who wanted it to be more important than it really was. So he puts the name of an important person on it in order to give it legitimacy. We have lots of those writings. But the fact that the pre-trip system would use one of those writing as a basis for the proof of their position, to me, is unconscionable. But regardless of who wrote it, this is the section they will usually quote. All the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation, which is to come, and are taken to the Lord, in order that they may not see at any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of our sins. Stitzinger says the following of Pseudo-Ephraim in general. It describes the imminent rapture, followed by three and a half years of great tribulation under the rule of Antichrist, followed by the coming of Christ, the defeat of Antichrist, and the eternal state. Let's talk about the before the tribulation quote first. As we discussed at the beginning of this film, the word tribulation has only recently been used to refer to the entire seven-year period, like the way modern pre-tribbers use it. And if Pseudo-Ephraim did mean to refer to the entire seven-year period when he used this word tribulation, it would be the earliest recorded instance of the word being used that way. The Greek word thlipsis, or tribulation, is used in many ways in the Bible. It can refer to the wrath of God, general persecution, or earthly worries. It depends on the context. So the question that Stitzinger forgets to ask here is what does this writer mean when he uses the word tribulation? What does the writer think we are going to escape by the rapture? Is it the wrath of God? The persecution of the Antichrist? All of it? The answer is not what pre-tribbers want it to be at all, which is why they never quote the final paragraph of this letter which says, and when the three and a half years have been completed, the time of the Antichrist, through which he will have seduced the world, will come the sign of the Son of Man, and coming forward the Lord shall appear with great power and much majesty, and also even with all the powers of the heavens, with the whole chorus of the saints, with those who bear the sign of the Holy Cross upon their shoulders, as the angelic trumpet precedes him, which shall sound and declare, Arise, O sleeping ones, arise, meet Christ, because his hour of judgment has come. Then Christ shall come, and the enemy shall be thrown into confusion, and the Lord shall destroy him by the spirit of his mouth. Now remember, Stitzinger said that this writer said that the rapture would be followed by three and a half years of rule under the Antichrist. But this shows that the writer believed that the rapture where the sleeping ones arise at the angelic trumpet sound, would occur after the three-and-a-half-year period. So that's either mid-trib, pre-wrath, or post-trib. The only thing it really can't be is pre-trib. When I looked at the document and studied it, it seemed to me that it argued more for a mid-trib rapture or a rapture that was certainly not pre-tribulational. It didn't seem to me to support the idea that there was going to be a rapture before the seventh week even started. There are actually a couple of ways to check our facts here. The first is this idea about being thrown into confusion. Here in this last paragraph, this confusion is what happens after the rapture. The author equates the judgment of the world and the wrath of God with confusion. 
And if we go back up to the quote pre-tribbers always use, we can see something interesting when it says, All the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation, which is to come, and are taken to the Lord, in order that they may not see at any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of our sins. This confusion is what the writer said Christians would escape by participating in the rapture. So we have contextual proof that when the writer said the church would escape the tribulation, he was using the word tribulation to describe the wrath or judgment of God upon those left behind. We certainly know he wasn't talking about escaping the Antichrist or persecution since he absolutely believed the church would face the Antichrist before the rapture. So once again, the pre-tribs swing and miss when it comes to the church fathers. Another five of his fifteen quotes in this paper are from about 1586 to 1795. They are quotes from premillennial historicists who believe in something called the pre-conflagration theory. Now on the one hand, these quotes are irrelevant because they are all things that pre-rathers believe too. Take, for example, this quote from Peter Giriou, who died in 1713. Christ would come in the air to rapture the saints and return to heaven before the battle of Armageddon. This quote may be a problem for some post-tribulationists, but pre-rathers, like pre-tribbers, believe that the rapture will happen well before Armageddon. That is, the rapture happens, and then Armageddon happens later on. So it's notable that Stitzinger wastes a full five of his fifteen quotes on something that is at best a rebuke of some post-tribulationists. You might as well call these proof for the pre-wrath rapture if your only criteria is that the quote must be bad for post-tribulationists. Interestingly, Thomas Ice of the Pre-Trib Resource Center wrote a paper which is effectively rebuking people like Stitzinger, who use quotes from pre-conflagrationalists and claim they are supporting pre-tribulationism. Because as Ice, who is obviously a pre-tribber, notes, Mead's interval, the pre-conflagration theory, between the rapture and the second coming is likely only hours or days, but not years as required by a pre-tribulational viewpoint. The second Peter 3 verse 10 conflagration is a final destruction of the heavens and earth in preparation for the millennium within Mead's system. Stitzinger never mentioned any of this in his paper. In fact, he points to one of these conflagration quotes from John Gill in his conclusion as conclusive proof for a pre-Darby belief in the pre-trib rapture, which is utterly absurd. The few quotes I haven't dealt with yet are pretty easily dismissed. For example, he quotes a cult leader in the 1300s, and even the guy who originally published this particular quote admits that the writer actually believed that they were living in the last three and a half years of end-time tribulation. So whatever it is, it's not pre-tribulationism. In conclusion, pre-tribbers know they can't find anything close to pre-tribulationism in the early church fathers. The early church almost without exception taught that the rapture would take place at some unknown time after the Antichrist arrived and began persecuting Christians. In other words, if you had to pick a modern rapture position that best fit the early church, it's obviously the pre-wrath position. Hey everybody, welcome to the final episode of the Bible Prophecy Timeline series, which is going to be about the Battle of Armageddon and a few other things. And let me just say a few words about this series, as I know there is so much more I could have covered about this last half of the 70th week of Daniel, because after all, that's where the majority of the events that were prophesied and that we know about take place. I mean, I could have gone through so much stuff. I mean, the two witnesses in Revelation and different things that, you know, could have gone on forever and ever. But part of the reason that I did this timeline series is to focus really on that first half and the midpoint, as those are the areas that I think far less has been written about and talked about. So that was kind of my burden for the series, to, is to talk about that first half and midpoint. And I have sort of been fast forwarding, if you will, through the last half. So if it seems like that, that is why. So the Battle of Armageddon. The two main topics I'm going to be covering are number one, when does this battle take place? Because the answer to that is a lot more complicated than I think most people realize. 
And number two, where is Armageddon? And here again, I think there's a lot of confusion, but here is a hint. It's probably not the Valley of Megiddo, as so many teach. So when does the Battle of Armageddon take place? I think it occurs 30 days after the end of the 70th week, 30 days after the end of that seven-year period. This 30-day period is also where I think the last plagues, the seven bowls of wrath, are poured out, and that 30-day period directly precedes another 45-day period, which we'll talk about here in a second. This position is held by people like Charles Cooper, Albert Sharpie, Robert Van Campen, and those names are, of course, people that believe in the pre-wrath rapture as I do, and I should say that this theory about the final 75 days, also the one I'm about to talk about in terms of the location of Armageddon, they're not pre-wrath specific. I mean, it doesn't really matter what you believe about the rapture. This, this, as far as I know, doesn't have any bearing about the timing of the rapture or anything like that. I think the reason that a lot of pre-wrathers uh, believe and teach it and have expanded on it is because of Robert Van Campen and Charles Cooper, who were early writers in the pre-wrath rapture, and they did some studies on this. Um, and I think that you know pre-wrathers are just very meticulous researchers who take seriously the hermeneutical principle that there can't be contradictions in scripture and that scripture should be taken at face value. And it leads them, I think, to find truths that other systems have seemingly decided not to talk about, but uh, it doesn't, as far as I know, have anything to do with the timing of the rapture. It is just, I think, held by a lot of pre-rathers. So the first place we should turn to for more information about this final 75-day period is Daniel 12, 11, which says, And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Most Bible interpreters don't really know what to do with that verse. I've read a lot of commentaries, and they mostly just say it's a mystery. I mean, preterists don't even know what to do with it, as nothing really lines up with what they're trying to do. The issue is that back in Daniel 9.27, where we have the 70 weeks prophecy, where just about every commentator, including myself, understand that to be speaking of one final week of years, or a seven-year period, which consists of two halves, both halves equaling 1,260 days each, one before the abomination of desolation and one afterwards. In other words, that final seven-year period with two 1,260-day halves is very Israel-centric. It is when that ends, Israel's time is completed. It is where their promises are fulfilled at the end of that seven-year period. But now Daniel seems to be telling us that there is something that occurs after that occurs. Just to make sure that we're on the right track, this 1,260-day period, the seven-year period, the shorter half of the second half of the 70th week of Daniel, is reiterated in the book of Revelation, where it's referred to directly in several places, including a specific mention of 1,260 days in Revelation 12, where, interestingly, it's referring to the time that the woman, i.e. the faithful remnant of Israel, will be protected during the last half of the seven-year period. The 144,000 uh, are protected for 1,260 days. So it seems to tie into this Israel-centric concept, which ends at the end of that. But later, Daniel seems to be saying that there is an additional 75 days broken up into a 30 and 45 day period. I and others have theorized that the end of the 70th week is pictured when the seventh trumpet is blown, i.e. Revelation 11:15, which says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This space between the seventh trumpet being blown and the first bowl of wrath is also where the 144,000 who are no longer in hiding are on Mount Zion with Christ, which is interesting because it said that the 144,000 would be in hiding for 1,260 days, which all lines up with the end of the 70th week. So here the 144,000 are no longer in hiding, which Revelation 12 said that would be for 1,260 days, at the same time that the angel is declaring that that uh, the kingdom of the Lord is now in place. So this 30-day period is often referred to as the reclamation period in which Christ himself takes the 144,000 from their hiding place in Basra, probably Petra and Jordan, and makes their way to Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where the kingdom is established. 
after which the Mount of Olives is split to make a hiding place for the 144,000 Zechariah 14. Then the last seven bowls are poured out in relatively quick succession, probably over that 30-day period, culminating with Armageddon, which is on the last day of that period. Then comes the 45-day period, which is often referred to as the Restoration Period, where the restoration of Mount Zion, Israel, and the Temple take place in preparation for Christ's rule on Earth, which occurs at the 1335-day mark. The people that have done the hard work on this Bible study about the 30- and 45-day period really just reveal a ton of Old Testament passages specifically that are talking about this that I certainly have overlooked. It's really amazing how much detail there is about this period, even though it's such a small space of time, this 30-day period. But from Albert Sharpie, I just have 25 Old Testament references here, including from places like Obadiah and Ezekiel, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, Zechariah, etc. So it's really interesting. One of the more commonly referenced passages is about that moment in which uh, Christ himself is taking this 144,000 remnant from Basra to um, to Mount Zion. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments they, and stained all of my apparel, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. Or the Zechariah 14 passage, starting in verse 3, where it explains what the purpose of splitting the Mount of Olives is, that is, to hide this particular remnant. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of Mount Zion shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach Azale. You shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So I know that there is this little bit of confusion about this because what do we have Christ on earth here before he then goes up in Revelation 19 with the holy armies that come down at the battle of Armageddon. And that is what seems to be happening. There is this moment in which Christ is on earth beforehand. And I think that Christ may, in fact, and I think there's some people that theorize that he, after the rapture event before the day of the Lord, is in fact doing things. It does at least appear that he's here with this last part in terms of the just slain of people on the way from Basra to Zion. And then there is a moment when he goes up ba basically again to come down with the saints in this final thing where they actually capture the Antichrist. And I think you can even see that in here in Zechariah 14 where it concludes with saying, then the Lord God will come with, with all the holy ones with him. So it's putting that event with the holy ones after this event of the Mount Olives situation, uh, which makes sense of some of these other things. But I think either way you look at it, because of the revelation situation where you have the kingdom starting and the 144,000 on Mount Zion before the bulls are poured out, uh, you have more wrath to come. And I think that Zechariah actually shows that as well. It's a pretty consistent theme that I think has uh, no obvious contradictions that I can find. I think that a lot of people don't like the idea of this reclamation happening while the Antichrist is still on earth. And in, in other words, Christ claims the throne in Zion while the Antichrist is still there. In fact, that's probably why the Antichrist marches, as we're going to see, on Jerusalem is that the Antichrist no longer has that throne. He no longer owns Mount Zion, as it were. It's, being, it's already been claimed, and we'll see that that's what's happening in Armageddon later. But I don't think that people like the idea that there's more, that the bowls of wrath need to come after that's been claimed. So it causes, I think, some to try to merge the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, because if they were the same, then it would make sense to have the kingdom ending at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And, I, you know, thinking about it, I think that's maybe one of the reasons for the sometimes called accordion theory of just sort of trying to merge either the trumpets and the bowls or the seals trumpets and the bowls. And there is some rhyming to that. I think like three of the seven trumpets, maybe even four, kind of have similar concepts, you know, earthquakes here or 
uh, different things that are similar in the seventh trumpet versus the seventh bowl or whatever, but there's also a ton of contradictions. Like one third is killed in the trumpets where all of them are killed in the bowls, not the least of which that the ending of the trumpets introduces the seven bowls. So that would be a major contradiction if you tried to merge them. And anyway, the, the, the net result of this is that uh, if there is, and I think you just absolutely have to have the, the bowls come after the trumpets in succession, then you have the kingdom being declared and the 144,000 essentially wrapping up the 70th week before the bowls are poured out, which is why every study that I've seen on this, which I think come to that same conclusion through independent means, some of these other Old Testament passages are finding that the bowls must be poured out uh, at the end of that 30-day period, uh, and which is sometimes called the reclamation period culminating in Armageddon. But I think it's just hard for people to, to accept in some ways that here we've got these glorious events in the middle of the day of the Lord. We've got the reclamation of the kingdom, and we have the ending of the 70th week of Daniel on Mount Zion with 144,000 as victorious events, which are clearly wrapped in the context of, hey, but there's about to be seven of the worst judgments that have ever that mankind has ever seen that are about to be poured out still. So you've got really good things mixed with 30 days of really bad things about to happen. And I think that's where people sort of get confused. This is a section in Revelation where people throw up their hands and are like, I don't even know what's going on. And I think this theory that Daniel's 1,335-day period, i.e. an additional 75-day period after the 70th week ends, helps to explain all of this. Another thing that I think this theory explains is something that I only just noticed in the course of this study, which is found in Revelation 14, 13, which says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. In context, this is after the salvation of the 144,000 who are standing on Mount Zion, but explicitly before the final bold judgments. So it's saying, blessed are those that die in the Lord from now on. But I think when you connect it to Revelation 20, verses 4 through 5, it makes sense. It says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So here we have a resurrection right before the beginning of the 1,000 years, specifically of those who were beheaded. I think these beheaded ones are the same blessed ones spoken of in Revelation 14, 13, who were blessed if they died during that last short time. And I believe that they are mostly, if not exclusively, Jews who survive the day of the Lord and come to Christ at the end of the 70th week, who were not part of the first fruits, i.e. the 144,000. So there's a lot going on here that needs some unpacking, but let's first start with this phrase, this is the first resurrection. So this first resurrection idea, I believe it's talking about a type of resurrection. There are only two types of resurrection, a first type and a second type. The first type is one for the just, the resurrection of the justified saints that are resurrected to eternal life. And then there is another type of resurrection, which is of the unjust, which will occur 1,000 years after the conclusion of the first resurrection at the great white throne judgment, which is only for unjustified people who will be judged according to their works and thrown into the lake of fire. Daniel speaks about these two resurrections in Daniel 12, 2, which says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there is a two resurrection idea established in Daniel 12. And the thing is, is that we know that this first resurrection, the resurrection of the just, must occur in several stages. It's made explicit that Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of our resurrection. It's the proof that our resurrection will happen in the like manner. Also, if you believe in Matthew 27, 53, where it says, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many, some people believe that that is some Old Testament saints being resurrected at the same time. The rapture occurs before the day of the Lord. It's just so clear that this can't be the rapture. 
if no other reason is that these people are only beheaded. So only beheaded people are resurrected here. It's clearly a different thing unless you believe that the rapture will only include beheaded people. So we have, what is that? I mean, at a conservative level, we have three resurrections, possibly four resurrections that are all a part of the first resurrection. The second resurrection, no Christian will be a part of. It is the great white throne judgment, which is only for wicked people. And it's basically a sentencing hearing. Anyway, the point I was making here was about the 30-day period after the conclusion of Daniel's 70th week, where I think we are correct to link these two passages, one where there is a declaration of the blessedness of those who die in Christ from that point on, which is in context after the seventh trumpet has been blown, to the one in Revelation 20 where we see the resurrection of those beheaded. I also think you can see this in Daniel 12, 12, where the blessed dead past the 70th week are also mentioned. It says, blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1335 days, which would be a reference to the beginning of the 1000 years, which is explicitly mentioned as what the blessed beheaded saints will do when resurrected, i.e. rule with Christ during the 1000 years. This does potentially solve another problem, too, which is that it's not until after the 70th week that the remnant of Jews, which include the 144,000, can believe in Christ and become, if you will, Christians. So it may be that the now saved rest of the remnant, probably the one third of Jews who the book of Zechariah suggests will survive the day of the Lord, i.e. the time of Jacob's trouble, can die in the Lord. That is because the 70th week has ended and they have recognized their Messiah is Jesus. I suppose that Revelation 24 through 5 could simply be a reference to all those who come to faith during the day of the Lord, not just Jews. But the timing of these otherwise difficult verses does make more sense when you plug in this 30-day concept after the 70th week. However, because this study is so complex, I have a hard time being too dogmatic about any of it, but I do find the studies I've read to be convincing, which I will link in the show notes of this episode. Moving on to the second part of this study, which is the question, where is Armageddon located? And here I want to start in Revelation 16, verse 16, which says, and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And I want to draw your attention to this phrase that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So this that in Hebrew is telling us that John is transliterating this word from Hebrew to Greek. This is something that he does in other ways, John 5, 2, John 19, 13, John 19, 17, John 20, 16, and Revelation 1, 7 are other examples where John is telling us that he is transliterating something. Transliterate means to write a word in a new language so that you can get an idea of how it sounds in that new language. It would be like reading Chinese writing in English letters so that we can know how to pronounce it. So John is taking a word that he knows in Hebrew and is converting it, if you will, to Greek. And now we have to take those Greek letters and convert it into English and hope that in those lost in transliteration things, we can get a sense of what was meant in the original Hebrew. So what is this word that John has transliterated from Hebrew to Greek? This is what Charles Cooper says of it in his paper. Quote, regarding this verse, a note in the Net Bible states, there are many variations in the spelling of this name among the Greek manuscripts, though Armageddon has the best support. The usual English spelling Armageddon used in the translation or Armageddon, a literal transliteration of the Greek, or Harmageddon, N-A-S-B. The significance of this note, this is Charles Cooper continuing, is that Translators of the New Testament should transliterate the Greek, which also means that the text would be printed as Har Magadon. However, to translate one half of the term and transliterate the other half as the Mount of Magadon, as some do, is confusing and does little to help the reader get the sense of the text. In light of this admission to transliterate the text as Armageddon, which is the traditional way the verse reads, is totally misleading and inaccurate. 
So to put it another way, everybody knows that the word that John is using starts with har, which in Hebrew is the word for mountain. But they're assuming that the second part of the word, megadon, is a proper name instead of another word that needs to be translated like har was. And despite megadon not being how you spell Megiddo in Hebrew, many people just sort of overlook that and assume that Megiddo, the name of a valley in Israel, is what is meant. Take, for example, this quote from the pulpit commentary, which says, The correct reading, Har Megedon, signifies mountain of Megiddo. One problem with this is that there is no mountain in the valley of Megiddo. Megiddo is a very large valley. Cooper writes, There is no reference in the entire Old Testament to a mountain with the name Megiddo. Not one. There is no mention of a mountain by this name in all the literature known to deal with the ancient Middle East. David Ayun, C.C. Torrey, Meredith Klein, and more recently Michael Heiser are a few scholars that believe that Megadon is not a reference to Megiddo and that it too should be translated just like Har. They believe that the term that John was transliterating from Hebrew to Greek was Harmoed, which means mountain of assembly, and is a reference to Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And this is where it gets a little complex, at least for me, someone who does not speak or write Hebrew or Greek, but I will quote from a few papers on this subject. David Ayun writes, Loesby construes the Hebrew underlying word for Armageddon to be Harmoed, mountain of assembly. Hebrew the letter that looks like a Y is often transliterated with the Greek letter that looks like a Y, referring to Mount Zion from where the Messiah will destroy the ungodly. Meredith Klein in his paper says the apparent differences between the Hebrew Har Moed and the Har Magadon rendering can be readily accounted for. Representation of the consonant A-N by Greek Gamma is well attested. Also in Hebrew, On is an affirmative to nouns, including place names. Later in the paper, he says the semantic connection is between Megadon and the main verb in the statement, and he gathered Senegan, them and the place called in Hebrew Har Megadon. The verb Sinago interpretively echoes the noun Megadon. He gathered them to the Mount of Gathering. In effect, it translates Megadon, establishing its derivation from Moed, gathering. Sinago is indeed the verb used in the Septuagint to render Ya'ed, appoint, niffle, assemble, appointment, the root of Moed, an appointed time or place of assembly. An instructive parallel is found in Numbers 10, where the interpretive wordplay affords an explanation of Moed, tent of meeting, gathering, which symbolically points to the same heavenly reality that the Har Moed represents. Directions are given to Moses that at the sounding of a certain trumpet signal, the whole assembly, Ead, from the root Ya'ed, Ead, shall gather Ya'ed until at the entrance to the tent of meeting, Moed. The verb of gathering that brings out the significance of Ohel, Moed, is rendered in the Septuagint of Numbers 10.3 by the same synago that explains Har Megedon in Revelation 16.16. 16. Numbers 10.3 thus corroborates our view of how synago functions in Revelation 16.16. 16. We conclude that the evidence of the Hebrasti clue in Revelation 16.16, 16, which is where John says in Hebrew it is called, clinches the case for the Har Moed derivation of Har Megedon. I think Michael Heiser has the best understanding of the mountain of assembly, which is that it is indeed a reference to Mount Zion in Jerusalem, but it also has some supernatural significance in that it is a reference to the place of the meeting of the divine council, a group of angels who serve God mentioned in several places in scripture, which is what is being referenced in Isaiah 14 as the prize that Satan wanted so badly, that is to sit on the throne of that assembly where this exact phrase is used. In Isaiah 14, 13, it says, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, a reference to the angels. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly. So that's that same phrase ostensibly being used here in Revelation 16, 16 for Armageddon, the Mount of Assembly. If you read any of the papers that I will link in the show notes of this episode on this subject, you'll find that they're often written in two different parts. The first part is what I consider the good part, where they will describe what the transliteration should probably be, I harmoed. They all kind of have that same 
uh, thing figured out. But then the second part is them trying to define what the mount of assembly is. And this is something that I think a lot of them used to springboard to various theories. I think Meredith Klein used it as a springboard to make a claim of amillennialism. He was just essentially saying that, well, since the Mount of Assembly is Jerusalem, then we can equate this with the Gog Magog War and that there is no millennium. Um, and then you have somebody like Cooper, who uses the second half of his paper to sort of argue against the old commentators who tried to deal with the Mount of Assembly concept as the Old Testament writers making, giving some significance to like Mount Olympus or something like that. So Cooper comes up with another explanation that I think is less than desirable. So in, in any case, read the, the papers with a grain of salt, but they all seem to say the exact same thing with regard to the actual uh, grammar aspect of this. The net result of all this, though, would mean that Armageddon, Harmoed, takes place in Jerusalem, which of course makes sense, and many other events around that time are also taking place in Jerusalem. I mentioned earlier that it makes sense as well that Satan's last charge against Christ at Armageddon uh, would be for this place that the book of Isaiah says is the prize above all prize. And it, it, it would also make sense that Christ at that moment, uh, given the 30-day thing that we looked at before, already is currently holding that real estate, you know? So Satan is coming against it, trying to take it one last time. One thing to add to that is in the Revelation 27 through 10 passage, where Satan is released one last time at the end of the thousand years, what does he do? He gathers armies of the world to march on Jerusalem. Uh, there's no, I mean, he looks like he's going for the prize again, the mountain of assembly. I suspect there's something very interesting about that throne to make Satan so fixated on it. But, uh, you know, it's probably not for us to know, at least in this age. Anyway, in any case, this will conclude this episode and this series. You can go to my website, BibleProphecyTalk.com, for the audio podcast or the video links, or to BibleProphecyArchive.com, where I will put all of this as well as basically anything that I can think of that's relevant to Bible prophecy in that archive file that you can download for free or order a free uh, USB drive with all that information on it. Thank you for your time, and I will uh, see you next time.